Preface of Treasury of David, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Gillian Hendry. Treasury of David, Volume 7 by C. H. Spurgeon. Authorization. Messrs. Funk and Wagnalls have entered into an arrangement with me to reprint the treasury of david in the united states i have every confidence in them that they will issue it correctly and worthily it has been the great literary work of my life and i trust it will be as kindly received in america as in england i wish for messrs funk success in a venture which must involve a great risk and much outlay c h spurgeon december eighth eighteen eighty one Preface. At the end of all these years, the last page of this commentary is printed, and the seventh preface is requested. The demand sounds strangely in my ears. A preface when the work is done? It can be only nominally a preface, for it is really a farewell. I beg to introduce my closing volume, and then to retire with many apologies for having trespassed so much upon my reader's patience. A tinge of sadness is on my spirit as I quit the treasury of David, never to find on this earth a richer storehouse, though the whole palace of revelation is open to me. Blessed have been the days spent in meditating, mourning, hoping, believing, and exulting with David. Can I hope to spend hours more joyous on this side of the golden gate? Perhaps not, for the seasons have been very choice in which the harp of the great poet of the sanctuary has charmed my ears. Yet the training which has come of these heavenly contemplations may haply go far to create and sustain a peaceful spirit which will never be without its own happy samadhi, and never without aspirations after something higher than it yet has known. The Book of Psalms instructs us in the use of wings as well as words. It sets us both mounting and singing. Often have I ceased my commenting upon the text, that I might rise with the psalm and gaze upon visions of God. If I may only hope that these volumes will be as useful to other hearts in the reading as to mine in the writing, I shall be well rewarded by the prospect. The former volumes have enjoyed a singular popularity. It may be questioned if, in any age, a commentary so large upon a single book of the Bible has enjoyed a circulation within measurable distance of that which has been obtained by this work. Among all orders of Christians, the treasury has found its way unrestrained by sectarian prejudice, another proof of the unity of the spiritual life and the oneness of the food upon which it delights to feed. The author may not dare to be proud of the generous acknowledgments which he has received from men of all sections of the church. But, on the other hand, he cannot pass over them in ungrateful silence, conscious as he is of his many literary sins of omission and of commission in these seven volumes. He is yet glad to have been permitted to do his best, and to have received abundant encouragement in the doing of it. Of all its good, the glory is the Lord's. Of all its weakness, the unworthy author must bear the blame. The last portion of the Psalms has not been the easiest part of my gigantic task. On the contrary, with the exception of the Songs of Degrees and one or two other Psalms, these later hymns and hallelujahs have not been largely expounded nor frequently referred to by our great divines. Failing the English, a larger use has been made of the Latin authors, and my esteemed friend W. Durbin, B.A., has rendered me great service in their translation. It would astonish our readers if they could see what tomes have been read, what folios have been covered with translations, and, in the end, what tiny morsels have been culled from the vast mass for incorporation with this treasury. Heaps of earth have been sifted and washed, and have yielded only here and there a little dust of gold. No labour has been spared, no difficulty has been shirked. May the good Lord accept my service, and enrich his church by it this day, and when I am gathered to my fathers. My friend and amanuensis, Mr. J. L. Keyes, 
has continued to search the British Museum and public libraries for me, and to him and many other kind friends I owe many a quotation which else might have been overlooked. Of the extracts, I am editor-in-chief, and not much more, for brethren such as Mr. Henson of Kingsgate Street have, at sundry times, of their own accord, sent me material more or less useful. In the homiletical department, my obligations are exceedingly great, and are duly acknowledged under initials. My venerable friend, the Reverend George Rogers, leads the way, but several other brethren, hailing from the pastor's college, follow with almost equal steps. Thanks are hereby tendered to them all, and to the multitude of authors from whom I have gathered flowers and fruits, fragrant and nourishing. And now, the colossal work is done. To God be all glory. More than twenty years have glided away while this pleasant labour has been in the doing. But the wealth of mercy which has been lavished upon me during that time, my grateful heart is unable to measure. Surely goodness and mercy have followed me all those years, and made my heart to sing new psalms for new mercies. There is none like the God of Jeshurun. To him be all glory for ever and ever. In these busy days, it would be greatly to the spiritual profit of Christian men if they were more familiar with the book of Psalms, in which they would find a complete armory for life's battles and a perfect supply for life's needs. Here we have both delight and usefulness, consolation and instruction. For every condition there is a psalm, suitable and elevating. The book supplies the babe in grace with penitent cries, and the perfected saint with triumphant songs. Its breadth of experience stretches from the jaws of hell to the gate of heaven. He who is acquainted with the marches of the psalm country knows that the land floweth with milk and honey, and he delights to travel therein. To such I have aspired to be a helpful companion. Reader, I beseech David's God to bless thee, and I pray thee, when it is well with thee, breathe a like prayer for thine heartily, C. H. Spurgeon, Westwood, Upper Norwood, October 1885. End of Preface Psalm 125 of the Treasury of David, Volume 7, by C. H. Spurgeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. The Treasury of David, Volume 7, Psalm 125. Title, A Song of Degrees. Another step is taken in the ascent. Another station in the pilgrimage is reached. Certainly, a rise in the sense is here perceptible since full assurance concerning years to come is a higher form of faith than the ascription of former escapes to the Lord. Faith has praised Jehovah for past deliverances, and here she rises to a confident joy in the present and future safety of believers. She asserts that they shall forever be secure who trust themselves with the Lord. We can imagine the pilgrims chanting this song when perambulating the city walls. We do not assert that David wrote this psalm, but we have as much ground for doing so as others have for declaring that it was written after the captivity. It would seem probable that all the pilgrim psalms were composed, or at least compiled, by the same writer, and as some of them are certainly by David, there is no conclusive reason for taking away the rest from him. Division First we have a song of holy confidence, 1 and 2, then a promise, 3, followed by a prayer, 4, and a note of warning. Exposition, verses 1 to 5. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth, even forever. For the rod of the wicked shall not rest upon the lot of the righteous, lest the righteous put forth their hands unto iniquity. Do good, O Lord, unto those that be good, and to them that are upright in their hearts. 
as for such as turn aside unto their crooked ways, the Lord shall lead them forth with the workers of iniquity, but peace shall be upon Israel. 1. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion. The emphasis lies upon the subject of their trust, namely Jehovah the Lord. What a privilege to be allowed to repose in God! How condescending is Jehovah to become the confidence of his people! To trust elsewhere is vanity, and the more implicit such misplaced trust becomes, the more bitter will be the ensuing disappointment. But to trust in the living God is sanctified common sense, which needs no excuse. Its result shall be its best vindication. There is no conceivable reason why we should not trust in Jehovah, and there is every possible argument for so doing. But apart from all argument, the end will prove the wisdom of the confidence. The result of faith is not occasional and accidental. Its blessing comes not to some who trust, but to all who trust in the Lord. Trusters in Jehovah shall be as fixed, firm, and stable as the mount where David dwelt and where the ark abode. To move Mount Zion was impossible. The mere supposition was absurd, which cannot be removed, but abideth for ever. Zion was the image of eternal steadfastness. This hill, which, according to the Hebrew, sits to eternity, neither bowing down nor moving to and fro. Thus doth the trusting worshipper of Jehovah enjoy a restfulness which is the mirror of tranquillity, and this not without cause, for his hope is sure, and of his confidence he can never be ashamed. As the Lord sitteth king for ever, so do his people sit enthroned in perfect peace when their trust in him is firm. This is, and is to be, our portion. We are, we have been, we shall be, as steadfast as the hill of God. Zion cannot be removed, and does not remove. So the people of God can neither be moved passively nor actively, by force from without, or fickleness from within. Faith in God is a settling and establishing virtue. He who by his strength setteth fast the mountains, by that same power stays the hearts of them that trust in him. This steadfastness will endure for ever, and we may be assured, therefore, that no believer shall perish, either in life or in death, in time or in eternity. We trust in an eternal God, and our safety shall be eternal. 2. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth even for ever. The hill of Zion is the type of the believer's constancy, and the surrounding mountains are made emblems of the all-surrounding presence of the Lord. The mountains around the holy city, though they do not make a circular wall, are nevertheless set like sentinels to guard her gates. God doth not enclose his people within ramparts and bulwarks, making their city to be a prison. But yet he so orders the arrangements of his providence that his saints are as safe as if they dwelt behind the strongest fortifications. What a double security the two verses set before us. First, we are established and then entrenched, settled and then sentineled, made like a mount and then protected as if by mountains. This is no matter of poetry, it is so in fact and it is no matter of temporary privilege, but it shall be so for ever. Date when we please, from henceforth Jehovah encircles his people. Look on as far as we please, the protection extends even for ever. Note it is not said that Jehovah's power or wisdom defends believers, but he himself is round about them. They have his personality for their protection, his Godhead for their guard. We are here taught that the Lord's people are those who trust him, for they are thus described in the first verses. The line of faith is the line of grace. Those who trust in the Lord are chosen of the Lord. The two verses together prove the eternal safety of the saints. They must abide where God has placed them, and God must forever protect them from all evil. 
it would be difficult to imagine greater safety than is here set forth. 3. For the rod of the wicked shall not rest upon the lot of the righteous. The people of God are not to expect immunity from trial, because the Lord surrounds them, for they may feel the power and persecution of the ungodly. Isaac, even in Abraham's family, was mocked by Ishmael. Assyria laid its sceptre, even upon Zion itself. The graceless often bear rule and wield the rod, and when they do so, they are pretty sure to make it fall heavily upon the Lord's believing people, so that the godly cry out by reason of their oppressors. Egypt's rod was exceeding heavy upon Israel, but the time came for it to be broken. God has set a limit to the woes of his chosen. The rod may light on their portion, but it shall not rest upon it. The righteous have a lot which none can take from them, for God has appointed them heirs of it by gracious entail. On that lot the rod of the wicked may fall, but over that lot it cannot have lasting sway. The saints abide forever, but their troubles will not. Here is a good argument in prayer for all righteous ones who are in the hands of the wicked. Lest the righteous put forth their hands unto iniquity. The tendency of oppression is to drive the best of men into some hasty deed for self-deliverance or vengeance. If the rack be too long used, the patient sufferer may at last give way, and therefore the Lord puts a limit to the tyranny of the wicked. He ordained that an Israelite who deserved punishment should not be beaten without measure. Forty stripes save one was the appointed limit. We may therefore expect that he will set a bound to the suffering of the innocent and will not allow them to be pushed to the uttermost extreme. Especially in point of time, he will limit the domination of the persecutor, for length adds strength to oppression and makes it intolerable. Hence the Lord himself said of a certain tribulation, quote, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. End quote. It seems that even righteous men are in peril of sinning in evil days, and that it is not the will of the Lord that they should yield to the stress of the times in order to escape from suffering. The power and influence of wicked men, when they are uppermost, are used to lead or drive the righteous astray. But the godly must not accept this as an excuse and yield to the evil pressure. Far rather must they resist with all their might till it shall please God to stay the violence of the persecutor and give his children rest. This the Lord here promises to do in due time. 4. Do good, O Lord, unto those that be good, and to them that are upright in their hearts. Men, to be good at all, must be good at heart. Those who trust in the Lord are good, for faith is the root of righteousness and the evidence of uprightness. Faith in God is a good and upright thing, and its influence makes the rest of the man good and upright. To such, God will do good. The prayer of the text is but another form of promise, for that which the Lord prompts us to ask, he virtually promises to give. Jehovah will take off evil from his people, and in the place thereof will enrich them with all manner of good. When the rod of the wicked is gone, his own rod and staff shall comfort us. Meanwhile, it is for us to pray that it may be well with all the upright who are now among men. God bless them and do them good in every possible form. We wish well to those who do well. We are so plagued by the crooked that we would pour benedictions upon the upright. 5. And for such as turn aside unto their crooked ways, the Lord shall lead them forth with the workers of iniquity. Two kinds of men are always to be found, the upright and the men of crooked ways. Alas, there are some who pass from one class to another, not by a happy conversion, turning from the twisting lanes of deceit into the highway of truth, but by an unhappy declension, leaving the main road of honesty and holiness for the bypaths of wickedness. Such apostates have been seen in all ages, and David knew enough of them. 
he could never forget Saul and Ahithophel and others. How sad that men who once walked in the right way should turn aside from it. Observe the course of the false-hearted. First, they look out for crooked ways. Next, they choose them and make them their crooked ways. And then they turn aside into them. They never intend to go back unto perdition, but only to make a curve and drop into the right road again. The straight way becomes a little difficult, and so they make a circumbendibus, which all along aims at coming out right, though it may a little deviate from precision. These people are neither upright in heart, nor good, nor trusters in Jehovah, and therefore the Lord will deal otherwise with them than with his own people. When execution day comes, these hypocrites and time-servers shall be led out to the same gallows as the openly wicked. All sin will one day be expelled the universe, even as criminals condemned to die are led out of the city. Then shall secret traitors find themselves ejected with open rebels. Divine truth will unveil their hidden pursuits and lead them forth, and to the surprise of many, they shall be set in the same rank with those who avowedly wrought iniquity. But peace shall be upon Israel. In fact, the execution of the deceivers shall tend to give the true Israel peace. When God is smiting the unfaithful, not a blow shall fall upon the faithful. The chosen of the Lord shall not only be like Salem, but they shall have Salem, or peace. Like a prince, Israel has prevailed with God, and therefore he need not fear the face of man. His wrestlings are over. The blessing of peace has been pronounced upon him. He who has peace with God may enjoy peace concerning all things. Bind the first and last verses together. Israel trusts in the Lord, verse 1, and Israel has peace, verse 5. End of Psalm 125Psalm 126 of the Treasury of David, Volume 7, by C. H. Spurgeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Psalm 126. Title. A Song of Degrees. This is the seventh step, and we may therefore expect to meet with some special perfection of joy in it. Nor shall we look in vain. We see here not only that Zion abides, but that her joy returns after sorrow. Abiding is not enough. Fruitfulness is added. The pilgrims went from blessing to blessing in their samadhi as they proceeded on their holy way. Happy people, to whom every ascent was a song, every halt a hymn. Here the truster becomes a sore. Faith works by love, obtains a present bliss, and secures a harvest of delight. There is nothing in this psalm by which we can decide its date further than this, that it is a song after a great deliverance from oppression. Turning captivity by no means requires an actual removal into banishment to fill out the idea. Rescue from any dire affliction or crushing tyranny would be fitly described as captivity turned. Indeed, the passage is not applicable to captives in Babylon for it is Zion itself which is in captivity, and not a part of her citizens. The holy city was in sorrow and distress. Though it could not be removed, the prosperity could be diminished. Some dark cloud lowered over the beloved capital, and its citizens prayed, Turn again our captivity, O Lord. This psalm is in its right place, and most fittingly follows its predecessor, for... As in Psalm 125, we read that the rod of the wicked shall not rest upon the lot of the righteous. We here see it removed from them to their great joy. The word turn would seem to be the keynote of the song. It is a psalm of conversion, conversion from captivity, and it may well be used to set forth the rapture of a pardoned soul when the anger of the Lord is turned away from it. We will call it leading captivity captive. The psalm divides itself into a narrative, one and two, a song, three, 
a prayer, four, and a promise, five and six. Exposition, verses one to six. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. 1. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Being in trouble, the gracious pilgrims remember for their comfort times of national woe, which were succeeded by remarkable deliverances. Then sorrow was gone like a dream, and the joy which followed was so great that it seemed too good to be true, and they feared that it must be the vision of an idle brain. So sudden and so overwhelming was their joy that they felt like men out of themselves, ecstatic or in a trance. The captivity had been great, and great was the deliverance, for the great God himself had wrought it. It seemed too good to be actually true. Each man said to himself, Is this a dream? Oh, if it be a dream, let me sleep on, and do not wake me yet. It was not the freedom of an individual which the Lord in mercy had wrought, but of all Zion, of the whole nation, and this was reason enough for overflowing gladness. We need not instance the histories which illustrate this verse in connection with literal Israel, but it is well to remember how often it has been true to ourselves. Let us look to the prison house from which we have been set free. Ah me, what captives we have been! At our first conversion, what a turning again of captivity we experienced! Never shall that hour be forgotten! Joy! 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 Since then, from multiplied troubles, from depression of spirit, from miserable backsliding, from grievous doubt, we have been emancipated, and we are not able to describe the bliss which followed each emancipation. When God revealed his gracious name and changed our mournful state, our rapture seemed a pleasing dream, the grace appeared so great. This verse will have a higher fulfilment in the day of the final overthrow of the powers of darkness, when the Lord shall come forth for the salvation and glorification of his redeemed. Then, in a fuller sense than even at Pentecost, our old men shall see visions, and our young men shall dream dreams. Yea, all things shall be so wonderful, so far beyond all expectation, that those who behold them shall ask themselves whether it be not all a dream. The past is ever a sure prognostic of the future. The thing which has been is the thing which shall be. We shall again and again find ourselves amazed at the wonderful goodness of the Lord. Let our hearts gratefully remember the former loving kindnesses of the Lord. We were sadly low, sorely distressed, and completely past hope. But when Jehovah appeared, he did not merely lift us out of despondency, he raised us into wondering happiness. The Lord who alone turns our captivity does nothing by halves. Those whom he saves from hell, he brings to heaven. He turns exile into ecstasy and banishment into bliss. 2. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. So full were they of joy that they could not contain themselves. They must express their joy and yet they could not find expression for it. Irrepressible mirth could do no other than laugh, for speech was far too dull a thing for it. The mercy was so unexpected, so amazing, so singular, that they could not do less than laugh, and they laughed much, so that their mouths were full of it, and that because their hearts were full too. When at last the tongue could move articulately, it could not be content simply to talk, but it must needs sing, and sing heartily too, for it was full of singing. Doubtless the former pain added to the zest of the pleasure, 
the captivity threw a brighter colour into the emancipation. The people remembered this joy flood for years after, and here is the record of it turned into a song. Not the when and the then. God's when is our then. At the moment when he turns our captivity, the heart turns from its sorrow. When he fills us with grace, we are filled with gratitude. We are made to be as them that dream, but we both laughed and sang in our sleep. We are wide awake now, and though we can scarcely realise the blessing, yet we rejoice in it exceedingly. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. The heathen heard the songs of Israel, and the better sort among them soon guessed the cause of their joy. Jehovah was known to be their God, and to him the other nations ascribed the emancipation of his people, reckoning it to be no small thing which the Lord had thus done. For those who carried away the nations had never in any other instance restored a people to their ancient dwelling place. These foreigners were no dreamers, though they were only lookers-on, and not partakers in the surprising mercy, they plainly saw what had been done, and rightly ascribed it to the great giver of all good. It is a blessed thing when saints set sinners talking about the loving kindness of the Lord, and it is equally blessed when the saints who are hidden away in the world hear of what the Lord has done for his church, and themselves resolve to come out from their captivity and unite with the Lord's people. Ah, dear reader, Jehovah has indeed done marvellous things for his chosen, and these great things shall be themes for eternal praise among all intelligent creatures. 3. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. They did not deny the statement which reflected so much glory upon Jehovah. With exultation, they admitted and repeated the statement of Jehovah's notable dealings with them. To themselves they appropriated the joyful assertion. They said, The Lord hath done great things for us. And they declared their gladness at the fact. It is a poor modesty which is ashamed to own its joys in the Lord. Call it rather a robbery of God. There is so little of happiness abroad that if we possess a full share of it, we ought not to hide our light under a bushel, but let it shine on all that are in the house. Let us avow our joy, and the reason of it, stating the whereof, as well as the fact. None are so happy as those who are newly turned and returned from captivity. None can more promptly and satisfactorily give a reason for the gladness that is in them. The Lord himself has blessed us, blessed us greatly, blessed us individually, blessed us assuredly. And because of this we sing unto his name. I heard one say the other day in prayer, whereof we desire to be glad. Strange dilution and defilement of scriptural language. Surely if God has done great things for us, we are glad, and cannot be otherwise. No doubt such language is meant to be lowly, but in truth it is loathsome. 4. Turn again our captivity, O Lord. Remembering the former joy of a past rescue, they cry to Jehovah for a repetition of it. When we pray for the turning of our captivity, it is wise to recall former instances thereof. Nothing strengthens faith more effectually than the memory of a previous experience. The Lord hath done, harmonises well with the prayer, turn again. The text shows us how wise it is to resort anew to the Lord, who in former times has been so good to us. Where else should we go but to him who has done such great things for us? Who can turn again our captivity but he who turned it before? As the streams in the south. Even as the Lord sends floods adown the dry beds of southern torrents after long droughts, so can he fill our wasted and wearied spirits with floods of holy delight. This the Lord can do for any of us, and he can do it at once, for nothing is too hard for the Lord. It is well for us thus to pray, and to bring our suit before him who is able to bless exceeding abundantly. Do not let us forget the past, but in the presence of our present difficulty, 
let us resort unto the Lord, and beseech him to do that for us which we cannot possibly do for ourselves, that which no other power can perform on our behalf. Israel did return from the captivity in Babylon, and it was even as though a flood of people hastened to Zion. Suddenly and plenteously the people filled again the temple courts. In streams they shall also in the latter days return to their own land and replenish it yet again. Like mighty torrents shall the nations flow unto the Lord in the day of his grace. May the Lord hasten it in his own time. 5. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Hence present distress must not be viewed as if it would last for ever. It is not the end by any means, but only a means to the end. Sorrow is our sowing, rejoicing shall be our reaping. If there were no sowing in tears, there would be no reaping in joy. If we were never captives, we could never lead our captivity captive. Our mouth had never been filled with holy laughter if it had not been first filled with the bitterness of grief. We must sow. We may have to sow in the wet weather of sorrow, but we shall reap, and reap in the bright summer season of joy. Let us keep to the work of this present sowing time, and find strength in the promise which is here so positively given us. Here is one of the Lord's shalls and wills. It is freely given both to workers, waiters, and weepers, and they may rest assured that it will not fail. In due season they shall reap. This sentence may well pass current in the church as an inspired proverb. It is not every sowing which is thus insured against all danger and guaranteed a harvest, but the promise specially belongs to sowing in tears. When a man's heart is so stirred that he weeps over the sins of others, he is elect to usefulness. Winners of souls are first weepers for souls. As there is no birth without travail, so is there no spiritual harvest without painful tillage. When our own hearts are broken with grief at man's transgression, we shall break other men's hearts. Tears of earnestness beget tears of repentance. Deep calleth unto deep. 6. He the general assurance is applied to each one in particular. That which is spoken in the previous verse in the plural, they, is here repeated in the singular, he. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. He leaves his couch to go forth into the frosty air and tread the heavy soil, and as he goes, he weeps because of past failures, or because the ground is so sterile, or the weather so unseasonable, or his corn so scarce, and his enemies so plentiful and so eager to rob him of his reward. He drops a seed and a tear, a seed and a tear, and so goes on his way. In his basket he has seed which is precious to him, for he has little of it, and it is his hope for the next year. Each grain leaves his hand with anxious prayer that it may not be lost. He thinks little of himself, but much of his seed, and he eagerly asks, Will it prosper? Shall I receive a reward for my labour? Yes, good husbandman, doubtless you will gather sheaves from your sowing. Because the Lord has written, doubtless, take heed that you do not doubt. No reason for doubt can remain after the Lord has spoken. You will return to this field, not to sow, but to reap, not to weep, but to rejoice. And after a while, you will not go home again with nimbler step than today, though with a heavier load, for you shall have sheaves to bear with you. Your handful shall be so greatly multiplied that many sheaves shall spring from it, and you shall have the pleasure of reaping them and bringing them home to the place from which you went out weeping. This is a figurative description of that which was literally described in the first three verses. It is the turning of the workers' captivity when, instead of seed buried beneath black earth, 
he sees the waving crops inviting him to a golden harvest. It is somewhat singular to find this promise of fruitfulness in close contact with return from captivity. And yet it is so in our own experience, for when our own soul is revived, the souls of others are blessed by our labours. If any of us, having been once lonesome and lingering captives, have now returned home, and have become longing and labouring sores. May the Lord, who has already delivered us, soon transform us into glad-hearted reapers, and to him shall be praise for ever and ever. Amen. End of Psalm 126Psalm 127 of the Treasury of David, Volume 7, by C. H. Spurgeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Psalm 127. Title. A Song of Degrees for Solomon. It was meet that the builder of the holy house should be remembered by the pilgrims to its sacred shrine. The title probably indicates that David wrote it for his wise son in whom he so greatly rejoiced, and whose name Jedidiah, or Beloved of the Lord, is introduced into the second verse. The spirit of his name, Solomon, or Peaceable, breathes through the whole of this most charming song. If Solomon himself was the author, it comes fitly from him who reared the house of the Lord. Observe how in each of these songs the heart is fixed upon Jehovah only, Read the first verses of these psalms, from Psalm 120 to the present song, and they run thus. I cried unto the Lord, I will lift up mine eyes to the hills. Let us go unto the house of the Lord. Unto thee will I lift up mine eyes. If it had not been the Lord, they that trust in the Lord, when the Lord turned against the captivity. The Lord, and the Lord alone, is thus lauded at each step of these songs of the ascents. O oh, for a life whose every halting place shall suggest a new song unto the Lord! Subject God's blessing on his people as their one great necessity and privilege is here spoken of. We are here taught that builders of houses and cities, systems and fortunes, empires and churches, all labour in vain without the Lord but under the divine favour they enjoy perfect rest. Sons who are in the Hebrew called builders are set forth as building up families under the same divine blessing to the great honour and happiness of their parents. It is the builder's psalm. Every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God, and unto God be praise. Exposition Verses 1 to 5. Except the Lord build the house, they labour in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, the children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children in the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. 1. Except the Lord build the house, they labour in vain that build it. The word vain is the keynote here, and we hear it ring out clearly three times. Men desiring to build know that they must labour, and accordingly they put forth all their skill and strength. But let them remember that if Jehovah is not with them, their designs will prove failures. So was it with the Babel builders. They said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower. And the Lord returned their words into their own bosoms, saying, Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language. In vain they toiled, for the Lord's face was against them. When Solomon resolved to build a house for the Lord, matters were very different, for all things united under God 
to aid him in his great undertaking. Even the heathen were at his beck and call, that he might erect a temple for the Lord his God. In the same manner, God blessed him in the erection of his own palace, for this verse evidently refers to all sorts of house-building. Without God, we are nothing. Great houses have been erected by ambitious men, but, like the baseless fabric of a vision, they have passed away, and scarce a stone remains to tell where once they stood. The wealthy builder of a non-such palace, could he revisit the glimpses of the moon, would be perplexed to find a relic of his former pride. He laboured in vain, for the place of his travail knows not a trace of his handiwork. The like may be said of the builders of castles and abbeys, when the mode of life indicated by these piles ceased to be endurable by the Lord, the massive walls of ancient architects crumbled into ruins, and their toil melted like the froth of vanity. Not only do we now spend our strength for naught without Jehovah, but all who have ever laboured apart from him come under the same sentence. Trowel and hammer, saw and plane, are instruments of vanity unless the Lord be the master builder. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Around the wall the sentinels pace with constant step, but yet the city is betrayed unless the unsleeping watcher is with them. We are not safe because of watchmen if Jehovah refuses to watch over us. Even if the guards are wakeful and do their duty, Still the place may be surprised if God be not there. I, the Lord, do keep it, is better than an army of sleepless guards. Note that the psalmist does not bid the builder cease from labouring, nor suggest that watchmen should neglect their duty, nor that men should show their trust in God by doing nothing. Nay, he supposes that they will do all that they can do, and then he forbids their fixing their trust in what they have done and assures them that all creature effort will be in vain unless the Creator puts forth his power to render second causes effectual. Holy Scripture endorses the order of Cromwell, quote, Trust in God and keep your powder dry, end quote. Only here the sense is varied, and we are told that the dried powder will not win the victory unless we trust in God. Happy is the man who hits the golden mean, by so working as to believe in God, and so believing in God as to work without fear. In scriptural phrase, a dispensation or system is called a house. Moses was faithful as a servant over all his house, and as long as the Lord was with that house, it stood and prospered. But when he left it, the builders of it became foolish, and their labour was lost. They sought to maintain the walls of Judaism, but sought in vain. They watched around every ceremony and tradition, but their care was idle. Of every church and every system of religious thought, this is equally true. Unless the Lord is in it and is honoured by it, the whole structure must sooner or later fall in hopeless ruin. Much can be done by man. He can both labour and watch. But without the Lord... He has accomplished nothing, and his wakefulness has not warded off evil. 2. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. Because the Lord is mainly to be rested in, all carking care is mere vanity and vexation of spirit. We are bound to be diligent, for this the Lord blesses. We ought not to be anxious for that dishonours the Lord and can never secure his favour. Some deny themselves needful rest. The morning sees them rise before they are rested. The evening sees them toiling long after the curfew has tolled the knell of parting day. They threaten to bring themselves into the sleep of death by neglect of the sleep which refreshes life. Nor is their sleeplessness the only index of their daily fret. They stint themselves in their meals they eat the commonest food and the smallest possible quantity of it, and what they do swallow is washed down with the salt tears of grief, for they fear that daily bread will fail them. 
hard-earned is their food, scantily rationed, and scarcely ever sweetened, but perpetually smeared with sorrow, and all because they have no faith in God, and find no joy except in hoarding up the gold which is their only trust. Not thus, not thus, would the Lord have his children live. He would have them, as princes of the blood, lead a happy and restful life. Let them take a fair measure of rest and a due portion of food, for it is for their health. Of course, the true believer will never be lazy or extravagant. If he should be, he will have to suffer for it. But he will not think it needful or right to be worried and miserly. Faith brings calm with it and banishes the disturbers who, both by day and by night, murder peace. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. Through faith, the Lord makes his chosen ones to rest in him, in happy freedom from care. The text may mean that God gives blessings to his beloved in sleep, even as he gave Solomon the desire of his heart while he slept. The meaning is much the same. Those whom the Lord loves are delivered from the fret and fume of life, and take a sweet repose upon the bosom of their Lord. He rests them, blesses them while resting, blesses them more in resting than others in their moiling and toiling. God is sure to give the best thing to his beloved, and we here see that he gives them sleep, that is, a laying aside of care, a forgetfulness of need a quiet leaving of matters with God. This kind of sleep is better than riches and honour. Note how Jesus slept amid the hurly-burly of a storm at sea. He knew that he was in his father's hands, and therefore he was so quiet in spirit that the billows rocked him to sleep. It would be much oftener the same with us if we were more like him. It is to be hoped that those who built Solomon's temple were allowed to work at it steadily and joyfully. Surely such a house was not built by unwilling labourers. One would hope that the workmen were not called upon to hurry up in the morning, nor to protract their labours far into the night. But we would fain believe that they went on steadily, resting duly, and eating their bread with joy. So, at least, should the spiritual temple be erected. Though, truth to tell, the workers upon its walls are all too apt to grow cumbered with much serving, all too ready to forget their Lord, and to dream that the building is to be done by themselves alone. How much happier might we be if we would but trust the Lord's house to the Lord of the house? What is far more important, how much better would our building and watching be done if we would but confide in the Lord? who both builds and keeps his own church. 3. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. This points to another mode of building up a house, namely by leaving descendants to keep our name and family alive upon the earth. Without this, what is a man's purpose in accumulating wealth? To what purpose does he build a house if he has none in his household to hold the house after him? What boots it that he is the possessor of broad acres, if he has no heir? Yet in this matter a man is powerless without the Lord. The great Napoleon, with all his sinful care on this point, could not create a dynasty. Hundreds of wealthy persons would give half their estates if they could hear the cry of a babe born of their own bodies. Children are a heritage which Jehovah himself must give or a man will die childless, and thus his house will be unbuilt. And the fruit of the womb is his reward, or a reward from God. He gives children not as a penalty, nor as a burden, but as a favour. They are a token for good, if men know how to receive them and educate them. They are doubtful blessings, only because we are doubtful persons. Where society is rightly ordered, children are regarded not as an encumbrance, but as an inheritance, and they are received not with regret, but as a reward. If we are overcrowded in England, 
and so seem to be embarrassed with too large an increase we must remember that the lord does not order us to remain in this narrow island but would have us fill those boundless regions which wait for the axe and the plough yet even here with all the straits of limited incomes our best possessions are our own dear offspring for whom we bless god every day for as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man so are children of the youth children born to men in their early days by god's blessing become the comfort of their riper years a man of war is glad of weapons which may fly where he cannot good sons are their father's arrows speeding to hit the mark which their sires aim at what wonders a good man can accomplish if he has affectionate children to second his desires and lend themselves to his designs to this end we must have our children in hand while they are yet children or they are never likely to be so when they are grown up and we must try to point them and straighten them so as to make arrows of them in their youth lest they should prove crooked and unserviceable in after life let the lord favour us with loyal obedient affectionate offspring and we shall find in them our best helpers we shall see them shot forth into life to our comfort and delight if we take care from the very beginning that they are directed to the right point five happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them those who have no children bewail the fact those who have few children see them soon gone and the house is silent and their life has lost a charm those who have many gracious children are upon the whole the happiest of course a large number of children means a large number of trials but when these are met by faith in the lord it also means a mass of love and a multitude of joys the writer of this comment gives it as his own observation that he has seen the most frequent unhappiness in marriages which are unfruitful that he has himself been most grateful for two of the best of sons but as they have both grown up and he has no child at home he has without a tinge of murmuring or even wishing that he were otherwise circumstanced felt that it might have been a blessing to have had a more numerous family he therefore heartily agrees with the psalmist's verdict herein expressed he has known a family in which there were some twelve daughters and three sons and he never expects to witness upon earth greater domestic felicity than fell to the lot of their parents who rejoiced in all their children as the children also rejoiced in their parents and in one another when sons and daughters are arrows it is well to have a quiver full of them but if they are only sticks naughty and useless the fewer of them the better while those are blessed whose quiver is full there is no reason to doubt that many are blessed who have no quiver at all for a quiet life may not need such a warlike weapon moreover a quiver may be small and yet full and then the blessing is obtained in any case we may be sure that a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of children that he possesseth they shall not be ashamed but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate they can meet foes both in law and in fight nobody cares to meddle with a man who can gather a clan of brave sons around him he speaks to purpose whose own sons make his words emphatic by the resolve to carry out their father's wishes this is the blessing of abraham the old covenant benediction quote, thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies end quote. and it is sure to all the beloved of the lord in some sense or other doth not the lord jesus thus triumph in his seed looked at literally this favour cometh of the lord without his will there would be no children to build up the house and without his grace there would be no good children to be their parents strength if this must be left with the lord let us leave every other thing in the same hands he will undertake for us and prosper our trustful endeavours and we shall enjoy a tranquil life and prove ourselves to be our lord's beloved by the calm and quiet of our spirit 
we need not doubt that if God gives us children as a reward, he will also send us the food and raiment which he knows they need. He who is the father of a host of spiritual children is unquestionably happy. He can answer all opponents by pointing to souls who have been saved by his means. Converts are emphatically the heritage of the Lord and the reward of the preacher's soul travail. By these, under the power of the Holy Ghost, the city of the church is both built up and watched, and the Lord has the glory of it. End of Psalm 127Psalm 128 of the Treasury of David, Volume 7, by C. H. Spurgeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Psalm 128. Title, A Saw of Degrees. There is an evident assent from the last psalm that did but hint at the way in which a house may be built up, but this draws a picture of that house built and adorned with domestic bliss through the Lord's own benediction. There is clearly an advance in age, for here we go beyond children to children's children, and also a progress in happiness, for children which in the last psalm were arrows, are here olive plants, and instead of speaking with the enemies in the gate, we close with peace upon Israel. Thus we rise step by step, and sing as we ascend. Subject. It is a family hymn, a song for a marriage or a birth, or for any day in which a happy household has met to praise the Lord. Like all the songs of degrees, it has an eye to Zion and Jerusalem, which are both expressly mentioned, and it closes like Psalms 125, 130 and 131, with an allusion to Israel. It is a short psalm, but exceedingly full and suggestive. Its poetry is of the highest order. Perhaps in no country can it be better understood than in our own, for we, above all nations, delight to sing of Home Sweet Home. Exposition, verses 1 to 6. Blessed is every one that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways, for thou shalt eat the labour of thy hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house, thy children like olive plants round about thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children, and peace upon Israel. 1. Blessed is every one that feareth the Lord. The last psalm ended with a blessing, for the word there translated happy is the same as that which is here rendered blessed. Thus the two songs are joined by a catchword. There is also in them a close community of subject. The fear of God is the cornerstone of all blessedness. We must reverence the ever-blessed God before we can be blessed ourselves. Some think that this life is an evil, an affliction, a thing upon which rests a curse. But it is not so. The God-fearing man has a present blessing resting upon him. It is not true that it would be to him something better not to be. He is happy now, for he is the child of the happy God, the ever-living Jehovah. And he is even here a joint heir with Jesus Christ whose heritage is not misery, but joy. This is true of every one of the God-fearing, of all conditions in all ages. Each one and every one is blessed. Their blessedness may not always be seen by carnal reason, but it is always a fact, for God himself declares that it is so, and we know that those whom he blesses are blessed indeed. Let us cultivate that holy filial fear of Jehovah, which is the essence of all true religion, the fear of reverence, of dread to offend, of anxiety to please, and of entire submission and obedience. This fear of the Lord is the fit fountain of holy living. We look in vain for holiness apart from it. 
none but those who fear the Lord will ever walk in his ways. That walketh in his ways. The religious life, which God declares to be blessed, must be practical as well as emotional. It is idle to talk of fearing the Lord if we act like those who have no care whether there be a God or not. God's ways will be our ways if we have a sincere reverence for him. If the heart is joined unto God, the feet will follow hard after him. A man's heart will be seen in his walk, and the blessing will come where heart and walk are both with God. Note that the first psalm links the benediction with the walk in a negative way. Blessed is the man that walketh not, and so on. But here we find it in connection with the positive form of our conversation. To enjoy the divine blessing, we must be active and walk. We must be methodical and walk in certain ways. And we must be godly and walk in the Lord's ways. God's ways are blessed ways. They were cast up by the blessed one. They were trodden by him in whom we are blessed. They are frequented by the blessed. They are provided with means of blessing. They are paved with present blessings and they lead to eternal blessedness. Who would not desire to walk in them? 2. For thou shalt eat the labour of thine hands. The general doctrine of the first verse here receives a personal application. Note the change to the second person. Thou shalt eat and so on. This is the portion of God's saints, to work and to find a reward in so doing. God is the God of labourers. We are not to leave our worldly callings because the Lord has called us by grace. We are not promised a blessing upon romantic idleness or unreasonable dreaming, but upon hard work and honest industry. Though we are in God's hands, we are to be supported by our own hands. He will give us daily bread, but it must be made our own by labour. All kinds of labour are here included, for if one toils by the sweat of his brow, and another does so by the sweat of his brain, there is no difference in the blessing, save that it is generally more healthy to work with the body than with the mind only. Without God, it would be vain to labour. But when we are labourers together with God, a promise is set before us. The promise is that labour shall be fruitful, and that he who performs it shall himself enjoy the recompense of it. It is a grievous ill for a man to slave his life away and receive no fair remuneration for his toil. As a rule, God's servants rise out of such bondage and claim their own and receive it. At any rate, this verse may encourage them to do so. The labourer is worthy of his hire. Under the theocracy, the chosen people could see this promise literally fulfilled. But when evil rulers oppressed them, their earnings were withheld by churls and their harvests were snatched away from them by marauders. Had they walked in the fear of the Lord, they would never have known such great evils. Some men never enjoy their labour, for they give themselves no time for rest. Eagerness to get takes from them the ability to enjoy. Surely, if it is worthwhile to labour, it is worthwhile to eat of that labour. Happy shalt thou be, or, O oh, thy happinesses, Heaped up happinesses, in the plural, belong to that man who fears the Lord. He is happy, and he shall be happy in a thousand ways. The context leads us to expect family happiness. Our God is our household God. The Romans had their Laris and Penatus, but we have far more than they in the one only living and true God. And it shall be well with thee, or good for thee. Yes, good is for the good, and it shall be well with those who do well. What cheering words are these, their sweetness who can tell, in time and to eternal days tis with the righteous well. If we fear God, we may dismiss all other fear. In walking in God's ways, we shall be under his protection, provision and approval. Danger and destruction shall be far from us. All things shall work our good. In God's view, it would not be a blessed thing for us to live without exertion, nor to eat the unearned bread of dependence. 
the happiest state on earth is one in which we have something to do, strength to do it with, and a fair return for what we have done. This, with the divine blessing, is all that we ought to desire, and it is sufficient for any man who fears the Lord and abhors covetousness. Having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. 3. Thy wife. To reach the full of earthly felicity, a man must not be alone. A helpmate was needed in paradise, and assuredly she is not less necessary out of it. He that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. It is not every man that feareth the Lord who has a wife, but if he has, she shall share in his blessedness and increase it. Shall be as a fruitful vine. To complete domestic bliss, children are sent. They come as the lawful fruit of marriage, even as clusters appear upon the vine. For the grapes the vine was planted, for children was the wife provided. It is generally well with any creature when it fulfils its purpose, and it is so far well with married people when the great design of their union is brought about. They must not look upon fruitfulness as a burden, but as a blessing. Good wives are also fruitful in kindness, thrift, helpfulness and affection. If they bear no children, they are by no means barren if they yield us the wine of consolation and the clusters of comfort. Truly blessed is the man whose wife is fruitful in those good works which are suitable to her near and dear position. By the sides of thine house. She keeps to the house. She is a home bird. Some imagine that she is like a vine which is nailed up to the house wall. But they have no such custom in Palestine. Neither is it pleasant to think of a wife as growing up by a wall, and as bound to the very bricks and mortar of her husband's dwelling. No, she is a fruitful vine and a faithful housekeeper. If you wish to find her, she is within the house. She is to be found both inside and outside the home, but her chief usefulness is in the inner side of the dwelling, which she adorns. Eastern houses usually have an open square in the centre, and the various rooms are ranged around the sides. There shall the wife be found, busy in one room or another, as the hour of the day demands. She keeps at home, and so keeps the home. It is her husband's house, and she is her husband's. As the text puts it, thy wife, and thy house. But by her loving care, her husband is made so happy that he is glad to own her as an equal proprietor with himself. For he is hers, and the house is hers too. Thy children, like olive plants, round about thy table, Hundreds of times have I seen the young olive plants springing up around the parent stem, and it has always made me think of this verse. The psalmist never intended to suggest the idea of olive plants round a table, but of young people springing up around their parents, even as olive plants surround the fine well-rooted tree. The figure is very striking, and would be sure to present itself to the mind of every observer in the olive country. How beautiful to see the gnarled olive still bearing abundant fruit, surrounded with a little band of sturdy successors, any one of which would be able to take its place should the central olive be blown down or removed in any other way. The notion of a table in a bower may suit a cockney in a tea garden, but would never occur to an oriental poet. It is not the olive plants, but the children that are round about the table. Moreover, note that it is not olive branches, but plants, a very different thing. Our children gather around our table to be fed, and this involves expenses. How much better is this than to see them pining upon beds of sickness, unable to come for their meals? What a blessing to have sufficient to put upon the table! Let us for this benefit praise the bounty of the Lord. The wife is busy all over the house but the youngsters are busiest at mealtimes, and if the blessing of the Lord rest upon the family, no sight can be more delightful. Here we have the vine and the olive blended, 
joy from the fruitful wife, and solid comfort from the growing family. These are the choicest products earth can yield. Our families are gardens of the Lord. It may help us to value the privileges of our home if we consider where we should be if they were withdrawn. What if the dear partner of our life were removed from the sides of our house to the recesses of the sepulchre? What is the trouble of children compared with the sorrow of their loss? Think, dear father, what would be your grief if you had to cry with Job, Oh, that I were as in months past, as in the days when God preserved me, when my children were about me. 4. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. Mark this, put a nota bene against it, for it is worthy of observation. It is not to be inferred that all blessed men are married and are fathers, but that this is the way in which the Lord favours godly people who are placed in domestic life. He makes their relationships happy and profitable. In this fashion does Jehovah bless God-fearing households, for he is the God of all the families of Israel. We have seen this blessing scores of times, and we have never ceased to admire in domestic peace the sweetest of human felicity. Family blessedness comes from the Lord and is a part of his plan for the preservation of a godly race and for the maintenance of his worship in the land. To the Lord alone we must look for it. The possession of riches will not ensure it. The choice of a healthy and beautiful bride will not ensure it. The birth of numerous comely children will not ensure it. There must be the blessing of God the influence of piety, the result of holy living. 5. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion. A spiritual blessing shall be received by the gracious man, and this shall crown all his temporal mercies. He is one among the many who make up God's inheritance. His tent is part and parcel of the encampment around the tabernacle, and therefore when the benediction is pronounced at the centre, it shall radiate to him in his place. The blessing of the house of God shall be upon his house. The priestly benediction, which is recorded in Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 to 26, runs thus, quote, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace, end quote. This is it which shall come upon the head of the God-fearing man. Zion was the centre of blessing, and to it the people looked when they sought for mercy. From the altar of sacrifice, from the mercy seat, from the Shekinah light, yea, from Jehovah himself, the blessing shall come to each one of his holy people. And thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. He shall have a patriot's joy as well as a patriarch's peace. God shall give him to see his country prosper and its metropolitan city flourish. When tent mercies are followed by temple mercies, and these are attended by national mercies, the man, the worshipper, the patriot, is trebly favoured of the Lord. This favour is to be permanent throughout the good man's life, and that life is to be a long one for he is to see his son's sons. Many a time does true religion bring such blessings to men, and when these good things are denied them, they have a greater reward as a compensation. 6. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children. This is a great pleasure. Men live their young lives over again in their grandchildren. Does not Solomon say that, quote, Children's children are the crown of old men. End quote. So they are. The good man is glad that a pious stock is likely to be continued. He rejoices in the belief that other homes as happy as his own will be built up wherein altars to the glory of God shall smoke with the morning and evening sacrifice. This promise implies long life, and that life rendered happy by its being continued in our offspring. It is one token of the immortality of man 
that he derives joy from extending his life in the lives of his descendants. And peace upon Israel. With this sweet word, Psalm 125 was closed. It is a favourite formula. Let God's own heritage be at peace, and we are all glad of it. We count it our own prosperity for the chosen of the Lord to find rest and quiet. Jacob was sorely tossed about. His life knew little of peace. But yet the Lord delivered him out of all his tribulations and brought him to a place of rest in Goshen for a while and afterwards to sleep with his fathers in the cave of Machpelah. His glorious seed was grievously afflicted and at last crucified. But he has risen to eternal peace, and in his peace we dwell. Israel's spiritual descendants still share his chequered conditions, but there remains a rest for them also, and they shall have peace from the God of peace. Israel was a praying petitioner in the days of his wrestling, but he became a prevailing prince, and therein his soul found peace. Yes, all around it is true. Peace upon Israel. Peace upon Israel. End of Psalm 128psalm 129 of the treasury of david volume 7 by c h spurgeon this librivox recording is in the public domain read by jillian hendry psalm 129 title a song of degrees i fail to see how this is a step beyond the previous psalm and yet it is clearly the song of an older and more tried individual who looks back upon a life of affliction in which he suffered all along, even from his youth. Inasmuch as patience is a higher, or at least more difficult, grace than domestic love, the ascent or progress may perhaps be seen in that direction. Probably if we knew more of the stations on the road to the temple, we should see a reason for the order of these psalms. But as that information cannot be obtained, we must take the songs as we find them, and remember that, as we do not now go on pilgrimages to Zion, it is our curiosity and not our necessity which is a loser by our not knowing the cause of the arrangement of the songs in this pilgrim psalter. Author and so on. It does not seem to us at all needful to ascribe this psalm to a period subsequent to the captivity. Indeed, it is more suitable to a time when, as yet, the enemy had not so far prevailed as to have carried the people into a distant land. It is a mingled hymn of sorrow and of strong resolve. Though sorely smitten, the afflicted one is heart whole, and scorns to yield in the least degree to the enemy. The poet sings the trials of Israel, verses 1 to 3, the interposition of the Lord, verse 4, and the unblessed condition of Israel's foes, verses 5 to 8. It is a rustic song, full of allusions to husbandry. It reminds us of the books of Ruth and Amos. Exposition Verses 1-8 to eight. Many a time have they afflicted me from my youth, may Israel now say. Many a time have they afflicted me from my youth, yet they have not prevailed against me. The plowers ploughed upon my back, they made long their furrows. The Lord is righteous, he hath cut asunder the cords of the wicked. Let them all be confounded and turned back that hate Zion. Let them be as the grass upon the housetops, which withereth afore it groweth up, wherewith the moor filleth not his hand, nor he that bindeth sheaves his bosom. Neither do they which go by say, The blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. 1. Many a time have they afflicted me from my youth may Israel now say. In her present hour of trial, she may remember her former afflictions and speak of them for her comfort, drawing from them the assurance that he who has been with her for so long will not desert her in the end. The song begins abruptly. The poet has been musing and the fire burns, therefore speaks he with his tongue. He cannot help it. He feels that he must speak and therefore may now say, 
what he has to say. The trials of the church have been repeated again and again, times beyond all count. The same afflictions are fulfilled in us as in our fathers. Jacob, of old, found his days full of trouble. Each Israelite is often harassed, and Israel as a whole has proceeded from tribulation to tribulation. Many a time, Israel says, because she could not say how many times. She speaks of her assailants as they, because it would be impossible to write or even to know all their names. They had straightened, harassed, and fought against her from the earliest days of her history, from her youth, and they had continued their assaults right on without ceasing. Persecution is the heirloom of the church and the ensign of the elect. Israel among the nations was peculiar, and this peculiarity brought against her many restless foes who could never be easy unless they were warring against the people of God. When in Canaan, at the first, the chosen household was often severely tried. In Egypt, it was heavily oppressed. In the wilderness, it was fiercely assailed. And in the promised land, it was often surrounded by deadly enemies. It was something for the afflicted nation that it survived to say, Many a time have they afflicted me. The affliction began early, from my youth, and it continued late. The earliest years of Israel, and of the Church of God, are spent in trial. Babes in grace are cradled in opposition. No sooner is the man-child born than the dragon is after it. It is, however, good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth, and he shall see it to be so when in after days he tells the tale. 2. Many a time have they afflicted me from my youth. Israel repeats her statement of her repeated afflictions. The fact was uppermost in her thoughts, and she could not help soliloquizing upon it again and again. These repetitions are after the manner of poetry. Thus she makes a sonnet out of her sorrows, music out of her miseries. Yet they have not prevailed against me. We seem to hear the beat of timbrels and the clash of cymbals here. The foe is derided. His malice has failed. That yet breaks in like the blast of trumpets or the roll of kettle drums. Cast down but not destroyed is the shout of a victor. Israel has wrestled and has overcome in the struggle. Who wonders? If Israel overcame the angel of the covenant, what man or devil shall vanquish him? The fight was oft renewed and long protracted. The champion severely felt the conflict and was at times fearful of the issue. But at length he takes breath and cries, Yet they have not prevailed against me. Many a time, yes, many a time, the enemy has had his opportunity and his vantage, but not so much as once has he gained the victory. 3. The plowers ploughed upon my back. The scourgers tore the flesh as ploughmen furrow a field. The people were maltreated like a criminal given over to the lictors with their cruel whips. The back of the nation was scored and furrowed by oppression. It is a grand piece of imagery condensed into a few words. A writer says the metaphor is muddled, but he is mistaken. There are several figures like wheel within wheel, but there is no confusion. The afflicted nation was, as it were, lashed by her adversaries so cruelly that each blow left a long red mark, or perhaps a bleeding wound, upon her back and shoulders, comparable to a furrow which tears up the ground from one end of the field to the other. Many a heart has been in like case, smitten and sore wounded by them that use the scourge of the tongue so smitten that their whole character has been cut up and scored by calumny. The true church has in every age had fellowship with her Lord under his cruel flagellations. His sufferings were a prophecy of what she would be called hereafter to endure, and the foreshadowing has been fulfilled. Zion has in this sense been ploughed as a field. They made long their furrows as if delighting in their cruel labour. They missed not an inch, 
but went from end to end of the field, meaning to make thorough work of their congenial engagement. Those who laid on the scourge did it with a thoroughness which showed how hearty was their hate. Assuredly, the enemies of Christ's church never spare pains to inflict the utmost injury. They never do the work of the devil deceitfully or hold back their hand from blood. They smite so as to plough into the man. They plough the quivering flesh as if it were clods of clay. They plough deep and long with countless furrows until they leave no portion of the church unfurrowed or unassailed. Ah me, well did Latimer say that there was no busier ploughman in all the world than the devil. Whoever makes short furrows, he does not. Whoever bulks and shirks, he is thorough in all that he does. Whoever stops work at sundown, he never does. He and his children plough like practised ploughmen but they prefer to carry on their pernicious work upon the saints behind their backs, for they are as cowardly as they are cruel. 4. The Lord is righteous. Whatever men may be, Jehovah remains just, and will therefore keep covenant with his people and deal out justice to their oppressors. Here is the hinge of the condition. This makes the turning point of Israel's distress. The Lord bears with the long furrows of the wicked, but he will surely make them cease from their ploughing before he has done with them. He hath cut asunder the cords of the wicked. The rope which binds the oxen to the plough is cut. The cord which bound the victim is broken. The bond which held the enemies in cruel unity has snapped. As in Psalm 124, verse 7, we read, quote, The snare is broken, we are escaped. End quote. So here, the breaking of the enemy's instrument of oppression is Israel's release. Sooner or later, a righteous God will interpose, and when he does so, his action will be most effectual. He does not unfasten, but cuts asunder the harness which the ungodly use in their labour of hate. Never has God used a nation to chastise his Israel without destroying that nation when the chastisement has come to a close. He hates those who hurt his people, even though he permits their hate to triumph for a while, for his own purpose. If any man would have his harness cut, let him begin to plough one of the Lord's fields with the plough of persecution. The shortest way to ruin is to meddle with a saint. The divine warning is, he that toucheth you, toucheth the apple of his eye. 5. Let them all be confounded and turned back that hate Zion. And so say we right heartily, and in this case, vox populi is vox dei, for so it shall be. If this be an imprecation, let it stand, for our heart says Amen to it. It is but justice that those who hate, harass, and hurt the good should be brought to naught. Those who confound right and wrong ought to be confounded, and those who turn back from God ought to be turned back. Loyal subjects wish ill to those who plot against their king. Confound their politics, frustrate their knavish tricks, is but a proper wish, and contains within it no trace of personal ill will. We desire their welfare as men, their downfall as traitors. Let their conspiracies be confounded, their policies be turned back. How can we wish prosperity to those who would destroy that which is dearest to our hearts? This present age is so flippant that if a man loves the Saviour, he is styled a fanatic, and if he hates the powers of evil, he is named a bigot. As for ourselves, despite all objectors, we join heartily in this combination, and would revive in our heart the old practice of Ebal and Gerizim, where those were blessed who bless God, and those were cursed who make themselves a curse to the righteous. We have heard men desire a thousand times that the gallows might be the reward of the assassins who murdered two inoffensive men in Dublin, and we could never censure the wish, for justice ought to be rendered to the evil as well as to the good. 
Besides, the church of God is so useful, so beautiful, so innocent of harm, so fraught with good, that those who do her wrong are wronging all mankind and deserve to be treated as the enemies of the human race. Study a chapter from the Book of Martyrs and see if you do not feel inclined to read an imprecatory psalm over Bishop Bonner and Bloody Mary. It may be that some wretched 19th century sentimentalist will blame you. If so, read another over him. 6. Let them be as the grass upon the housetops, which withereth afore it groweth up. Grass on the housetop is soon up and soon down. It sprouts in the heat, finds enough nutriment to send up a green blade, and then it dies away before it reaches maturity, because it has neither earth nor moisture sufficient for its proper development. Before it grows up, it dies. It needs not to be plucked up, for it hastens to decay of itself. Such is and such ought to be the lot of the enemies of God's people. Transient is their prosperity, speedy is their destruction. The height of their position, as it hastens their progress, so it hurries their doom. Had they been lower in station, they had perhaps been longer in being. Soon ripe, soon rotten, is an old proverb. Soon plotting and soon rotting is a version of the old adage which will suit in this place. We have seen grass on the rustic thatch of our own country cottages, which will serve for an illustration almost as well as that which comes up so readily on the flat roofs and domes of eastern habitations. The idea is, they make speed to success and equal speed to failure. Persecutors are all sound and fury, flash and flame, but they speedily vanish more speedily than is common to men. Grass in the field withers, but not so speedily as grass on the housetops. Without a more, the tufts of verdure perish from the roofs, and so do opposers pass away by other deaths than fall to the common lot of men. They are gone, and none is the worse. If they are missed at all, their absence is never regretted. Grass on the housetop is an nonentity in the world. The house is not impoverished when the last blade is dried up, and even so the opposers of Christ pass away and none lament them. One of the fathers said of the apostate Emperor Julian, quote, That little cloud will soon be gone, end quote. and so it was. Every sceptical system of philosophy has much the same history, and the like may be said of each heresy. Poor, rootless things. They are and are not. They come and go, even though no one rises against them. Evil carries the seeds of dissolution within itself. So let it be. 7. Wherewith the more filleth not his hand, nor he that bindeth sheaves his bosom. When with his sickle the husbandman would cut down the tufts, he found nothing to lay hold upon. The grass promised fairly enough, but there was no fulfilment. There was nothing to cut or to carry, nothing for the hand to grasp, nothing for the lap to gather. Easterns carry their corn in their bosoms, but in this case there was nothing to bear home. Thus do the wicked come to nothing. By God's just appointment, they prove a disappointment. Their fire ends in smoke, their verdure turns to vanity, their flourishing is but a form of withering. No one profits by them, least of all are they profitable to themselves. Their aim is bad, their work is worse, their end is worst of all. 8. Neither do they which go by say, The blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. In harvest times men bless each other in the name of the Lord but there is nothing in the course and conduct of the ungodly man to suggest the giving or receiving of a benediction. Upon a survey of the sinner's life from beginning to end, we feel more inclined to weep than to rejoice, and we feel bound rather to wish him failure than success. We dare not use pious expressions as mere compliments, and hence we dare not wish God speed to evil men 
lest we be partakers of their evil deeds. When persecutors are worrying the saints, we cannot say, The blessing of the Lord be upon you. When they slander the godly and oppose the doctrine of the cross, we dare not bless them in the name of the Lord. It would be infamous to compromise the name of the righteous Jehovah by pronouncing his blessing upon unrighteous deeds. See how godly men are roughly ploughed by their adversaries, and yet a harvest comes of it which endures and produces blessing, while the ungodly, though they flourish for a while and enjoy a complete immunity, dwelling as they think quite above the reach of harm, are found in a short time to have gone their way and to have left no trace behind. Lord, number me with thy saints. Let me share their grief, if I may also partake of their glory. Thus would I make this psalm my own, and magnify thy name, because thine afflicted ones are not destroyed, and thy persecuted ones are not forsaken. End of Psalm 129「Psalm 130 of the Treasury of David, Volume 7, by C. H. Spurgeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Psalm 130. Title. A Song of Degrees. It would be hard to see any upward step from the preceding to the present psalm, and therefore it is possible that the steps, or ascents, are in the song itself. Certainly it does rise rapidly out of the depths of anguish to the heights of assurance. It follows well upon 129. When we have overcome the trials which arise from man, we are the better prepared to meet those sharper sorrows which arise out of our matters towards God. He who has borne the scourges of the wicked is trained in all patience to wait the dealings of the Holy Lord. We name this the De Profundis Psalm. Out of the depths is the leading word of it. Out of those depths we cry, wait, watch, and hope. In this psalm we hear of the peril of redemption, verses 7 and 8. Perhaps the sweet singer would never have found that precious thing had he not been cast into the depths. Perils lie deep. Division the first two verses reveal an intense desire, and the next two are a humble confession of repentance and faith, verses 3 and 4. In verses 5 and 6, waiting watchfulness is declared and resolved upon, and in the last two verses, joyful expectation, both for himself and all Israel, finds expression. Exposition Verses 1 to 8 out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. 1. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. This is the psalmist's statement and plea. He had never ceased to pray, even when brought into the lowest state. The depths usually silence all they engulf, but they could not close the mouth of this servant of the Lord. On the contrary, it was in the abyss itself that he cried unto Jehovah. Beneath the floods, prayer lived and struggled. Yea, above the roar of the billows rose the cry of faith. It little matters where we are if we can pray. But prayer is never more real and acceptable than when it rises out of the worst places. Deep places beget deep devotion. Depths of earnestness 
are stirred by depths of tribulation. Diamonds sparkle most amid the darkness. Prayer de profundis gives to God gloria in excelsis. The more distressed we are, the more excellent is the faith which trusts bravely in the Lord, and therefore appeals to him and to him alone. Good men may be in the depths of temporal and spiritual trouble, but good men in such cases look only to their God, and they stir themselves up to be more instant and earnest in prayer than at other times. The depth of their distress moves the depths of their being, and from the bottom of their hearts an exceeding great and bitter cry rises unto the one living and true God. David had often been in the deep, and as often had he pleaded with Jehovah, his God, in whose hand are all deep places. He prayed, and remembered that he had prayed, and pleaded that he had prayed, hoping ere long to receive an answer. It would be dreadful to look back on trouble, and feel forced to own that we did not cry unto the Lord in it. But it is most comforting to know that whatever we did not do, or could not do, yet we did pray, even in our worst times. He that prays in the depth will not sink out of his depth. He that cries out of the depths shall soon sing in the heights. 2. Lord, hear my voice. It is all we ask, but nothing less will content us. If the Lord will but hear us, we will leave it to his superior wisdom to decide whether he will answer us or no. It is better for our prayer to be heard than answered. If the Lord were to make an absolute promise to answer all our requests, it might be rather a curse than a blessing, for it would be casting the responsibility of our lives upon ourselves, and we should be placed in a very anxious position. But now the Lord hears our desires, and that is enough. We only wish him to grant them if his infinite wisdom sees that it would be for our good and for his glory. Note that the psalmist spoke audibly in prayer. This is not at all needful, but it is exceedingly helpful, for the use of the voice assists the thoughts. Still, there is a voice in silent supplication, a voice in our weeping, a voice in that sorrow which cannot find a tongue. That voice the Lord will hear if its cry is meant for his ear. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. The psalmist's cry is a beggar's petition. He begs the great king and lord to lend an ear to it. He has supplicated many times, but always with one voice, or for one purpose, and he begs to be noticed in the one matter which he has pressed with so much importunity. He would have the king hearken, consider, remember, and weigh his request. He is confused, and his prayer may therefore be broken and difficult to understand. He begs therefore that his Lord will give the more earnest and compassionate heed to the voice of his many and painful pleadings. When we have already prayed over our troubles, it is well to pray over our prayers. If we can find no more words, let us entreat the Lord to hear those petitions which we have already presented. If we have faithfully obeyed the precept by praying without ceasing, we may be confident that the Lord will faithfully fulfil the promise by helping us without fail. Though the psalmist was under a painful sense of sin, and so was in the depth, his faith pleaded in the teeth of conscious unworthiness, for well he knew that the Lord's keeping his promise depends upon his own character and not upon that of his erring creatures. 3. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? If Yah, the all-seeing, should in strict justice call every man to account for every want of conformity to righteousness, where would any one of us be? Truly he does record all our transgressions, but as yet he does not act upon the record, but lays it aside till another day. If men were to be judged upon no system but that of works, 
who among us could answer for himself at the Lord's bar, and hope to stand clear and accepted. This verse shows that the psalmist was under a sense of sin, and felt it imperative upon him not only to cry as a suppliant, but to confess as a sinner. Here he owns that he cannot stand before the great king in his own righteousness, and he is so struck with a sense of the holiness of God and the rectitude of the law that he is convinced that no man of mortal race can answer for himself before a judge so perfect concerning a law so divine. Well does he cry, O Lord, who shall stand? None can do so. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Iniquities are matters which are not according to equity. What a multitude we have of these! Jehovah, who sees all, and is also our Adonai, or Lord, will assuredly bring us into judgment concerning those thoughts and words and works which are not in exact conformity to his law. Were it not for the Lord Jesus, could we hope to stand? Dare we meet him in the dread day of account, on the footing of law and equity? What a mercy it is that we need not do so, for the next verse sets forth another way of acceptance to which we flee. 4. But there is forgiveness with thee. Blessed but. Free, full, sovereign pardon is in the hand of the great king. It is his prerogative to forgive, and he delights to exercise it. Because his nature is mercy, and because he has provided a sacrifice for sin, therefore forgiveness is with him for all that come to him, confessing their sins. The power of pardon is permanently resident with God. He has forgiveness ready to his hand at this instant. That thou mayest be feared. This is the fruitful root of piety. None fear the Lord like those who have experienced his forgiving love. Gratitude for pardon produces far more fear and reverence of God than all the dread which is inspired by punishment. If the Lord were to execute justice upon all, there would be none left to fear him. If all were under apprehension of his deserved wrath, despair would harden them against fearing him. It is grace which leads the way to a holy regard of God and a fear of grieving him. 5. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait. Expecting him to come to me in love, I quietly wait for his appearing. I wait upon him in service, and for him in faith. For God I wait, and for him only. If he will manifest himself, I shall have nothing more to wait for. But until he shall appear for my help, I must wait on, hoping even in the depths. This waiting of mine is no mere formal act. My very soul is in it. My soul doth wait. I wait, and I wait. Mark the repetition. My soul waits, and then again, my soul waits to make sure work of the waiting. It is well to deal with the Lord intensely. Such repetitions are the reverse of vain repetitions. If the Lord Jehovah makes us wait, let us do so with our whole hearts. For blessed are all they that wait for him. He is worth waiting for. The waiting itself is beneficial to us. It tries faith, exercises patience, trains submission, and endears the blessing when it comes. The Lord's people have always been a waiting people. They waited for the first advent, and now they wait for the second. They waited for a sense of pardon, and now they wait for perfect sanctification. They waited in the depths, and they are not now wearied with waiting in the happier condition. They have cried, and they do wait, probably their past prayer, sustains their present patience. And in his word do I hope. This is the source, strength and sweetness of waiting. Those who do not hope cannot wait. But if we hope for that we see not, 
then do we, with patience, wait for it. God's word is a true word, but at times it tarries. If ours is true faith, it will wait the Lord's time. A word from the Lord is as bread to the soul of the believer, and refreshed thereby, it holds out through the night of sorrow, expecting the dawn of deliverance and delight. Waiting, we study the word, believe the word, hope in the word, and live on the word, and all because it is his word, the word of him who never speaks in vain. Jehovah's word is a firm ground for a waiting soul to rest upon. 6. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. Men who guard a city and women who wait by the sick long for daylight. Worshippers tarrying for the morning sacrifice, the kindling of the incense and the lighting of the lamps, mingle fervent prayers with their holy vigils, and pine for the hour when the lamb shall smoke upon the altar. David, however, waited more than these, waited longer, waited more longingly, waited more expectantly. He was not afraid of the great Adonai, before whom none can stand in their own righteousness, for he had put on the righteousness of faith, and therefore longed for gracious audience with the Holy One. God was no more dreaded by him than light is dreaded by those engaged in a lawful calling. He pined and yearned after his God. I say, more than they that watch for the morning. The figure was not strong enough, though one can hardly think of anything more vigorous. He felt that his own eagerness was unique and unrivalled. Oh, to be thus hungry and thirsty after God! Our version spoils the abruptness of the language. The original runs thus, quote, my soul for the Lord more than those watching for the morning, watching for the morning. End quote. This is a fine poetical repeat. We long for the favour of the Lord more than weary sentinels long for the morning light, which will release them from their tedious watch. Indeed, this is true. He that hath once rejoiced in communion with God is so tried by the hidings of his face and grows faint with strong desire for the Lord's appearing. When wilt thou come unto me, Lord? Until thou dost appear, I count each moment for a day, each minute for a year. 7. Let Israel hope in the Lord. Or, hope thou, Israel, in Jehovah. Jehovah is Israel's God, therefore let Israel hope in him. What one Israelite does, he wishes all Israel to do. That man has a just right to exhort others, who is himself setting the example. Israel of old waited upon Jehovah and wrestled all the night long, and at last he went his way, succoured by the hope of Israel. The like shall happen to all his seed. God has great things in store for his people. They ought to have large expectations. For with the Lord there is mercy. This is in his very nature, and by the light of nature it may be seen. But we have also the light of grace, and therefore we see still more of his mercy. With us there is sin, but hope is ours, because with the Lord there is mercy. Our comfort lies not in that which is with us, but in that which is with her God. Let us look out of self and its poverty to Jehovah and his riches of mercy. And with him is plenteous redemption. He can and will redeem all his people out of their many and great troubles. Nay, their redemption is already wrought out and laid up with him, so that he can at any time give his waiting ones the full benefit thereof. The attribute of mercy and the fact of redemption, are two most sufficient reasons for hoping in Jehovah, and the fact that there is no mercy or deliverance elsewhere should effectually wean the soul from all idolatry. 
are not these deep things of God a grand comfort for those who are crying out of the depths? Is it not better to be in the deeps with David, hoping in God's mercy, than up on the mountain tops, boasting in our own fancied righteousness? 8. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Our iniquities are our worst dangers. If saved from these, we are saved altogether. But there is no salvation from them except by redemption. What a blessing that this is here promised in terms which remove it out of the regions of question. The Lord shall certainly redeem his believing people from all their sins. Well may the redemption be plenteous, since it concerns all Israel and all iniquities. Truly, our psalm has ascended to a great height in this verse. There is no cry out of the depths, but a chorale in the heights. Redemption is the top of covenant blessings. When it shall be experienced by all Israel, the latter-day glory shall have come, and the Lord's people shall say, Now, Lord, what wait we for? Is not this a clear prophecy of the coming of our Lord Jesus the first time? And may we not now regard it as the promise of his second and more glorious coming for the redemption of the body? For this our soul doth wait. Yea, our heart and our flesh cry out for it with joyful expectation. End of Psalm 130Psalm 131 of the Treasury of David, Volume 7, by C. H. Spurgeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Psalm 131. Title, A Song of Degrees of David. It is both by David and of David. He is the author and the subject of it, and many incidents of his life may be employed to illustrate it. Comparing all the Psalms to gems, we should liken this to a pearl. How beautifully it will adorn the neck of patience. It is one of the shortest psalms to read, but one of the longest to learn. It speaks of a young child, but it contains the experience of a man in Christ. Lowliness and humility are here seen in connection with a sanctified heart, a will subdued to the mind of God, and a hope looking to the Lord alone. Happy is the man who can, without falsehood, use these words as his own, for he wears about him the likeness of his Lord, who said, quote, I am meek and lowly in heart. End quote. The psalm is in advance of all the songs of degrees which have preceded it, for lowliness is one of the highest attainments in the divine life. There are also steps in this song of degrees. It is a short ladder, if we count the words but yet it rises to a great height, reaching from deep humility to fixed confidence. Leblanc thinks that this is a song of the Israelites who returned from Babylon with humble hearts, weaned from their idols. At any rate, after any spiritual captivity, let it be the expression of our hearts. Exposition Verses 1-3 to three. Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty. Neither do I exercise myself in great matters, or in things too high for me. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself, as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. Let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and for ever. 1. Lord, my heart is not haughty. The psalm deals with the Lord, and is a solitary colloquy with him, but not a discourse before men. We have a sufficient audience when we speak with the Lord, and we may say to him many things which were not proper for the ears of men. The holy man makes his appeal to Jehovah, who alone knows the heart. A man should be slow to do this upon any matter, for the Lord is not to be trifled with, and when any one ventures on such an appeal, he should be sure of his case. He begins with his heart, for that is the centre of our nature, and if pride be there, it defiles everything, just as mire in the spring 
causes mud in all the streams. It is a grand thing for a man to know his own heart so as to be able to speak before the Lord about it. It is beyond all things deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can know it unless taught by the Spirit of God? It is a still greater thing if, upon searching himself thoroughly, a man can solemnly protest unto the omniscient one that his heart is not haughty, that is to say, neither proud in his opinion of himself, contemptuous to others, nor self-righteous before the Lord, neither boastful of the past, proud of the present, nor ambitious for the future. Nor mine eyes lofty. What the heart desires, the eyes look for. Where the desires run, the glances usually follow. This holy man felt that he did not seek after elevated places where he might gratify his self-esteem. Neither did he look down upon others as being his inferiors. A proud look the Lord hates, and in this all men are agreed with him. Yea, even the proud themselves hate haughtiness in the gestures of others. Lofty eyes are so generally hateful that haughty men have been known to avoid the manners natural to the proud in order to escape the ill-will of their fellows. The pride which apes humility always takes care to cast its eyes downwards, since every man's consciousness tells him that contemptuous glances are the sure ensigns of a boastful spirit. In Psalm 121, David lifted up his eyes to the hills, but here he declares that they were not lifted up in any other sense. When the heart is right and the eyes are right, the whole man is on the road to a healthy and happy condition. Let us take care that we do not use the language of this psalm unless indeed it be true as to ourselves, for there is no worse pride than that which claims humility when it does not possess it. Neither do I exercise myself in great matters. As a private man, he did not usurp the power of the king or devise plots against him. He minded his own business and left others to mind theirs. As a thoughtful man, he did not pry into things unrevealed. He was not speculative, self-conceited or opinionated. As a secular person, he did not thrust himself into the priesthood as Saul had done before him and as Uzziah did after him. It is well so to exercise ourselves unto godliness that we know our true sphere and diligently keep to it. Many, through wishing to be great, have failed to be good. They were not content to adorn the lowly stations which the Lord appointed them, and so they have rushed at grandeur and power, and found destruction where they looked for honour. Or in things too high for me. High things may suit others who are of greater stature, and yet they may be quite unfit for us. A man does well to know his own size. Ascertaining his own capacity, he will be foolish if he aims at that which is beyond his reach, straining himself, and thus injuring himself. Such is the vanity of many men, that if a work be within their range, they despise it, and think it beneath them. The only service which they are willing to undertake is that to which they have never been called, and for which they are by no means qualified. What a haughty heart must he have who will not serve God at all, unless he may be trusted with five talents at the least. His looks are indeed lofty, who disdains to be a light among his poor friends and neighbours here below, but demands to be created a star of the first magnitude to shine among the upper ranks and to be admired by gazing crowds. It is just on God's part that those who wish to be everything should end in being nothing. It is a righteous retribution from God when every matter turns out to be too great for the man who would only handle great matters, and everything proves to be too high for the man who exercised himself in things too high for him. Lord, make us lowly, keep us lowly, fix us forever in lowliness. Help us to be in such a case that the confession of this verse may come from our lips as a truthful utterance which we dare make before the judge of all the earth. 2. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself. 
The original bears somewhat of the form of an oath, and therefore our translators exhibited great judgment in introducing the word surely. It is not a literal version, but it correctly gives the meaning. The psalmist had been upon his best behaviour, and had smoothed down the roughnesses of his self-will. By holy effort he had mastered his own spirit, so that towards God he was not rebellious, even as towards man he was not haughty. It is no easy thing to quiet yourself. Sooner may a man calm the sea, or rule the wind, or tame a tiger, than quiet himself. We are clamorous, uneasy, petulant, and nothing but grace can make us quiet under afflictions, irritations, and disappointments. As a child that is weaned of his mother. He had become as subdued and content as a child whose weaning is fully accomplished. The Easterns put off the time of weaning far later than we do, and we may conclude that the process grows none the easier by being postponed. At last there must be an end to the suckling period, and then a battle begins. The child is denied his comfort, and therefore frets and worries, flies into pets, or sinks into sulks. It is facing its first great sorrow, and it is in sore distress. Yet time brings not only alleviations, but the ending of the conflict. The boy ere long is quite content to find his nourishment at the table with his brothers, and he feels no lingering wish to return to those dear fountains from which he once sustained his life. He is no longer angry with his mother, but buries his head in that very bosom after which he pined so grievously. He is weaned on his mother rather than from her. My soul doth, like a weanling, rest, I cease to weep, so a mother's lap, though dried her breast, can lull to sleep. To the weaned child, his mother is his comfort, though she has denied him comfort. It is a blessed mark of growth out of spiritual infancy when we can forego the joys which once appeared to be essential, and can find our solace in him who denies them to us. Then we behave manfully, and every childish complaint is hushed. If the Lord removes our dearest delight, we bow to his will without a murmuring thought. In fact, we find a delight in giving up our delight. This is no spontaneous fruit of nature, but a well-tended product of divine grace. It grows out of humility and lowliness, and it is the stem upon which peace blooms as a fair flower. My soul is even as a weaned child. Or it may be read, as a weaned child, on me my soul, as if his soul leaned upon him in mute submission, neither boasting nor complaining. It is not every child of God who arrives at this windness speedily. Some are sucklings when they ought to be fathers. Others are hard to wean and cry and fight and rage against their heavenly parents' discipline. When we think ourselves safely through the weaning, we sadly discover that the old appetites are rather wounded than slain, and we begin crying again for the breasts which we had given up. It is easy to begin shouting before we are out of the wood, and no doubt hundreds have sung this psalm long before they have understood it. Blessed are those afflictions which subdue our affections, which wean us from self-sufficiency, which educate us into Christian manliness, which teach us to love God not merely when he comforts us, but even when he tries us. Well might the sacred poet repeat his figure of the weaned child. It is worthy of admiration and imitation. It is doubly desirable and difficult of attainment. Such weanedness from self springs from the gentle humility declared in the former verse and partly accounts for its existence. If pride is gone, submission will be sure to follow. And on the other hand, if pride is to be driven out, self must also be vanquished. 3. Let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever. See how lovingly a man who is weaned from self thinks of others. David thinks of his people and loses himself in his care for Israel. How he prizes the grace of hope. He has given up the things which are seen, and therefore he values the treasures which are not seen, 
except by the eyes of hope. There is room for the largest hope when self is gone, ground for eternal hope when transient things no longer hold the mastery of our spirits. This verse is the lesson of experience. A man of God, who had been taught to renounce the world and live upon the Lord alone, here exhorts all his friends and companions to do the same. He found it a blessed thing to live by hope, and therefore he would have all his kinsmen do the same. Let all the nation hope, let all their hope be in Jehovah, let them at once begin hoping from henceforth, and let them continue hoping forever. Weaning takes the child out of a temporary condition into a state in which he will continue for the rest of his life. To rise above the world is to enter upon a heavenly existence which can never end. When we cease to hanker for the world, we begin hoping in the Lord. O oh Lord, as a parent weans a child, so do thou wean me, and then shall I fix all my hope on thee alone. End of Psalm 131「Psalm 132, Part 1, of the Treasury of David, Volume 7, by C. H. Spurgeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Psalm 132, Title, A Song of Degrees. A joyful song indeed. Let all pilgrims to the New Jerusalem sing it often. The degrees or ascents are very visible. The theme ascends step by step, from afflictions to a crown, from remember David to I will make the horn of David to bud. The latter half is like the overarching sky bending above the fields of the wood, which are found in the resolves and prayers of the former portion. Division. Our translators have rightly divided this psalm. It contains a statement of David's anxious care to build a house for the Lord. Verses 1 to 7. A prayer at the removal of the ark. Verses 8 to 10. And a pleading of the divine covenant and its promises. Verses 11 to 18. Exposition. Verses 1 to 7. Lord, remember David and all his afflictions. How he swear unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob. Surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, nor go up into my bed. I will not give sleep to mine eyes, or slumber to mine eyelids, until I find out a place for the Lord, an habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. Lo, we heard of it at Ephrata, we found it in the fields of the wood. We will go into his tabernacles, we will worship at his footstool. 1. Lord, remember David and all his afflictions. With David, the covenant was made, and therefore his name is pleaded on behalf of his descendants and the people who would be blessed by his dynasty. Jehovah, who changes not, will never forget one of his servants or fail to keep his covenant. Yet for this thing he is to be entreated. That which we are assured the Lord will do must nevertheless be made a matter of prayer. The request is that the Lord would remember, and this is a word full of meaning. We know that the Lord remembered Noah and assuaged the flood. He remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of Sodom. He remembered Rachel and Hannah and gave them children. He remembered his mercy to the house of Israel and delivered his people. That is a choice song wherein we sing, He remembered us in our low estate, for his mercy endureth forever. And this is a notable prayer. Lord, remember me. The plea is urged with God that he would bless the family of David for the sake of their progenitor. How much stronger is our master argument in prayer that God would deal well with us for Jesus' sake. David had no personal merit. The plea is based upon the covenant graciously made with him. But Jesus has deserts which are his own and of boundless merit. These we may urge without hesitation. When the Lord was angry with the reigning prince, the people cried, Lord, remember David. And when they needed any special blessing, again they sang, Lord, remember David. This was good pleading, but it was not so good as ours, which runs on this wise. 
Lord remembered Jesus and all his afflictions. The afflictions of David here meant were those which came upon him as a godly man in his endeavours to maintain the worship of Jehovah and to provide for its decent and suitable celebration. There was always an ungodly party in the nation, and these persons were never slow to slander, hinder, and molest the servant of the Lord. Whatever were David's faults, he kept true to the one, only, living and true God, and for this he was a speckled bird among monarchs. Since he zealously delighted in the worship of Jehovah his God, he was despised and ridiculed by those who could not understand his enthusiasm. God will never forget what his people suffer for his sake. No doubt innumerable blessings descend upon families and nations through the godly lives and patient sufferings of the saints. We cannot be saved by the merits of others, but beyond all question we are benefited by their virtues. Paul saith, quote, God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labour of love which ye have showed toward his name. End quote. Under the New Testament dispensation, as well as under the Old, there is a full reward for the righteous. That reward frequently comes upon their descendants rather than upon themselves. They sow and their successors reap. We may at this day pray, Lord, remember the martyrs and confessors of our race who suffered for thy name's sake, and bless our people and nation with gospel grace for our fathers' sakes. 2. How he sware unto the Lord, and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob. Moved by intense devotion, David expressed his resolve in the form of a solemn vow, which was sealed with an oath. The fewer of such vows the better, under a dispensation whose great representative has said, quote, swear not at all, end quote. Perhaps even in this case, it had been wiser to have left the pious resolve in the hands of God in the form of a prayer, for the vow was not actually fulfilled as intended, since the Lord forbade David to build him a temple. We had better not swear to do anything before we know the Lord's mind about it, and then we shall not need to swear. The instance of David's vows shows that vows are allowable, but it does not prove that they are desirable. Probably David went too far in his words, and it is well that the Lord did not hold him to the letter of his bond, but accepted the will for the deed, and the meaning of his promise, instead of the literal sense of it. David imitated Jacob, the great maker of vows at Bethel, and upon him rested the blessing pronounced on Jacob by Isaac, quote, God Almighty bless thee, end quote. Genesis chapter 28 verse 3, which was remembered by the patriarch on his deathbed when he spoke of the mighty God of Jacob. God is mighty to hear us and to help us in performing our vow. We should be full of awe at the idea of making any promise to the mighty God. To dare to trifle with him would be grievous indeed. It is observable that affliction led both David and Jacob into covenant dealings with the Lord. Many vows are made in anguish of soul. We may also remark that, if the votive obligations of David are to be remembered of the Lord, much more are the suretyship engagements of the Lord Jesus before the mind of the great Lord, to whom our soul turns in the hour of our distress. Note upon this verse that Jehovah was the God of Jacob, the same God evermore, that he had this for his attribute, that he is mighty, mighty to succour his Jacobs who put their trust in him, though their afflictions be many. He is moreover specially the mighty one of his people. He is the God of Jacob in a sense in which he is not the God of unbelievers. So here we have three points concerning our God. Name, Jehovah. Attribute, Mighty. Special relationship, mighty God of Jacob. He it is who is asked to remember David and his trials, and there is a plea for that blessing in each one of the three points. 3. Surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, nor go up into my bed. Our translators give the meaning, though not the literal form, 
of David's vow, which ran thus, If I go, if I go up, and so on. This was an elliptical form of imprecation, implying more than it expressed, and having therefore about it a mystery which made it all the more solemn. David would not take his ease in his house, nor his rest in his bed, till he had determined upon a place for the worship of Jehovah. The ark had been neglected, the tabernacle had fallen into disrespect. He would find the ark and build for it a suitable house. He felt that he could not take pleasure in his own palace till this was done. David meant well, but he spake more than he could carry out. His language was hyperbolical, and the Lord knew what he meant. Zeal does not always measure its terms, for it is not thoughtful of the criticisms of men, but is carried away with love to the Lord, who reads the hearts of his people. David would not think himself housed till he had built a house for the Lord, nor would he reckon himself rested till he had said, Arise, O Lord, into thy rest. Alas, we have many around us who will never carry their care for the Lord's worship too far. No fear of their being indiscreet. They are housed and bedded, and as for the Lord, his people may meet in a barn, or never meet at all. It will be all the same to them. Observe that Jacob, in his vow, spoke of the stone being God's house, and David's vow also deals with a house for God. 4. I will not give sleep to mine eyes, or slumber to mine eyelids. He could not enjoy sleep till he had done his best to provide a place for the ark. It is a strong expression, and it is not to be coolly discussed by us. Remember that the man was all on fire, and he was writing poetry also, and therefore his language is not that which we should employ in cold blood. Everybody can see what he means, and how intensely he means it. Oh, that many more were seized with sleeplessness, because the house of the Lord lies waste. They can slumber fast enough, and not even disturb themselves with a dream, though the cause of God should be brought to the lowest ebb by their covetousness. What is to become of those who have no care about divine things, and never give a thought to the claims of their God? 5. Until I find out a place for the Lord, a habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. He resolved to find a place where Jehovah would allow his worship to be celebrated, a house where God would fix the symbol of his presence and commune with his people. At that time, in all David's land, there was no proper place for that ark whereon the Lord had placed the mercy seat, where prayer could be offered and where the manifested glory shone forth. All things had fallen into decay, and the outward forms of public worship were too much disregarded. Hence the king resolves to be first and foremost in establishing a better order of things. Yet one cannot help remembering that the holy resolve of David gave to a place and a house much more importance than the Lord himself ever attached to such matters. This is indicated in Nathan's message from the Lord to the king. Quote, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me an house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. In all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me an house of cedar? End quote. Stephen, in his inspired speech, puts the matter plainly. Quote, Solomon built him an house. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. End quote. It is a strange fact that true religion never flourished more in Israel than before the temple was built and that from the day of the erection of that magnificent house, the spirit of godliness declined. Good men may have on their hearts matters which seem to them of chief importance, and it may be acceptable with God that they should seek to carry them out. And yet, in his infinite wisdom, he may judge it best to prevent their executing their designs. 
God does not measure his people's actions by their wisdom or want of wisdom, but by the sincere desire for his glory which has led up to them. David's resolution, though he was not allowed to fulfil it, brought a blessing upon him. The Lord promised to build the house of David because he had desired to build the house of the Lord. Moreover, the king was allowed to prepare the treasure for the erection of the glorious edifice which was built by his son and successor. The Lord shows the acceptance of what we desire to do by permitting us to do something else, which his infinite mind judges to be fitter for us and more honourable to himself. 6. Meanwhile, where was the habitation of God among men? He was wont to shine forth from between the cherubim, but where was the ark? It was like a hidden thing, a stranger in its own land. Lo, we heard of it at Ephrata. Rumours came that it was somewhere in the land of Ephraim, in a temporary lodging, rather an object of dread than of delight. Is it not wonderful that so renowned a symbol of the presence of the Lord should be lingering in neglect, a neglect so great that it was remarkable that we should have heard of its whereabouts at all? When a man begins to think upon God and his service, it is comforting that the gospel is heard of. Considering the opposition which it has encountered, it is marvellous that it should be heard of, and heard of in a place remote from the central city. And yet we are sorrowful that it is only in connection with some poor despised place that we do hear of it. What is Ephrata? Who at this time knows where it was? How could the ark have remained there so long? David instituted a search for the ark. It had to be hunted for high and low. And at last, at kiriath Jearim, the forest city, he came upon it. How often do souls find Christ and his salvation in out-of-the-way places? What matters where we meet him, so long as we do behold him and find life in him? That is a blessed Eureka, which is embedded in our text. We found it. The matter began with hearing, led on to a search, and concluded in a joyful find. We found it in the fields of the wood. Alas, that there should be no room for the Lord in a palace of kings, so that he must needs take to the woods. If Christ be in a wood, he will yet be found of those who seek for him. He is as near in the rustic home, embowered among the trees, as in the open streets of the city. Yea, he will answer prayer offered from the heart of the black forest, where the lone traveller seems out of all hope of hearing. The text presents us with an instance of one whose heart was set upon finding the place where God would meet with him. This made him quick of hearing, and so the cheering news soon reached him. The tidings renewed his ardour and led him to stick at no difficulties in his search, and so it came to pass that, where he could hardly have expected it, he lighted upon the treasure which he so much prized. 7. We will go into his tabernacles. Having found the place where he dwells, we will hasten thereto. He has many dwellings in one, in the various courts of his house, and each of these shall receive the reverence due. In each the priest shall offer for us the appointed service, and our hearts shall go where our bodies may not enter. David is not alone. He is represented as having sought for the ark with others, for so the word we implies and now they are glad to attend him in his pilgrimage to the chosen shrine, saying, We found it, we will go. Because these are the Lord's courts, we will resort to them. We will worship at his footstool. The best ordered earthly house can be no more than the footstool of so great a king. His ark can only reveal the glories of his feet, according to his promise that he will make the place of his feet glorious. Yet thither will we hasten with joy, in glad companionship, and there we will adorn him. Where Jehovah is, there shall he be worshipped. It is well not only to go to the Lord's house, but to worship there. We do but profane his tabernacles if we enter them for any other purpose. Before leaving this verse, let us note the ascent of this psalm of degrees. 
we heard, we found, we will go, we will worship. End of Psalm 132, Part 1「Psalm 132, Part 2 of the Treasury of David, Volume 7, by C. H. Spurgeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Psalm 132, verses 8 to 10. Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness, and let thy saints shout for joy. For thy servant David's sake, turn not away the face of thine anointed. 8. In these three verses we see the finders of the ark removing it to its appointed place, using a formula somewhat like to that used by Moses when he said, quote, Rise up, Lord, end quote, and again, quote, Return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. End quote. The ark had long been upon the move, and no fit place had been found for it in Canaan. But now devout men have prepared a temple, and they sing, Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. They hoped that now the covenant symbol had found a permanent abode, a rest, and they trusted that Jehovah would now abide with it for ever. Vain would it be for the ark to be settled if the Lord did not continue with it and perpetually shine forth from between the cherubim. Unless the Lord shall rest with us, there is no rest for us. Unless the ark of his strength abide with us, we are ourselves without strength. The Ark of the Covenant is here mentioned by a name which it well deserved, for in its captivity it smote its captors and broke their gods, and when it was brought back it guarded its own honour by the death of those who dared to treat it with disrespect. The power of God was thus connected with the sacred chest. Reverently, therefore, did Solomon pray concerning it, as he besought the living God to consecrate the temple by his presence. It is the Lord and the Covenant, or rather say, the Covenant Jehovah, whose presence we desire in our assemblies, and this presence is the strength of his people. O oh, that the Lord would indeed abide in all the churches, and cause his power to be revealed in Zion. 9. Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness. No garment is so resplendent as that of a holy character. In this glorious robe, our great high priest is evermore arrayed, and he would have all his people adorned in the same manner. Then only are priests fit to appear before the Lord and to minister for the profit of the people when their lives are dignified with goodness. They must ever remember that they are God's priests and should therefore wear the livery of their Lord, which is holiness. They are not only to have righteousness, but to be clothed with it so that upon every part of them righteousness shall be conspicuous. Whoever looks upon God's servants should see holiness if they see nothing else. Now, this righteousness of the ministers of the temple is prayed for in connection with the presence of the Lord, and this instructs us that holiness is only to be found among those who commune with God, and only comes to them through his visitation of their spirits. God will dwell among a holy people, and on the other hand, where God is, the people become holy. And let thy saints shout for joy. Holiness and happiness go together. Where the one is found, the other ought never to be far away. Holy persons have a right to great and demonstrative joy. They may shout because of it. Since they are saints, and thy saints, and thou hast come to dwell with them, O Lord, Thou hast made it their duty to rejoice, and to let others know of their joy. The sentence, while it may read as a permit, is also a precept. Saints are commanded to rejoice in the Lord. Happy religion which makes it a duty to be glad. Where righteousness is the clothing, joy may well be the occupation. 10. For thy servant David's sake, turn not away the face of thine anointed. King Solomon was praying, and here the people pray for him that his face may not be turned away, or that he may not be refused an audience. 
it is a dreadful thing to have our face turned away from God, or to have his face turned away from us. If we are anointed of the Spirit, the Lord will look upon us with favour. Especially is this true of him who represents us and is on our behalf the Christ, the truly anointed of the Lord. Jesus is both our David and God's anointed. In him is found in fullness that which David received in measure. For his sake, all those who are anointed in him are accepted. God blessed Solomon and succeeding kings for David's sake, and he will bless us for Jesus' sake. How condescending was the Son of the Highest to take upon himself the form of a servant, to be anointed for us, and to go in before the mercy seat to plead on our behalf. The psalm sings of the ark, and it may well remind us of the going in of the anointed priest within the veil. All depended upon his acceptance, and therefore well do the people pray, Turn not away the face of thine anointed. Thus, in these three verses, we have a prayer for the temple, the ark, the priests, the Levites, the people, and the king. In each petition, there is a fullness of meaning, well worthy of careful thought. We cannot plead too much in detail. The fault of most prayers is their indefiniteness. In God's house and worship, everything needs a blessing, and every person connected therewith needs it continually. As David vowed and prayed when he was minded to house the ark, so now the prayer is continued when the temple is consecrated and the Lord deigns to fill it with his glory. We shall never have done praying till we have done needing. Verses 11 to 18 The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon thy throne for evermore. For the Lord hath chosen Zion, he hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest for ever, here will I dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision, I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priests with salvation and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There will I make the horn of David to bud. I have ordained a lamp for mine anointed. His enemies will I clothe with shame, but upon himself shall his crown flourish. 11. Here we come to a grand covenant pleading of the kind which is always prevalent with the Lord. The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David. We cannot urge anything with God which is equal to his own word and oath. Jehovah swears that our faith may have strong confidence in it. He cannot forswear himself. He swears in truth, for he means every word that he utters. Men may be perjured, but none will be so profane as to imagine this of the God of truth. By Nathan this covenant of Jehovah was conveyed to David, and there was no delusion in it. He will not turn from it. Jehovah is not a changeable being. He never turns from his purpose, much less from his promise solemnly ratified by oath. He turneth never. He is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. What a rock they stand upon who have an immutable oath of God for their foundation. We know that this covenant was really made with Christ, the spiritual seed of David. For Peter quotes it at Pentecost, saying, quote, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. End quote. Christ therefore sits on a sure throne for ever and ever, seeing that he has kept the covenant, and through him the blessing comes upon Zion, whose poor are blessed in him. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. Jesus sprang from the race of David, as the evangelists are careful to record. 
he was, quote, of the house and lineage of David, end quote. At this day he is the king of the Jews, and the Lord has also given him the heathen for his inheritance. He must reign, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. God himself has set him on the throne, and no rebellion of men or devils can shake his dominion. The honour of Jehovah is concerned in his reign, and therefore it is never in danger, for the Lord will not suffer his oath to be dishonoured. 12. If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I shall teach them. There is a condition to the covenant, so far as it concerned kings of David's line, before the coming of the true seed. But he has fulfilled that condition, and made the covenant indefeasible henceforth and for ever, as to himself and the spiritual seed in him. Considered as it related to temporal things, it was no small blessing for David's dynasty to be secured the throne upon good behaviour. These monarchs held their crowns from God upon the terms of loyalty to their superior sovereign, the Lord who had elevated them to their high position. They were to be faithful to the covenant by obedience to the divine law and by belief of divine truth. They were to accept Jehovah as their Lord and their teacher, regarding him in both relations as in covenant with them. What a condescension on God's part to be their teacher! How gladly ought they to render intelligent obedience! What a proper, righteous, and needful stipulation for God to make that they should be true to him when the reward was the promise, their children shall also sit upon thy throne for evermore. If they will sit at his feet, God will make them sit on a throne. If they will keep the covenant, they shall keep the crown from generation to generation. The kingdom of Judah might have stood to this day had its kings been faithful to the Lord. No internal revolt or external attack could have overthrown the royal house of David. It fell by its own sin and by nothing else. The Lord was continually provoked, but he was amazingly long-suffering. For long after seceding Israel had gone into captivity, Judah still remained. Miracles of mercy were shown to her. Divine patience exceeded all limits, for the Lord's regard for David was exceeding great. The princes of David's house seemed set on ruining themselves, and nothing could save them. Justice waited long, but it was bound at last to unsheathe the sword and strike. Still, if in the letter man's breach of promise caused the covenant to fail, yet in spirit and essence the Lord has been true to it, for Jesus reigns and holds the throne forever. David's seed is still royal, for he was the progenitor according to the flesh of him who is King of kings and Lord of lords. This verse shows us the need of family piety. Parents must see to it that their children know the fear of the Lord, and they must beg the Lord himself to teach them his truth. We have no hereditary right to the divine favour. The Lord keeps up his friendship to families from generation to generation, for he is loath to leave the descendants of his servants, and never does so except under grievous and long-continued provocation. As believers, we are all in a measure under some such covenant as that of David. Certain of us can look backward for four generations of saintly ancestors, and we are now glad to look forward and to see our children and our children's children walking in the truth. Yet we know that grace does not run in the blood, and we are filled with holy fear, lest in any of our seed there should be an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. 13. For the Lord hath chosen Zion. It was no more than any other Canaanite town till God chose it, David captured it, Solomon built it, and the Lord dwelt in it. So was the church a mere Jebusite stronghold till grace chose it, conquered it, rebuilt it, and dwelt in it. Jehovah has chosen his people, and hence they are his people. He has chosen the church, and hence it is what it is. Thus, in the covenant, David and Zion, Christ and his people, go together. David is for Zion, and Zion for David. 
the interests of Christ and his people are mutual. He hath desired it for his habitation. David's question is answered. The Lord has spoken. The site of the temple is fixed. The place of the divine manifestation is determined. Indwelling follows upon election and arises out of it. Zion is chosen, chosen for a habitation of God. The desire of God to dwell among the people whom he has chosen for himself is very gracious and yet very natural. His love will not rest apart from those upon whom he has placed it. God desires to abide with those whom he has loved with an everlasting love. And we do not wonder that it should be so, for we also desire the company of our beloved ones. It is a double marvel that the Lord should choose and desire such poor creatures as we are. The indwelling of the Holy Ghost in believers is a wonder of grace, parallel to the incarnation of the Son of God. God in the church is the wonder of heaven, the miracle of eternity, the glory of infinite love. 14. This is my rest for ever. O oh, glorious words! It is God himself who here speaks. Think of rest for God, a Sabbath for the eternal, and a place of abiding for the infinite. He calls Zion my rest. Here his love remains and displays itself with delight. He shall rest in his love, and this for ever. He will not seek another place of repose, nor grow weary of his saints. In Christ the heart of deity is filled with content, and for his sake he is satisfied with his people, and will be so world without end. These august words declare a distinctive choice, this and no other. A certain choice, this which is well known to me. A present choice, this which is here at this moment. God has made his election of old, he has not changed it, and he never will repent of it. His church was his rest, and is his rest still. As he will not turn from his oath, so he will never turn from his choice. O oh, that we may enter into his rest, may be part and parcel of his church, and yield by our loving faith a delight to the mind of him who taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in them that hope in his mercy. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. Again are we filled with wonder that he who fills all things should dwell in Zion, should dwell in his church. God does not unwillingly visit his chosen. He desires to dwell with them. He desires them. He is already in Zion, for he says, here, as one upon the spot. Not only will he occasionally come to his church, but he will dwell in it as his fixed abode. He cared not for the magnificence of Solomon's temple, but he determined that at the mercy seat he would be found by suppliants, and that thence he would shine forth in brightness of grace among the favoured nation. All this, however, was but a type of the spiritual house of which Jesus is foundation and cornerstone, upon which all the living stones are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Oh, the sweetness of the thought that God desires to dwell in his people and rest among them. Surely, if it be his desire, he will cause it to be so. If the desire of the righteous shall be granted, much more shall the desire of the righteous God be accomplished. This is the joy of our souls, for surely we shall rest in God, and certainly our desire is to dwell in him. This also is the end of her fears for the church of God, for if the Lord dwell in her, she shall not be moved. If the Lord desire her, the devil cannot destroy her. 15. I will abundantly bless her provision. It must be so. How can we be without a blessing when the Lord is among us? We live upon his word. We are clothed by his charity. We are armed by his power. All sorts of provision are in him, and how can they be otherwise than blessed? The provision is to be abundantly blessed. Then it will be abundant and blessed. Daily provision, royal provision, satisfying provision, 
overflowingly joyful provision the church shall receive, and the divine benediction shall cause us to receive it with faith, to feed upon it by experience, to grow upon it by sanctification, to be strengthened by it to labour, cheered by it to patience, and built up by it to perfection. I will satisfy her poor with bread. The citizens of Zion are poor in themselves, poor in spirit, and often poor in pocket, but their hearts and souls shall dwell in such abundance that they shall neither need more nor desire more. Satisfaction is the crown of experience. Where God rests, his people shall be satisfied. They are to be satisfied with what the Lord himself calls bread, and we may be sure that he knows what is really bread for souls. He will not give us a stone. The Lord's poor shall have food convenient for them, that which will suit their palate, remove their hunger, fill their desire, build up their frame, and perfect their growth. The breadth of earth is the bread that perisheth, but the bread of heaven endureth to life eternal. In the church where God rests, his people shall not starve. The Lord would never rest if they did. He did not take rest for six days till he had prepared the world for the first man to live in. He would not stay his hand till all things were ready. Therefore we may be sure, if the Lord rests, it is because it is finished. And the Lord hath prepared of his goodness for the poor. Where God finds his desire, his people shall find theirs. If he is satisfied, they shall be. Taking the two clauses together, we see that nothing but an abundant blessing in the church will satisfy the Lord's poor people. They are naked and miserable till that comes. All the provision that Solomon himself could make would not have satisfied the saints of his day. They looked higher and longed for the Lord's own boundless blessing and hungered for the bread which came down from heaven. Blessed be the Lord, they had in this verse two of the I wills of God to rest upon, and nothing could be a better support to their faith. 16. More is promised than was prayed for. See how the ninth verse asks for the priests to be clad in righteousness, and the answer is, I will also clothe her priests with salvation. God is wont to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or even think. Righteousness is but one feature of blessing. Salvation is the whole of it. What cloth of gold is this? What more than regal array? Garments of salvation. We know who has woven them, who has dyed them, and who has given them to his people. These are the best robes for priests and preachers, for princes and people. There is none like them. Give them me. Not every priest shall be thus clothed, but only her priests, those who truly belong to Zion, by faith which is in Christ Jesus, who hath made them priests unto God. These are clothed by the Lord himself, and none can clothe as he does. If even the grass of the field is so clothed by the Creator as to outvie Solomon in all his glory, how must his own children be clad? Truly he shall be admired in his saints. The liveries of his servants shall be the wonder of heaven. And her saints shall shout aloud for joy. Again we have a golden answer to a silver prayer. The psalmist would have the saints shout for joy. That they shall do, saith the Lord, and aloud too. They shall be exceedingly full of delight. Their songs and shouts shall be so hearty that they shall sound as the noise of many waters and as great thunders. These joyful ones are not, however, the mimic saints of superstition, but her saints, saints of the Most High, sanctified in Christ Jesus. These shall be so abundantly blessed and so satisfied and so apparelled that they can do no otherwise than shout to show their astonishment, their triumph, their gratitude, their exultation, their enthusiasm their joy in the Lord. Zion has no dumb saints. The sight of God at rest among his chosen is enough to make the most silent shout. If the morning stars sang together when the earth and heaven were made, 
much more will all the sons of God shout for joy when the new heavens and the new earth are finished, and the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride for her husband. Meanwhile, even now, the dwelling of the Lord among us is a perennial fountain of sparkling delight to all holy minds. This shouting for joy is guaranteed to Zion's holy ones. God says, They shall shout aloud, and depend upon it, they will. Who shall stop them of this glorying? The Lord hath said by his Spirit, Let them shout. And then he has promised that they shall shout aloud. Who is he that shall make them hold their peace? The bridegroom is with them. And shall the children of the bride chamber fast? Nay, verily, we rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. 17. There will I make the horn of David to bud. In Zion, David's dynasty shall develop power and glory. In our notes from other authors, we have included a description of the growth of the horns of stags, which is the natural fact from which we conceive the expression in the text to be borrowed. As the stag is made noble and strong by the development of his horns, so the house of David shall advance from strength to strength. This was to be by the work of the Lord. There will I make. And therefore it would be sure and solid growth. When God makes us to bud, none can cause us to fade. When David's descendants left the Lord and the worship of his house, they declined in all respects, for it was only through the Lord and in connection with his worship that their horn would bud. I have ordained a lamp for mine anointed. David's name was to be illustrious and brilliant as a lamp. It was to continue shining like a lamp in the sanctuary. It was thus to be a comfort to the people and an enlightenment to the nations. God would not suffer the light of David to go out by the extinction of his race. His holy ordinances had decreed that the house of his servant should remain in the midst of Israel. What a lamp is our Lord Jesus, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of his people Israel. As the anointed, the true Christ, he shall be the light of heaven itself. O oh, for grace to receive our illumination and our consolation from Jesus Christ alone. 18. His enemies will I clothe with shame. They shall be utterly defeated. They shall loathe their evil design. They shall be despised for having hated the ever-blessed one. Their shame they will be unable to hide. It shall cover them. God will array them in it forever and it shall be their convict dress to all eternity. But upon himself shall his crown flourish. Green shall be his laurels of victory. He shall win and wear the crown of honour, and his inherited diadem shall increase in splendour. Is it not so to this hour with Jesus? His kingdom cannot fail. His imperial glories cannot fade. It is himself that we delight to honour. It is to himself that the honour comes, and upon himself that it flourishes. If others snatch at his crown, their traitorous aims are defeated. But he, in his own person, reigns with ever-growing splendour. Crown him, crown him, crowns become the victor's brow. End of Psalm 132, Part 2《Psalm 133 of the Treasury of David, Volume 7, by C. H. Spurgeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. — Psalm 133. Title. A Song of Degrees of David. We see no reason for depriving David of the authorship of this sparkling sonnet. He knew by experience the bitterness occasioned by divisions in families and was well prepared to celebrate in choicest psalmody the blessing of unity for which he sighed. Among the songs of degrees, this hymn has certainly attained unto a good degree, and even in common literature it is frequently quoted for its perfume and dew. In this psalm there is no wry word, all is sweetness and light. A notable ascent from Psalm 120 
with which the pilgrims set out. That is full of war and lamentation, but this sings of peace and pleasantness. The visitors to Zion were about to return, and this may have been their hymn of joy because they had seen such union among the tribes who had gathered at the common altar. The previous psalm, which sings of the covenant, had also revealed the centre of Israel's unity in the Lord's anointed and the promises made to him. No wonder that brethren dwell in unity when God dwells among them and finds his rest in them. Our translators have given to this psalm an admirable explanatory heading, The Benefit of the Communion of Saints. These good men often hit off the meaning of a passage in a few words. Exposition Verses 1 to 3 Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. As the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life for evermore. 1. Behold. It is a wonder seldom seen, therefore behold it. It may be seen, for it is the characteristic of real saints, therefore fail not to inspect it. It is well worthy of admiration. Pause and gaze upon it. It will charm you into imitation, therefore note it well. God looks on with approval, therefore consider it with attention. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. No one can tell the exceeding excellence of such a condition, and so the psalmist uses the word how twice. Behold how good and how pleasant. He does not attempt to measure either the good or the pleasure, but invites us to behold for ourselves. The combination of the two adjectives good and pleasant is more remarkable than the conjunction of two stars of the first magnitude. For a thing to be good is good, but for it also to be pleasant is better. All men love pleasant things, and yet it frequently happens that the pleasure is evil. But here the condition is as good as it is pleasant, as pleasant as it is good, for the same how is set before each qualifying word. For brethren, according to the flesh, to dwell together is not always wise, for experience teaches that they are better a little apart and it is shameful for them to dwell together in disunion. They had much better part in peace, like Abraham and Lot, than dwell together in envy, like Joseph's brothers. When brethren can and do dwell together in unity, then is their communion worthy to be gazed upon and sung of in holy psalmody. Such sights ought often to be seen among those who are near of kin, for they are brethren, and therefore should be united in heart and aim. They dwell together, and it is for their mutual comfort that there should be no strife. And yet how many families are rent by fierce feuds and exhibit a spectacle which is neither good nor pleasant. As to brethren in spirit, they ought to dwell together in church fellowship, and in that fellowship one essential matter is unity. We can dispense with uniformity if we possess unity. Oneness of life, truth and way. Oneness in Christ Jesus. Oneness of object and spirit. These we must have, or our assemblies will be synagogues of contention rather than churches of Christ. The closer the unity, the better, for the more of the good and the pleasant there will be. Since we are imperfect beings, somewhat of the evil and the unpleasant is sure to intrude, but this will readily be neutralised and easily ejected by the true love of the saints, if it really exists. Christian unity is good in itself, good for ourselves, good for the brethren, good for our converts, good for the outside world, and for certain it is pleasant. For a loving heart must have pleasure and give pleasure in associating with others of like nature. 
a church united for years in earnest service of the Lord, is a well of goodness and joy to all those who dwell round about it. 2. It is like the precious ointment upon the head. In order that we may the better behold brotherly unity, David gives us a resemblance, so that, as in a glass, we may perceive its blessedness. It has a sweet perfume about it, comparable to that precious ointment with which the first high priest was anointed at his ordination. It is a holy thing, and so again is like the oil of consecration, which was to be used only in the Lord's service. What a sacred thing must brotherly love be, when it can be likened to an oil which must never be poured on any man but on the Lord's high priest alone. It is a diffusive thing. Being poured on his head, the fragrant oil flowed down upon Aaron's head, and then dropped upon his garments, till the utmost hem was anointed therewith. And even so doth brotherly love extend its benign power and bless all who are beneath its influence. Hearty concord brings a benediction upon all concerned. Its goodness and pleasure are shared in by the lowliest members of the household. Even the servants are the better and the happier because of the lovely unity among the members of the family. It has a special use about it. For as by the anointing oil Aaron was set apart for the special service of Jehovah, even so those who dwell in love are the better fitted to glorify God in his church. The Lord is not likely to use for his glory those who are devoid of love. They lack the anointing needful to make them priests unto the Lord. That ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard. This is a chief point of comparison, that as the oil did not remain confined to the place where it first fell, but flowed adown the high priest's hair and bedewed his beard, even so brotherly love descending from the head distills and descends, anointing as it runs, and perfuming all it lights upon, that went down to the skirts of his garments. Once set in motion, it would not cease from flowing. It might seem as if it were better not to smear his garments with oil, but the sacred unguent could not be restrained. It flowed over his holy robes. Even thus does brotherly love not only flow over the hearts upon which it was first poured out and descend to those who are an inferior part of the mystical body of Christ, but it runs where it is not sought for asking neither leave nor license to make its way. Christian affection knows no limits of parish, nation, sect or age. Is the man a believer in Christ? Then he is in the one body, and I must yield him an abiding love. Is he one of the poorest, one of the least spiritual, one of the least lovable? Then he is as the skirts of the garment and my heart's love must fall even upon him. Brotherly love comes from the head, but falls to the feet. Its way is downward. It ran down, and it went down. Love for the brethren condescends to men of low estate. It is not puffed up, but is lowly and meek. There is no small part of its excellence. Oil would not anoint if it did not flow down. Neither would brotherly love diffuse its blessing if it did not descend. 3. As the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. From the loftier mountains, the moisture appears to be wafted to the lesser hills. The dews of Hermon fall on Zion. The alpine Lebanon ministers to the minor elevation of the city of David and so does brotherly love descend from the higher to the lower, refreshing and enlivening in its course. Holy concord is as dew, mysteriously blessed, full of life and growth for all plants of grace. It brings with it so much benediction that it is as no common dew, but as that of Hermon, 
which is specially copious and far-reaching. The proper rendering is, as the dew of Hermon that descended upon the mountains of Zion. And this tallies with the figure which has been already used, and sets forth by a second simile the sweet descending diffusiveness of brotherly unity. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life for evermore. That is, in Zion, or better still, in the place where brotherly love abounds. Where love reigns, God reigns. Where love wishes blessing, there God commands the blessing. God has but to command, and it is done. He is so pleased to see his dear children happy in one another, that he fails not to make them happy in himself. He gives especially his best blessing of eternal life, for love is life. Dwelling together in love, we have begun the enjoyments of eternity, and these shall not be taken from us. Let us love for evermore, and we shall live for evermore. This makes Christian brotherhood so good and pleasant. It has Jehovah's blessing resting upon it, and it cannot be otherwise than sacred, like the precious ointment, and heavenly, like the dew of Hermon. Oh, for more of this rare virtue, not the love which comes and goes, but that which dwells, not that spirit which separates and secludes, but that which dwells together, not that mind which is all for debate and difference, but that which dwells together in unity. Never shall we know the full power of the anointing till we are of one heart and of one spirit. Never will the sacred dew of the Spirit descend in all its fullness till we are perfectly joined together in the same mind. Never will the covenanted and commanded blessing come forth from the Lord our God till once again we shall have one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Lord, lead us into this most precious spiritual unity for thy Son's sake. Amen. End of Psalm 133《三》》《三》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《
and the other with his love. Let them see to it that their hallelujahs never come to an end. Their departing brethren arouse them with the shrill cry of, Behold! Behold! See! Take care! Be on the watch! Diligently mind your work! And incessantly adore and bless Jehovah's name! Bless ye the Lord! Think well of Jehovah, and speak well of him. Adore him with reverence. Draw near to him with love. Delight in him with exultation. Be not content with praise, such as all his works render to him. But, as his saints, see that ye bless him. He blesses you. Therefore, be zealous to bless him. The word bless is the characteristic word of the psalm. The first two verses stir us up to bless Jehovah. And in the last verse, Jehovah's blessing is invoked upon the people. O oh, to abound in blessing! May blessed and blessing be the two words which describe our lives. Let others flatter their fellows, or bless their stars, or praise themselves. As for us, we will bless Jehovah, from whom all blessings flow. All ye servants of the Lord, it is your office to bless him. Take care that you lead the way therein. Servants should speak well of their masters. Not one of you should serve him as of compulsion, but all should bless him while you serve him. Yea, bless him for permitting you to serve him, fitting you to serve him, and accepting your service. To be a servant of Jehovah is an incalculable honour, a blessing beyond all estimate. To be a servant in his temple a domestic in his house, is even more a delight and a glory. If those who are ever with the Lord and dwell in his own temple do not bless the Lord, who will? Which by night stand in the house of the Lord. We can well understand how the holy pilgrims half envied those consecrated ones who guarded the temple and attended to the necessary offices thereof through the hours of night. To the silence and solemnity of night there was added the awful glory of the place where Jehovah had ordained that his worship should be celebrated. Blessed were the priests and Levites who were ordained to a service so sublime. That those should bless the Lord throughout their nightly vigils was most fitting. The people would have them mark this and never fail in the duty. They were not to move about like so many machines, but to put their hearts into all their duties and worship spiritually in the whole course of their duty. It would be well to watch, but better still to be watching unto prayer and praise. When night settles down on a church, the Lord has his watchers and holy ones still guarding his truth, and these must not be discouraged, but must bless the Lord even when the darkest hours draw on. Be it hours to cheer them and lay upon them this charge to bless the Lord at all times and let his praise be continually in their mouths. 2. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary. In the holy place they must be busy, full of strength, wide awake, energetic and moved with holy ardour. Hands, heart, and every other part of their manhood must be upraised, elevated, and consecrated to the adoring service of the Lord. As the angels praise God day without night, so must the angels of the churches be instant, in season, and out of season. And bless the Lord. This is their main business. They are to bless men by their teaching but they must yet more bless Jehovah with their worship. Too often men look at public worship only from the side of its usefulness to the people. But the other matter is of even higher importance. We must see to it that the Lord God is adored, extolled, and had in reverence. For a second time the word bless is used and applied to Jehovah. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and let every other soul bless him. There will be no drowsiness about even midnight devotion if the heart is set upon blessing God in Christ Jesus 
which is the gospel translation of God in the sanctuary. 3. This last verse is the answer from the temple to the pilgrims, preparing to depart as the day breaks. It is the ancient blessing of the high priest condensed and poured forth upon each individual pilgrim. The Lord that made heaven and earth bless thee out of Zion. Ye are scattering and going to your homes one by one. May the benediction come upon you one by one. You have been up to Jehovah's city and temple at his bidding. Return each one with such a benediction as only he can give. Divine, infinite, effectual, eternal. You are not going away from Jehovah's works or glories, for he made the heaven above you and the earth on which you dwell. He is your creator, and he can bless you with untold mercies. He can create joy and peace in your hearts and make for you a new heaven and a new earth. May the maker of all things make you to abound in blessings. The benediction comes from the city of the great king, from his appointed ministers, by virtue of his covenant, and so it is said to be out of Zion. To this day the Lord blesses each one of his people through his church, his gospel, and the ordinances of his house. It is in communion with the saints that we receive untold benisons. May each one of us obtain yet more of the blessing which cometh from the Lord alone. Zion cannot bless us. The holiest ministers can only wish us a blessing. But Jehovah can and will bless each one of his waiting people. So may it be at this good hour. Do we desire it? Let us then bless the Lord ourselves. Let us do it a second time. Then we may confidently hope that the third time we think of blessing, we shall find ourselves conscious receivers of it from the ever-blessed one. Amen. End of Psalm 134「Psalm 135, Part 1 of the Treasury of David, Volume 7, by C. H. Spurgeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Psalm 135. General Remarks. This psalm has no title. It is mainly made up of selections from other scriptures. It has been called a mosaic and compared to a tessellated pavement. At the outset, its first two verses are taken from Psalm 134, while the latter part of verse 2 and the commencement of verse 3 put us in mind of Psalm 116, verse 19, and verse 4 suggests Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. Does not verse 5 remind us of Psalm 95, verse 3? As for verse 7, it is almost identical with Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 13 which may have been taken from chapter 2. The passage contained in verse 13 is to be found in Exodus chapter 3 verse 15 and verse 14 in Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 36. The closing verses, 8 to 12, are in Psalm 136. From verse 15 to the end, the strain is a repetition of Psalm 115. This process of tracing the expressions to other sources might be pushed further without straining the quotations. The whole psalm is a compound of many choice extracts, and yet it has all the continuity and freshness of an original poem. The Holy Spirit occasionally repeats himself, not because he has any lack of thoughts or words, but because it is expedient for us that we hear the same things in the same form. Yet when our great teacher uses repetition, it is usually with instructive variations, which deserve our careful attention. Division The first 14 verses contain an exhortation to praise Jehovah for his goodness, verse 3, for his electing love, verse 4, his greatness, verses 5 to 7, his judgments, verses 8 to 12, his unchanging character, verse 13, and his love towards his people. This is followed by a denunciation of idols, verses 15 to 18, 
and a further exhortation to bless the name of the Lord. It is a song full of life, vigour, variety, and devotion. Exposition Verses 1-14 to 14. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the name of the Lord. Praise him, O ye servants of the Lord. Ye that stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises unto his name, for it is pleasant. For the Lord hath chosen Jacob unto himself, and Israel for his peculiar treasure. For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he in heaven and in earth, in the seas and all deep places. He causeth the vapours to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings for the rain. He bringeth the wind out of his treasuries. Who smote the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast. Who sent tokens of wonder into the midst of thee, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh and upon all his servants. Who smote great nations and slew mighty kings. Sion, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan and all the kingdoms of Canaan, and gave their lands for an heritage, an heritage unto Israel his people. Thy name, O Lord, endureth for ever, and thy memorial, O Lord, throughout all generations. For the Lord will judge his people, and he will repent himself concerning his servants. 1. Praise ye the Lord, or Hallelujah. Let those who are themselves full of holy praise labour to excite the like spirit in others. It is not enough for us to praise God ourselves. We are quite unequal to such a work. Let us call in all our friends and neighbours, and if they have been slack in such service, let us stir them up to it with loving exhortations. Praise ye the name of the Lord. Let his character be extolled by you, and let all that he has revealed concerning himself be the subject of your song. For this is truly his name. Specially let his holy and incommunicable name of Jehovah be the object of your adoration. By that name he sets forth his self-existence and his immutability. Let these arouse your praises of his Godhead. Think of him with love, admire him with heartiness, and then extol him with ardour. Do not only magnify the Lord because he is God, but study his character and his doings, and thus render intelligent, appreciative praise. Praise him, O ye servants of the Lord. If others are silent, you must not be. You must be the first to celebrate his praises. You are servants, and this is part of your service. His name is named upon you, therefore celebrate his name with praises. You know what a blessed master he is, therefore speak well of him. Those who shun his service are sure to neglect his praise. But as grace has made you his own personal servants, let your hearts make you his court musicians. Here we see the servant of the Lord arousing his fellow servants by three times calling upon them to praise. Are we then so slow in such a sweet employ? Or is it that when we do our utmost, it is all too little for such a Lord? Both are true. We do not praise enough. We cannot praise too much. We ought to be always at it, answering to the command here given, Praise, praise, praise. Let the three in one have the praises of our spirit, soul and body. For the past, the present and the future, let us render threefold hallelujahs. 2. Ye that stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. You are highly favoured. You are the domestics of the palace, nearest to the father of the heavenly family, privileged to find your home in his house. Therefore you must, beyond all others, abound in thanksgiving. You stand or abide in the temple. You are constant occupants of its various courts, and therefore from you we expect unceasing praise. Should not ministers be celebrated for celebrating the praises of Jehovah? Should not church officers and church members excel all others in the excellent duty of adoration? Should not all of every degree who wait even in his outer courts unite in his worship? 
ought not the least and feeblest of his people to proclaim his praises in company with those who live nearest to him? Is it not a proper thing to remind them of their obligations? Is not the psalmist wise when he does so in this case and in many others? Those who can call Jehovah our God are highly blessed and therefore should abound in the work of blessing him. Perhaps this is the sweetest word in these two verses. This God is our God for ever and ever. Our God signifies possession, communion in possession, assurance of possession, delight in possession. Oh, the unutterable joy of calling God our own. 3. Praise the Lord. Do it again. Continue to do it. Do it better and more heartily. Do it in growing numbers. Do it at once. There are good reasons for praising the Lord, and among the first is this. For the Lord is good. He is so good that there is none good in the same sense or degree. He is so good that all good is found in him, flows from him, and is rewarded by him. The word God is brief for good and truly God is the essence of goodness. Should not his goodness be well spoken of? Yea, with our best thoughts and words and hymns, let us glorify his name. Sing praises unto his name, for it is pleasant. The adjective may apply to the singing and to the name. They are both pleasant. The vocal expression of praise by sacred song is one of our greatest delights. We were created for this purpose, and hence it is a joy to us. It is a charming duty to praise the lovely name of our God. All pleasure is to be found in the joyful worship of Jehovah. All joys are in his sacred name, as perfumes lie slumbering in a garden of flowers. The mind expands, the soul is lifted up, the heart warms, the whole being is filled with delight when we are engaged in singing the high praises of our Father, Redeemer, Comforter. When in any occupation goodness and pleasure unite, we do well to follow it up without stint. Yet it is to be feared that few of us sing to the Lord at all in proportion as we talk to men. 4. For the Lord hath chosen Jacob unto himself. Jehovah hath chosen Jacob. Should not the sons of Jacob praise him who has so singularly favoured them? Election is one of the most forcible arguments for adoring love. Chosen. Chosen unto himself. Who can be grateful enough for being concerned in this privilege? Jacob have I loved, said Jehovah, and he gave no reason for his love, except that he chose to love. Jacob had then done neither good nor evil, Yet thus the Lord determined, and thus he spake. If it be said that the choice was made upon foresight of Jacob's character, it is perhaps even more remarkable, for there was little enough about Jacob that could deserve special choice. By nature Jacob was by no means the most lovable of men. No, it was sovereign grace which dictated the choice. But mark, it was not a choice whose main result was the personal welfare of Jacob's seed. The nation was chosen by God unto himself to answer the divine ends and purposes in blessing all mankind. Jacob's race was chosen to be the Lord's own, to be the trustees of his truth, the maintainers of his worship, the mirrors of his mercy. Chosen they were, but mainly for this end, that they might be a peculiar people set apart unto the service of the true God and Israel for his peculiar treasure. God's choice exalts, for here the name is changed from Jacob, the supplanter, to Israel, the prince. The love of God gives a new name and imparts a new value, for the comparison to a royal treasure is a most honourable one. As kings have a special regalia and a selection of the rarest jewels, so the Lord deigns to reckon his chosen nation as his wealth his delight, his glory. What an honour to the spiritual Israel that they are all this to the Lord their God. We are a people near and dear unto him, precious and honourable in his sight. 
how can we refuse our loudest, heartiest, sweetest music? If we did not extol him, the stones in the street would cry out against us. 5. For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. The greatness of God is as much a reason for adoration as his goodness, when we are once reconciled to him. God is great positively, great comparatively, and great superlatively, above all gods. Of this, the psalmist had an assured personal persuasion. He says positively, I know. It is knowledge worth possessing. He knew by observation, inspiration, and realization. He was no agnostic. He was certain and clear upon the matter. He not only knows the greatness of Jehovah, but that, as the Adonai, or ruler, our Lord is infinitely superior to all the imaginary deities of the heathen, and to all great ones besides. Let princes hear, let angels know, how mean their natures seem, those gods on high and gods below, when once compared with him. Many have thought to worship Jehovah and other gods with him, but this holy man tolerated no such notion. Others have thought to combine their religion with obedience to the unrighteous laws of tyrannical princes. This also the sweet singer of Israel denounced, for he regarded the living God as altogether above all men who, as magistrates and princes, have been called gods. Observe here the fourth of the five fours. Verses 3, 4, 5 and 14 contain reasons for praise, each set forth with for. A fruitful meditation might be suggested by this. 6. Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he, in heaven and in earth, in the seas and all deep places. His will is carried out throughout all space. The king's warrant runs in every portion of the universe. The heathen divided the great domain, but Jupiter does not rule in heaven, nor Neptune on the sea, nor Pluto in the lower regions. Jehovah rules over all. His decree is not defeated. His purpose is not frustrated. In no one point is his good pleasure set aside. The word whatsoever is of the widest range and includes all things, and the four words of place which are mentioned comprehend all space. Therefore, the declaration of the text knows neither limit nor exception. Jehovah works his will. He pleases to do, and he performs the deed. None can stay his hand. How different this from the gods whom the heathen fabled to be subject to all the disappointments, failures, and passions of men. How contrary even to those so-called Christian conceptions of God, which subordinate him to the will of man, and make his eternal purposes the football of human caprice. Our theology teaches us no such degrading notions of the eternal as that he can be baffled by man. His purpose shall stand, and he will do all his pleasure. No region is too high, no abyss too deep, no land too distant, no sea too wide for his omnipotence. His divine pleasure travels post over all the realm of nature, and his behests are obeyed. 7. He causeth the vapours to ascend from the ends of the earth. Here we are taught the power of God in creation. The process of evaporation is passed by unnoticed by the many, because they see it going on all around them. The usual ceases to be wonderful to the thoughtless, but it remains a marvel to the instructed. When we consider upon what an immense scale evaporation is continually going on, and how needful it is for the existence of all life, we may well admire the wisdom and the power which are displayed therein. All around us, from every point of the horizon, the vapour rises, condenses into clouds, and ultimately descends as rain. Whence the vapours originally ascended, from which our showers are formed, it would be impossible to tell. Most probably the main part of them comes from the tropical regions and other remote places at the ends of the earth. It is the Lord who causes them to rise, 
and not a mere law. What is law without a force at the back of it? He maketh lightnings for the rain. This is an intimate connection between lightning and rain, and this would seem to be more apparent in Palestine than even with ourselves, for we constantly read of thunderstorms in that country as attending heavy downpours of rain. Lightning is not to be regarded as a lawless force, but as a part of that wonderful machinery by which the earth is kept in a fit condition, a force as much under control of God as any other, a force most essential to our existence. The ever-changing waters, rains, winds, and electric currents circulate as if they were the lifeblood and vital spirits of the universe. He bringeth the wind out of his treasuries. This great force, which seems left to its own wild will, is really under the supreme and careful government of the Lord. As a monarch is specially master of the contents of his own treasure, so is our God, the Lord of the tempest and hurricane. And as princes do not spend their treasure without taking note and count of it, so the Lord does not permit the wind to be wasted or squandered without purpose. Everything in the material world is under the immediate direction and control of the Lord of all. Observe how the psalmist brings before us the personal action of Jehovah. He causeth, he maketh, he bringeth. Everywhere the Lord worketh all things and there is no power which escapes his supremacy. It is well for us that it is so. One bandit force wandering through the Lord's domains, defying his control, would cast fear and trembling over all the provinces of providence. Let us praise Jehovah for the power and wisdom with which he rules clouds and lightnings and winds and all other mighty and mysterious agencies. 8 who smote the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast. Herein the Lord is to be praised, for this deadly smiting was an act of justice against Egypt and of love to Israel. But what a blow it was, all the firstborn slain in a moment. How it must have horrified the nation and cowed the boldest enemies of Israel. Beasts, because of their relationship to man as domestic animals, are in many ways made to suffer with him. The firstborn of beasts must die, as well as the firstborn of their owners, for the blow was meant to astound and overwhelm, as it accomplished its purpose. The firstborn of God had been sorely smitten, and they were set free by the Lord's meeting out to their oppressors the like treatment. 9. Who sent tokens and wonders into the midst of thee, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his servants. The Lord is still seen by the psalmist as sending judgments upon rebellious men. He keeps before us the personal action of God, who sent tokens, and so on. The more distinctly God is seen, the better. Even in plagues, he is to be seen, as truly as in mercies. The plagues were not only terrible wonders which astounded men, but forcible tokens or signs, by which they were instructed. No doubt the plagues were aimed at the various deities of the Egyptians, and were a grand exposure of their impotence. Each one had its own special significance. The judgments of the Lord were no side blows. They struck the nation at the heart. He sent his bolts into the midst of thee, O Egypt. These marvels happened in the centre of the proud and exclusive nation of Egypt, which thought itself far superior to other lands and many of these plagues touched the nation in points upon which it prided itself. The psalmist addresses that haughty nation, saying, O Egypt, as though reminding it of the lessons which it had been taught by the Lord's right hand. Imperious Pharaoh had been the ringleader in defying Jehovah, and he was made personally to smart for it. Nor did his flattering courtiers escape. Upon each one of them the scourge fell heavily, God's servants are far better off than Pharaoh's servants. Those who stand in the courts of Jehovah are delivered, but the courtiers of Pharaoh are smitten, all of them, for they were all partakers in his evil deeds. The Lord is to be praised for thus rescuing his own people and causing their cruel adversaries to bite the dust.
Let no true Israelite forget the song of the Red Sea, but anew let us hear a voice summoning us to exulting praise. Sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. 10. Who smote great nations and slew mighty kings. The nations of Canaan joined in the desperate resistance offered by their monarchs, and so they were smitten, while their kings, the ringleaders of the fight, were slain. Those who resist the divine purpose will find it hard to kick against the pricks. The greatness of the nations and the might of the kings availed nothing against the Lord. He is prepared to mete out vengeance to those who oppose his designs. Those who dream of him as too tender to come to blows have mistaken the God of Israel. He intended to bless the world through his chosen people, and he would not be turned from his purpose. Cost what it might, he would preserve the candle of truth which he had lighted, even though the blood of nations should be spilt in its defence. The wars against the Canaanite races were a price paid for the setting up of a nation which was to preserve for the whole world the lively oracles of God. 11. Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan. These two kings were the first to oppose, and they were amongst the most notable of the adversaries. Their being smitten is therefore a special object of song for loyal Israelites. The enmity of these two kings was wanton and unprovoked, and hence their overthrow was the more welcome to Israel. Sihon had been victorious in his war with Moab, and thought to make short work with Israel, but he was speedily overthrown. Og was of the race of the giants, and by his huge size inspired the tribes with dread, but they were encouraged by the previous overthrow of Sihon, and soon the giant fell beneath their sword. And all the kingdoms of Canaan. Many were these petty principalities, and some of them were populous and valiant. But they all fell beneath the conquering hand of Joshua, for the Lord was with him. Even so shall all the foes of the Lord's believing people in these days be put to the rout. Satan and the world shall be overthrown, and all the hosts of sin shall be destroyed. For our greater Joshua leads forth our armies, conquering and to conquer. Note that in this verse we have the details of matters which were mentioned in the bulk of the previous stanza. It is well when we have sung of mercies in the gross to consider them one by one and give to each individual blessing a share in our song. It is well to preserve abundant memorials of the Lord's deliverance so that we not only sing of mighty kings as a class but also of Sion, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, as distinct persons. 12. And gave their land for an heritage, an heritage unto Israel his people. Jehovah is Lord paramount, and permits men to hold their lands upon lease, terminable at his pleasure. The nations of Canaan had become loathsome with abominable vices, and they were condemned by the great judge of all the earth, to be cut off from the face of the country which they defiled. The twelve tribes were charged to act as their executioners, and as their fee they were to receive Canaan as a possession. Of old the Lord had given this land to Abraham and his seed by a covenant of salt, but he allowed the Amorites and other tribes to sojourn in it till their iniquity was full, and then he bade his people come and take their own out of the holders' hands. Canaan was their heritage because they were the Lord's heritage, and he gave it to them actually because he had long before given it to them by promise. The Lord's chosen still have a heritage from which none can keep them back. Covenant blessings of inestimable value are secured to them, and as surely as God has a people, his people shall have a heritage. To them it comes by gift, though they have to fight for it. Often does it happen, when they slay a sin or conquer a difficulty, that they are enriched by the spoil. To them even evils work for good, and trials ensure triumphs. No enemy shall prevail so as to really injure them, for they shall find a heritage 
where once they were opposed by all the kingdoms of Canaan. 13. Thy name, O Lord, endureth forever. God's name is eternal and will never be changed. His character is immutable. His fame and honour also shall remain to all eternity. There shall always be life in the name of Jesus and sweetness and consolation. Those upon whom the Lord's name is named in verity and truth shall be preserved by it and kept from all evil, world without end. Jehovah is a name which shall outlive the ages and retain the fullness of its glory and might forever. And thy memorial, O Lord, throughout all generations. Never shall men forget thee, O Lord. The ordinances of thine house shall keep thee in men's memories, and thine everlasting gospel and the grace which goes therewith shall be abiding remembrances of thee. Grateful hearts will forever beat to thy praise, and enlightened minds shall continue to marvel at all thy wondrous works. Mem's memorials decay, but the memorial of the Lord abideth evermore. What a comfort to desponding minds, trembling for the ark of the Lord. No, precious name, thou shalt never perish. Fame of the eternal, thou shalt never grow dim. This verse must be construed in its connection, and it teaches us that the honour and glory gained by the Lord in the overthrow of the mighty kings would never die out. Israel for long ages reaped the benefit of the prestige which the divine victories had brought to the nation. Moreover, the Lord, in thus keeping his covenant, which he made with Abraham, when he promised to give the land to his seed, was making it clear that his memorial, contained in promises and covenant, would never be out of his sight. His name endures in all its truthfulness, for those who occupied Israel's land were driven out, that the true heirs might dwell therein in peace. 14. For the Lord will judge his people. He will exercise personal discipline over them, and not leave it to their foes to maltreat them at pleasure. When the correction is ended, he will arise and avenge them of their oppressors, who for a while were used by him as his rod. He may seem to forget his people, but it is not so. He will undertake their cause and deliver them. The judges of Israel were also her deliverers, and such is the Lord of hosts. In this sense, as ruling, preserving, and delivering his chosen, Jehovah will judge his people. And he will repent himself concerning his servants. When he has smitten them, and they lie low before him, he will pity them, as a father pitieth his children, for he doth not afflict willingly. The psalm speaks after the manner of men. The nearest description that words can give of the Lord's feeling towards his suffering servants is that he repents the evil which he inflicted upon them. He acts as if he had changed his mind and regretted smiting them. It goes to the heart of God to see his beloved ones oppressed by their enemies. Though they deserve all they suffer and more than all, yet the Lord cannot see them smart without a pang. It is remarkable that the nations by which God has afflicted Israel have all been destroyed, as if the tender father hated the instruments of his children's correction. The chosen nation is here called first his people, and then his servants. As his people he judges them, as his servants he finds comfort in them, for so the word may be read. He is most tender to them when he sees their service. Hence the scripture saith, I will spare them, as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Should not the servants of God praise him? He plagued Pharaoh's servants, but as for his own, he has mercy upon them, and returns to them in love, after he has, in the truest affection, smitten them for their iniquities. Praise him, O ye servants of the Lord. End of Psalm 135, Part 1「Psalm 135, Part 2 of the Treasury of David, Volume 7, by C. H. Spurgeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. 
Psalm 135, verses 15 to 21. Now we come to the psalmist's denunciation of idols, which follows most naturally upon his celebration of the one only living and true God. Verses 15 to 18. The idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. They that make them are like unto them. So is every one that trusteth in them. 15. The idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. Their essential material is dead metal. Their attributes are but the qualities of senseless substances. And what of form and fashion they exhibit, they derive from the skill and labour of those who worship them. It is the height of insanity to worship metallic manufactures. Though silver and gold are useful to us when we rightly employ them, there is nothing about them which can entitle them to reverence and worship. If we did not know the sorrowful fact to be indisputable, it would seem to be impossible that intelligent beings could bow down before substances which they must themselves refine from the ore and fashion into form. One would think it less absurd to worship one's own hands than to adore that which those hands have made. What great works can these mock deities perform for man when they are themselves the works of man? Idols are fitter to be played with, like dolls by babes, than to be adored by grown-up men. Hands are better used in breaking than in making objects which can be put to such an idiotic use. Yet the heathen love their abominable deities better than silver and gold. It were well if we could say that some professed believers in the Lord had as much love for him. 16. They have mouths, for their makers fashioned them like themselves. An opening is made where the mouth should be, and yet it is no mouth, for they eat not, they speak not. They cannot communicate with their worshippers, They are dumb as death. If they cannot even speak, they are not even so worthy of worship as our children at school. Jehovah speaks, and it is done. But these images utter never a word. Surely, if they could speak, they would rebuke their votaries. Is not their silence a still more powerful rebuke? When our philosophical teachers deny that God has made any verbal revelation of himself, they also confess that their God is dumb. Eyes have they, but they see not. Who would adore a blind man? How can the heathen be so mad as to bow themselves before a blind image? The eyes of idols have frequently been very costly. Diamonds have been used for that purpose. But of what avail is the expense, since they see nothing? If they cannot even see us, how can they know our wants, appreciate our sacrifices, or spy out for us the means of help. What a wretched thing that a man who can see should bow down before an image which is blind. The worshipper is certainly physically in advance of his God, and yet mentally he is on a level with it, for assuredly his foolish heart is darkened, or he would not so absurdly play the fool. 17. They have ears, and very large ones too, if we remember certain of the Hindu idols. But they hear not. Useless are their ears. In fact, they are mere counterfeits and deceits. Ears which men make are always deaf. The secret of hearing is wrapped up with the mystery of life, and both are in the unsearchable mind of the Lord. It seems that these heathen gods are dumb and blind and deaf, a pretty bundle of infirmities to be found in a deity. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. They are dead. No sign of life is perceptible. And breathing, which is of the essence of animal life, they never knew. Shall a man waste his breath in crying to an idol which has no breath? Shall life offer up petitions to death? Verily, this is a turning of things upside down. 18. They that make them are like unto them. They are as blockish, as senseless, as stupid, as the gods they have made. 
and like them they are the objects of divine abhorrence, and shall be broken in pieces in due time. So is every one that trusteth in them. The idol worshippers are as bad as the idol makers, for if there were none to worship, there would be no market for the degrading manufacture. Idolaters are spiritually dead. They are the mere images of men. Their best being is gone. They are not what they seem. Their mouths do not really pray. Their eyes see not the truth. Their ears hear not the voice of the Lord. And the life of God is not in them. Those who believe in their own inventions in religion betray great folly and an utter absence of the quickening spirit. Gracious men can see the absurdity of forsaking the true God and setting up rivals in his place. But those who perpetrate this crime think not so. On the contrary, they pride themselves upon their great wisdom and boast of advanced thought and modern culture. Others there are who believe in a baptismal regeneration, which does not renew the nature, and they make members of Christ and children of God who have none of the spirit of Christ or the signs of adoption. May we be saved from such mimicry of divine work, lest we also become like our idols. Verses 19 to 21 Bless the Lord, O house of Israel. Bless the Lord, O house of Aaron. Bless the Lord, O house of Levi. Ye that fear the Lord, bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord out of Zion, which dwelleth at Jerusalem. Praise ye the Lord. 19. Bless the Lord, O house of Israel. All of you, in all your tribes, praise the one Jehovah. Each tribe, from Reuben to Benjamin, has its own special cause for blessing the Lord, and the nation as a whole has substantial reasons for pouring out benedictions upon his name. Those whom God has named the house of Israel, a family of prevailing princes, ought to show their loyalty by thankfully bowing before their sovereign Lord. Bless the Lord, O house of Aaron. These were elected to high office and permitted to draw very near to the divine presence. Therefore they beyond all others were bound to bless the Lord. Those who are favoured to be leaders in the church should be foremost in adoration. In God's house, the house of Aaron should feel bound to speak well of his name before all the house of Israel. 20. Bless the Lord, O house of Levi. These helped the priests in other things. Let them aid them in this also. The house of Israel comprehends all the chosen seed. Then we come down to the smaller but more central ring of the house of Aaron, and now we widen out to the whole tribe of Levi. Let reverence and adoration spread from man to man until the whole lump of humanity shall be leavened. The house of Levi had choice reasons for blessing God. Read the Levite story and see. Remember that the whole of the Levites were set apart for holy service and supported by the tribes allotted to them. Therefore they were in honour bound above all others to worship Jehovah with cheerfulness. Ye that fear the Lord, bless the Lord. These are the choicer spirits, the truly spiritual, for they are not the Lord's in name only, but in heart and spirit. The Father seeketh such to worship him. If Aaron and Levi both forget and fail, these will not. It may be that this verse is intended to bring in God-fearing men who were not included under Israel, Aaron and Levi. They were Gentile proselytes, and this verse opens the door and bids them enter. Those who fear God need not wait for any other qualification for sacred service. Godly fear proves us to be in the covenant with Israel, in the priesthood with Aaron, and in the service of the Lord with Levi. Filial fear, such as saints feel towards the Lord, does not hinder their praise. Nay, it is the main source and fountain of their adoration. 21. Blessed be the Lord out of Zion, which dwelleth at Jerusalem. Let him be most praised at home. Where he blesses most, let him be blessed most. Let the beloved Mount of Zion and the chosen city of Jerusalem echo his praises. 
he remains among his people. He is their dwelling place, and they are his dwelling place. Let this intimate communion ensure intense gratitude on the part of his chosen. The temple of holy solemnities, which is Christ, and the city of the great king, which is the church, may fitly be regarded as the headquarters of the praises of Jehovah, the God of Israel. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen and Amen. End of Psalm 135, Part 2psalm 136 part 1 of the treasury of david volume 7 by c h spurgeon this librivox recording is in the public domain read by jillian hendry psalm 136 we know not by whom this psalm was written but we do know that it was sung in solomon's temple second chronicles chapter 7 verses 3 and 6 and by the armies of jehoshaphat when they sang themselves into victory in the wilderness of Tekoa. From the striking form of it, we should infer that it was a popular hymn among the Lord's ancient people. Most hymns with a solid, simple chorus become favourites with congregations, and this is sure to have been one of the best beloved. It contains nothing but praise. It is tuned to rapture, and can only be fully enjoyed by a devoutly grateful heart. It commences with a threefold praise to the triune God, one to three. Then it gives us six notes of praise to the Creator, four to nine. Six more upon deliverance from Egypt, ten to fifteen. And seven upon the journey through the wilderness and the entrance into Canaan. Then we have two happy verses of personal gratitude for present mercy, twenty-three and twenty-four. One, verse twenty-five to tell of the Lord's universal providence, and a closing verse to excite to never-ending praise. Exposition Verses 1-3 to three. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth for ever. O give thanks unto the God of gods, for his mercy endureth for ever. O give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endureth for ever. 1. O give thanks unto the Lord. The exhortation is intensely earnest. The psalmist pleads with the Lord's people with an O, oh, three times repeated. Thanks are the least that we can offer, and these we ought freely to give. The inspired writer calls us to praise Jehovah for all his goodness to us, and all the greatness of his power in blessing his chosen. We thank our parents. Let us praise our Heavenly Father. We are grateful to our benefactors. Let us give thanks unto the giver of all good. For he is good. Essentially, he is goodness itself. Practically, all that he does is good. Relatively, he is good to his creatures. Let us thank him that we have seen, proved, and tasted that he is good. He is good beyond all others. Indeed, he alone is good in the highest sense. He is the source of good, the good of all good, the sustainer of good, the perfecter of good, and the rewarder of good. For this he deserves the constant gratitude of his people. For his mercy endureth for ever. We shall have this repeated in every verse of this song, but not once too often. It is the sweetest stanza that a man can sing. What joy that there is mercy! Mercy with Jehovah, enduring mercy, mercy enduring for ever. We are ever needing it, trying it, praying for it, receiving it. Therefore, let us for ever sing of it. When all else is changing within and around, in God and his mercy no change can be found. 2. O give thanks unto the God of gods. If there be powers in heaven, or on earth, worthy of the name of gods, he is the God of them. From him their dominion comes, their authority is derived from him, and their very existence is dependent upon his will. Moreover, for the moment assuming that the deities of the heathen were gods, 
yet none of them could be compared with our Elohim, who is infinitely beyond what they are fabled to be. Jehovah is our God, to be worshipped and adored, and he is worthy of our reverence to the highest degree. If the heathen cultivate the worship of their gods with zeal, how much more intently should we seek the glory of the God of gods, the only true and real God? Foolish persons have gathered from this verse that the Israelites believed in the existence of many gods, at the same time believing that their Jehovah was the chief among them. But this is an absurd inference, since gods who have a god over them cannot possibly be gods themselves. The words are to be understood after the usual manner of human speech, in which things are often spoken of not as they really are, but as they profess to be. God as God is worthy of our warmest thanks, for his mercy endureth for ever. Imagine supreme Godhead without everlasting mercy. It would then have been as fruitful a source of terror as it is now a fountain of thanksgiving. Let the highest be praised in the highest style, for right well do his nature and his acts deserve the gratitude of all his creatures. Praise your God with right good will, for his love endureth still. 3. O give thanks to the Lord of Lords. There are lords many, but Jehovah is the Lord of them. All lordship is vested in the eternal. He makes and administers law. He rules and governs mind and matter. He possesses in himself all sovereignty and power. All lords, in the plural, are summed up in this lord, in the singular. He is more lordly than all emperors and kings condensed into one. For this we may well be thankful, for we know the superior sovereign will rectify the abuses of the underlings who now lord it over mankind. He will call these lords to his bar and reckon with them for every oppression and injustice. He is as truly the Lord of Lords as he is Lord over the meanest of the land, and he rules with a strict impartiality for which every just man should give heartiest thanks. For his mercy endureth for ever. Yes, he mingles mercy with his justice and reigns for the benefit of his subjects. He pities the sorrowful, protects the helpless, provides for the needy, and pardons the guilty. And this he does from generation to generation, never wearying of his grace, because he delighteth in mercy. Let us arouse ourselves to laud our glorious Lord. A third time, let us thank him who is our Jehovah, our God, and our Lord. And let this one reason suffice us for three thanksgivings, or for three thousand. For his mercy shall endure ever faithful, ever sure. Verses 4 to 9 To him who alone doeth great wonders, for his mercy endureth for ever. To him that by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endureth for ever. To him that stretched out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endureth for ever. To him that made great lights, for his mercy endureth for ever the sun to rule by day, for his mercy endureth for ever, the moon and stars to rule by night, for his mercy endureth for ever. 4. To him who alone doeth great wonders. Jehovah is the great thaumaturgy, the unrivalled wonder-worker. None can be likened unto him. He is alone in wonderland, the creator and worker of true marvels, compared with which all other remarkable things are as child's play. His works are all great in wonder, even when they are not great in size. In fact, in the minute objects of the microscope, we behold as great wonders as even the telescope can reveal. All the works of his unrivalled skill are wrought by him alone and unaided, and to him therefore must be undivided honour. None of the gods or the lords helped Jehovah in creation or in the redemption of his people. His own right hand and his holy arm 
have wrought for him these great deeds. What have the gods of the heathen done? If the question be settled by doings, Jehovah is indeed alone. It is exceedingly wonderful that men should worship gods who can do nothing, and forget the Lord who alone doeth great wonders. Even when the Lord uses men as his instruments, yet the wonder of the work is his alone. Therefore let us not trust in men, or idolise them, or tremble before them. Praise is to be rendered to Jehovah, for his mercy endureth for ever. The mercy of the wonder is the wonder of the mercy, and the enduring nature of that mercy is the central wonder of that wonder. The Lord causes us often to sit down in amazement as we see what his mercy has wrought out and prepared for us. Wonders of grace to God belong, yea, great wonders and unsearchable. Oh, the depth! Glory be to his name, world without end. Doing wondrous deeds alone, mercy sits upon his throne. 5. To him that by wisdom made the heavens. His goodness appears in creating the upper regions. He set his wisdom to the task of fashioning a firmament or an atmosphere suitable for a world upon which mortal man should dwell. What a mass of wisdom lies hidden in this one creating act. The discoveries of our keenest observers have never searched out all the evidences of design which are crowded together in this work of God's hands. The lives of plants, animals and men are dependent upon the fashioning of our heavens. Had the skies been other than they are, we had not been here to praise God. Divine foresight planned the air and the clouds with a view to the human race. For his mercy endureth forever. The psalmist's details of mercy begin in the loftiest regions and gradually descend from the heavens to our low estate. Verse 23 and this is an ascent, for mercy becomes greater as its objects become less worthy. Mercy is far-reaching, long-enduring, all-encompassing. Nothing is too high for its reach, as nothing is beneath its stoop. High as heaven his wisdom reigns, mercy on the throne remains. 6. To him that stretched out the earth above the waters, Lifting it up from the mingled mass, the dark morass, the bottomless bog of mixed land and sea, and so fitting it to be the abode of man. Who but the Lord could have wrought this marvel? Few even think of the divine wisdom and power which performed all this of old. Yet if a continent can be proved to have risen or fallen an inch within historic memory, the fact is recorded in the transactions of learned societies and discussed at every gathering of philosophers. For his mercy endureth forever. As is seen in the original upheaval and perpetual upstanding of the habitual land, so that no deluge drowns the race. By his strength he sets fast the mountains and consolidates the land upon which we sojourn. From the flood he lifts the land, firm his mercies ever stand. 7. To him that made great lights. This also is a creating miracle worthy of our loudest thanks. What could men have done without light? Though they had the heavens above them and dry land to move upon, yet what could they see and where could they go without light? Thanks be to the Lord. Who has not consigned us to darkness. In great mercy he has not left us to an uncertain, indistinct light, floating about fitfully and without order, but he has concentrated light upon two grand luminaries, which, as far as we are concerned, are to us great lights. The psalmist is making a song for common people, not for your critical savants, and so he sings of the sun and moon as they appear to us, the greatest of lights. These the Lord created in the beginning, and for the present age of man made or constituted them light-bearers for the world. For his mercy endureth forever. Mercy gleams in every ray of light, 
and it is most clearly seen in the arrangement by which it is distributed with order and regularity from the sun and moon lamps he lit in heaven's heights for in mercy he delights eight the sun to rule by day we cannot be too specific in our praises after mentioning great lights we may sing of each of them and yet not outwear our theme the influences of the sun are too many for us to enumerate them all but untold benefits come to all orders of beings by its light warmth and other operations whenever we sit in the sunshine our gratitude should be kindled the sun is a great ruler and his government is pure beneficence because by god's mercy it is moderated to our feebleness let all who rule take lessons from the sun which rules to bless by day we may well give thanks for god gives cheer the sun rules because god rules it is not the sun which we should worship like the parsees but the creator of the sun as he did who wrote this sacred song for his mercy endureth for ever day unto day uttereth speech concerning the mercy of the lord every sunbeam is a mercy for it falls on undeserving sinners who else would sit in doleful darkness and find earth a hell milton puts it well quote, he the golden tressed sun caused all day his course to run for his mercy shall endure ever faithful ever sure End quote. nine the moon and stars to rule by night no hour is left without rule blessed be god he leaves us never to the doom of anarchy the rule is one of light and benediction the moon with her charming changes and the stars in their fixed spheres gladden the night when the season would be dark and dreary because of the absence of the sun forth come the many minor comforters the sun is enough alone but when he is gone a numerous band cannot suffice to give more than a humble imitation of his radiance jesus the son of righteousness alone can do more for us than all his servants put together he makes our day when he is hidden it is night and remains night let our human comforters shine at their full what mercy is seen in the lamps of heaven gladdening our landscape at night what equal mercy in all the influences of the moon upon the tides those life floods of the earth the lord is the maker of every star be the stars what they may he calleth them all by their names and at his bidding each messenger with his torch enlightens our darkness for his mercy endureth for ever let our thanks be as many as the stars and let our lives reflect the goodness of the lord even as the moon reflects the light of the sun the nightly guides and illuminators of men on land and sea are not for now and then but for all time they shone on adam and they shine on us thus they are tokens and pledges of undying grace to men and we may sing with our scotch friends quote, for certainly his mercies dure most firm and sure eternally End quote. verses ten to fifteen to him that smote egypt in their firstborn for his mercy endureth for ever and brought out israel from among them for his mercy endureth for ever with a strong hand and with a stretched out arm for his mercy endureth for ever to him which divided the red sea into parts for his mercy endureth for ever and made israel to pass through the midst of it for his mercy endureth for ever but overthrew pharaoh and his host in the red sea for his mercy endureth for ever ten we have heard of the glory of the world's creation we are now to praise the lord for the creation of his favoured nation by their exodus from egypt because the monarch of egypt stood in the way of the lord's gracious purposes it became needful for the lord to deal with him in justice but the great design was mercy to israel and through israel mercy to succeeding ages and to all the world 
to him that smote Egypt in their firstborn. The last and greatest of the plagues struck all Egypt to the heart. The sorrow and the terror which it caused throughout the nation it is hardly possible to exaggerate. From king to slave, each one was wounded in the tenderest point. The joy and hope of every household was struck down in one moment, and each family had its own wailing. The former blows had missed their aim compared with the last, but that smote Egypt. The Lord's firstborn had been oppressed by Egypt, and at last the Lord fulfilled his threatening. I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Justice lingered, but it struck home at last. For his mercy endureth forever. Yes, even to the extremity of vengeance upon a whole nation, the Lord's mercy to his people endured. He is slow to anger, and judgment is his strange work. But when mercy to men demands severe punishments, he will not hold back his hand from the needful surgery. What were all the firstborn of Egypt, compared with those divine purposes of mercy to all generations of men, which were wrapped up in the deliverance of the elect people? Let us, even when the Lord's judgments are abroad in the earth, continue to sing of his unfailing grace. For evermore his love shall last, for ever sure, for ever fast. 11. And brought out Israel from among them. Scattered, as the tribes were, up and down the country, and apparently held in a grasp which would never be relaxed, the Lord wrought their deliverance, and severed them from their idolatrous taskmasters. None of them remained in bondage. The Lord brought them out, brought them all out, brought them out at the very hour when his promise was due, brought them out despite their being mingled among the Egyptians, brought them out never to return. And to his name let us give thanks for this further proof of his favour to the chosen ones. For his mercy endureth for ever. Once the Israelites did not care to go out, but preferred to bear the ills they had, rather than risk they knew not what. But the Lord's mercy endured that test also, and ceased not to stir up the nest, till the birds were glad to take to their wings. He turned the land of plenty into a house of bondage, and the persecuted nation was glad to escape from slavery. The unfailing mercy of the Lord is gloriously seen in his separating his elect from the world. He brings out his redeemed, and they are henceforth a people who show forth his praise. For God doth prove our constant friend, his boundless love shall never end. 12. With a strong hand and with a stretched out arm. Not only the matter, but the manner of the Lord's mighty acts should be the cause of our praise. We ought to bless the Lord for adverbs as well as adjectives. In the Exodus, the great power and glory of Jehovah were seen. He dashed in pieces the enemy with his right hand. He led forth his people in no mean or clandestine manner. He brought them forth also with silver and gold, and there was not one feeble person in all their tribes. Egypt was glad when they departed. God worked with great display of force and with exceeding majesty. He stretched out his arm like a workman intent on his labour. He lifted up his hand as one who is not ashamed to be seen. Even thus was it in the deliverance of each one of us from the thraldom of sin according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. For his mercy endureth for ever. Therefore his power is put forth for the rescue of his own. If one plague will not set them free, there shall be ten. But free they shall be at the appointed hour. Not one Israelite shall remain under Pharaoh's power. God will not only use his hand, but his arm. His extraordinary power shall be put to the work sooner than his purpose of mercy shall fail. See, he lifts his strong right hand, for his mercies steadfast stand. 13. To him which divided the Red Sea into parts. 
He made a road across the sea bottom, causing the divided waters to stand like walls on either side. Men deny miracles, but granted that there is a God, they become easy of belief. Since it requires me to be an atheist that I may logically reject miracles, I prefer the far smaller difficulty of believing in the infinite power of God. He who causes the waters of the sea ordinarily to remain as one mass can with equal readiness divide them. He who can throw a stone in one direction can with the same force throw it another way. The Lord can do precisely what he wills, and he wills to do anything which is for the deliverance of his people. For his mercy endureth for ever, and therefore it endures through the sea as well as over the dry land. He will do a new thing to keep his old promise. His way is in the sea, and he will make a way for his people in the same pathless region. Lo, the Red Sea he divides, for his mercy sure abides. 14. And made Israel to pass through the midst of it. He gave the people courage to follow the predestined track through the yawning abyss, which might well have terrified a veteran host. It needed no little generalship to conduct so vast and motley a company along a way so novel and apparently so dangerous. He made them to pass by the untrodden road. He led them down into the deep and up again on the further shore in perfect order, keeping their enemies back by the thick darkness of the cloudy pillar. Herein is the glory of God set forth, as all his people see it in their own deliverance from sin. By faith we also give up all reliance upon works, and trust ourselves to pass by a way which we have not known, even by the way of reliance upon the atoning blood. Thus are we effectually sundered from the Egypt of our former estate, and our sins themselves are drowned. The people marched dry-shod through the heart of the sea. Alleluia! For his mercy endureth for ever. Mercy cleared the road, mercy cheered the host, mercy led them down, and mercy brought them up again. Even to the depth of the sea, mercy reaches. There is no end to it, no obstacle in the way of it, no dangers to believers in it, while Jehovah is all around. Forward be our watchword, as it was that of Israel of old, for mercy doth compass us about. Through the fire or through the sea, still his mercy guardeth thee. 15. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea. Here comes the thunderclap. Though we hear them sounding peal upon peal, yet the judgments of the Lord were only loudmouthed mercies, speaking confusion to the foe, that the chosen might tremble before him no longer. The chariots were thrown over, the horses were overthrown. The king and his warriors were alike overwhelmed. They were hurled from their chariots as locusts are tossed to and fro in the wind. Broken was the power and conquered was the pride of Egypt. Jehovah had vanquished the enemy. Art thou not it which cut Rahab and wounded the crocodile? None are too great for the Lord to subdue, none too high for the Lord to abase. The enemy in his fury drove after Israel into the sea, but there his wrath found a terrible recompense beneath the waves. For his mercy endureth for ever. Yes, mercy continued to protect its children, and therefore called in the aid of justice to fulfil the capital sentence on their foes. Taken red-handed, in the very act of rebellion against their sovereign lord, the audacious adversaries met the fate which they had themselves invited. He that goes down into the midst of the sea asks to be drowned. Sin is self-damnation. The sinner goes downward of his own choice, and if he finds out too late that he cannot return, is not his blood upon his own head? The finally impenitent, however terrible their doom, will not be witnesses against mercy but rather this shall aggravate their misery that they went on in defiance of mercy and would not yield themselves to him whose mercy endureth for ever.
To the Israelites, as they sung this song, their one thought would be of the rescue of their fathers from the fierce oppressor. Taken like a lamb from between the teeth of the lion, Israel justly praises her deliverer and chants aloud, Evermore his love shall reign, Pharaoh and his host are slain. End of Psalm 136, Part 1《Psalm 136, Part 2 of the Treasury of David, Volume 7 by C. H. Spurgeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Psalm 136, verses 16 to 22. To him which led his people through the wilderness, for his mercy endureth forever. To him which smote great kings, for his mercy endureth forever and slew famous kings, for his mercy endureth forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endureth forever. And Og, the king of Bashan, for his mercy endureth forever. And gave their land for an heritage, for his mercy endureth forever. Even an heritage unto Israel his servant, for his mercy endureth forever. 16. To him which led his people through the wilderness. He led them into it, and therefore he was pledged to lead them through it. They were his people, and yet they must go into the wilderness, and the wilderness must remain as barren as ever it was. But in the end, they must come out of it into the promised land. God's dealings are mysterious, but they must be right, simply because they are his. The people knew nothing of the way, but they were led. They were a vast host, yet they were all led. There were neither roads nor tracks, but being led by unerring wisdom, they never lost their way. He who brought them out of Egypt also led them through the wilderness. By Moses and Aaron and Jethro and the pillar of cloud, he led them. What a multitude of mercies are comprehended in the conduct of such an enormous host through a region wherein there was no provision even for single travellers. Yet the Lord, by his infinite power and wisdom, conducted a whole nation for forty years through a desert land, and their feet did not swell, neither did their garments wax old in all the journey. For his mercy endureth for ever. Their conduct in the wilderness tested his mercy most severely, but it bore the strain. Many a time he forgave them, and though he smote them for their transgressions, yet he waited to be gracious and speedily turned to them in compassion. Their faithfulness soon failed, but his did not. The fiery, cloudy pillar, which never ceased to lead the van, was a visible proof of his immutable love. For his mercy, changing never, still endureth, sure for ever. 17. To him which smote great kings. Within sight of their inheritance, Israel had to face powerful enemies. Kings, judged to be great because of the armies at their back, blocked up their road. This difficulty soon disappeared, for the Lord smote their adversaries, and a single stroke sufficed for their destruction. He who had subdued the really mighty ruler of Egypt made short work of these petty sovereigns great though they were in the esteem of neighbouring princes. For his mercy endureth for ever. Mercy, which had brought the chosen tribes so far, would not be balked by the opposition of boastful foes. The Lord who smote Pharaoh at the beginning of the wilderness march smote Sihon and Og at the close of it. How could these kings hope to succeed when even mercy itself was in arms against them? Evermore his mercy stands, saving from the foeman's hands. 18. And slew famous kings. What good was their fame to them? As they opposed God, they became infamous rather than famous. Their deaths made the Lord's fame to increase among the nations, while their fame ended in disgraceful defeat. For his mercy endureth for ever. Israelitish patriots felt that they could never have too much of this music, 
God had protected their nation, and they chanted his praises with unwearied iteration. Kings he smote, despite their fame, for his mercies still the same. 19. Sihon, King of the Amorites Let the name be mentioned, that the mercy may be the better remembered. Sihon smote Moab, but he could not smite Israel, for the Lord smote him. He was valiant and powerful, so as to be both great and famous. But as he willfully refused to give a peaceful passage to the Israelites, and fought against them in malice, there was no choice for it but to let him run into that destruction which he courted. His fall was speedy and final, and the chosen people were so struck with it that they sang of his overthrow in their national songs. For his mercy endureth for ever. His mercy is no respecter of persons, and neither the greatness nor the fame of Sihon could protect him after he had dared to attack Israel. The Lord will not forsake his people because Sihon blusters. Come what may, by night or day, still most sure his love shall dure. 20. And Og, the king of Bashan. He was of the race of the giants, but he was routed like a pygmy when he entered the lists with Israel's God. The Lord's people were called upon to fight against him, but it was God who won the victory. The fastnesses of Bashan were no defence against Jehovah. Og was soon ousted from his stronghold, when the captain of the Lord's host led the war against him. He had to exchange his bedstead of iron for a bed in the dust, for he fell on the battlefield. Glory be to the divine conqueror, for his mercy endureth for ever. Giant kings before him yield, mercy ever holds the field. If Sion could not turn the Lord from his purpose, we may be sure that Og could not. He who delivers us out of one trouble will rescue us out of another and fulfil all the good pleasure of his grace in us. 21. And gave their land for an heritage. As Lord of the whole earth, he transferred his estate from one tenant to another. The land did not become the property of the Israelites by their own sword and bow, but by a grant from the throne. This was the great end which all along had been aimed at from Egypt to Jordan. He who brought his people out also brought them in. He who had promised the land to the seed of Abraham also saw to it that the deed of gift did not remain a dead letter. Both our temporal and our spiritual estates come to us by royal charter. What God gives us is ours by the best of titles. Inheritance by God's gift is a tenure which even Satan cannot dispute. For his mercy endureth for ever. Faithful love endures without end and secures its own end. Thou wilt surely bring them in, said the prophet poet, and here we see the deed complete. Till they reach the promised land, mercy still the same must stand. 22. Even an heritage unto Israel his servant. Repetitions are effective in poetry, and the more so if there be some little variation in them, bringing out into fuller light some point which else had not been noticed. The lands of the heathen kings were given to Israel, the name by which the chosen seed is here mentioned for the third time in the psalm, with the addition of the words, his servant. The leasehold of Canaan to Israel after the flesh was made dependent upon suit and service rendered to the lord of the manor by whom the lease was granted. It was a country worth singing about, richly justifying the two stanzas devoted to it. The division of the country by lot and the laws by which the portions of ground were reserved to the owners and their descendants for a perpetual inheritance, were fit subjects for song. Had other nations enjoyed land laws which ensured to every man a plot of ground for cultivation, much of the present discontent would never have arisen, beggary would soon have become uncommon, and poverty itself would have been rare. For his mercy endureth for ever. Yes, mercy fights for the land. 
mercy divides the spoil among its favoured ones, and mercy secures each man in his inheritance. Glory be to God, the faithful one. For his mercy, full and free, wins us full felicity. Verses 23 and 24 who remembered us in our low estate, for his mercy endureth for ever, and hath redeemed us from our enemies, for his mercy endureth for ever. 23. Who remembered us in our low estate? Personal mercies awake the sweetest song. He remembered us. Our prayer is, Lord, remember me. And this is our encouragement. He has remembered us. For the Lord, even to think of us, is a wealth of mercy. Ours was a sorry estate, an estate of bankruptcy and mendicancy. Israel rested in its heritage, but we were still in bondage, groaning in captivity. The Lord seemed to have forgotten us and left us in our sorrow, but it was not so for long. He turned again in his compassion, bethinking himself of his afflicted children. Our state was once so low as to be at hell's mouth. Since then it has been low in poverty, bereavement, despondency, sickness and heart sorrow, and we fear also sinfully low in faith and love and every other grace. And yet the Lord has not forgotten us as a dead thing out of mind, but he has tenderly remembered us still. We thought ourselves too small and too worthless for his memory to burden itself about us, yet he remembered us. For his mercy endureth for ever. Yes, this is one of the best proofs of the immutability of his mercy, for if he could have changed towards any, it would certainly have been towards us who have brought ourselves low, kept ourselves low, and prepared ourselves to sink yet lower. It is memorable mercy to remember us in our low estate. In our highest joys we will exalt Jehovah's name, since of this we are sure, he will not now desert us. For his mercy, full and free, lasteth to eternity. 24. And hath redeemed us from our enemies. Israel's enemies brought the people low. But the Lord intervened and turned the tables by a great redemption. The expression implies that they had become like slaves and were not set free without price and power, for they needed to be redeemed. In our case, the redemption which is in Christ Jesus is an eminent reason for giving thanks unto the Lord. Sin is our enemy, and we are redeemed from it by the atoning blood. Satan is our enemy, and we are redeemed from him by the Redeemer's power. The world is our enemy, and we are redeemed from it by the Holy Spirit. We are ransomed. Let us enjoy our liberty. Christ has wrought our redemption. Let us praise his name. For his mercy endureth forever. Even to redemption by the death of his Son did divine mercy stretch itself. What more can be desired? What more can be imagined? Many waters could not quench love, neither could the floods drown it. E'en to death upon the tree, mercy dureth faithfully. Verse 25 Who giveth food to all flesh, for his mercy endureth forever. 25 Who giveth food to all flesh. Common providence, which cares for all living things, deserves our devoutest thanks. If we think of heavenly food, by which all saints are supplied, our praises rise to a still greater height. But meanwhile, the universal goodness of God in feeding all his creatures is as worthy of praise as his special favours to the elect nation. Because the Lord feeds all life, therefore we expect him to take special care of his own family for his mercy endureth for ever. Reaching downward, even to beasts and reptiles, it is indeed a boundless mercy, which knows no limit because of the meanness of its object. All things living he doth feed, his full hand supplies their need, for his mercy shall endure 
ever faithful, ever sure. Verse 26 O give thanks unto the God of heaven, for his mercy endureth for ever. 26 O give thanks unto the God of heaven. The title is full of honour. The Lord is God in the highest realms, and among celestial beings. His throne is set in glory, above all, out of reach of foes, in the place of universal oversight. He who feeds ravens and sparrows is yet the glorious God of the highest realms. Angels count it their glory to proclaim his glory in every heavenly street. See here in the greatness of his nature, the depth of his condescension, and the range of his love. Mark the one sole cause of his bounty, for his mercy endureth for ever. He hath done all things from this motive, and because his mercy never ceases, he will continue to multiply deeds of love world without end. Let us with all our powers of heart and tongue give thanks unto the holy name of Jehovah for ever and ever. Change and decay in all around I see, O thou who changest not, abide with me. End of Psalm 136, Part 2「Psalm 137 of the Treasury of David, Volume 7, by C. H. Spurgeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Psalm 137. This plaintive ode is one of the most charming compositions in the whole book of Psalms for its poetic power. If it were not inspired, it would nevertheless occupy a high place in poesy, especially the former portion of it, which is tender and patriotic to the highest degree. In the later verses, 7, 8 and 9, we have utterances of burning indignation against the chief adversaries of Israel, an indignation as righteous as it was fervent. Let those find fault with it who have never seen their temple burned, their city ruined, their wives ravished, and their children slain. They might not perhaps be quite so velvet-mouthed if they had suffered after this fashion. It is one thing to talk of the bitter feeling which moved captive Israelites in Babylon, and quite another thing to be captives ourselves, under a savage and remorseless power, which knew not how to show mercy, but delighted in barbarities to the defenceless. The song is such as might fitly be sung in the Jews' wailing place. It is a fruit of the captivity in Babylon, and often has it furnished expression for sorrows which else had been unutterable. It is an opalesque psalm, within whose mild radiance there glows a fire which strikes the beholder with wonder. Exposition, verses 1-6 to six. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy, 1. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Watercourses were abundant in Babylon, wherein were not only natural streams, but artificial canals. It was a place of broad rivers and streams. Glad to be away from the noisy streets, the captives sought the riverside, where the flow of the waters seemed to be in sympathy with their tears. It was some slight comfort to be out of the crowd and to have a little breathing room, and therefore they sat down, as if to rest a while, and solace themselves in their sorrow. In little groups they sat down, and made common lamentation, mingling their memories and their tears. The rivers were well enough, but alas, they were the rivers of Babylon, and the ground whereon the sons of Israel sat was foreign soil. 
and therefore they wept. Those who came to interrupt their quiet were citizens of the destroying city, and their company was not desired. Everything reminded Israel of her banishment from the holy city, her servitude beneath the shadow of the temple of Bel, her helplessness under a cruel enemy, and therefore her sons and daughters sat down in sorrow. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. Nothing else could have subdued their brave spirits, but the remembrance of the temple of their god, the palace of their king, and the centre of their national life quite broke them down. Destruction had swept down all their delights, and therefore they wept. The strong men wept, the sweet singers wept. They did not weep when they remembered the cruelties of Babylon. The memory of fierce oppression dried their tears and made their hearts burn with wrath. But when the beloved city of their solemnities came into their minds, they could not refrain from floods of tears. Even thus do true believers mourn when they see the church despoiled and find themselves unable to succour her. We could bear anything better than this. In these our times, the Babylon of error ravages the city of God, and the hearts of the faithful are grievously wounded as they see truth fallen in the streets, and unbelief rampant among the professed servants of the Lord. We bear our protests, but they appear to be in vain. The multitude are mad upon their idols. Be it ours to weep in secret for the hurt of our Zion. It is the least thing we can do. Perhaps, in its result, it may prove to be the best thing we can do. Be it ours also to sit down and deeply consider what is to be done. Be it ours in any case to keep upon our mind and heart the memory of the Church of God, which is so dear to us. The frivolous may forget, but Zion is graven on our hearts, and her prosperity is our chief desire. 2. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. The drooping branches appeared to weep as we did, and so we gave to them our instruments of music. The willows could as well make melody as we, for we had no mind for minstrelsy. In the midst of the willows, or in the midst of the rivers, or in the midst of Babylon, it matters little which, they hung their harps aloft. Those harps which once in Zion's halls the soul of music shed. Better to hang them up than to dash them down. Better to hang them on willows than profane them to the service of idols. Sad indeed is the child of sorrow when he grows weary of his harp, from which in better days he had been able to draw sweet solaces. Music hath charms to give unquiet spirits rest. But when the heart is sorely sad, it only mocks the grief which flies to it. Men put away their instruments of mirth when a heavy cloud darkens their souls. 3. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. It was ill to be a singer at all when it was demanded that this talent should go into bondage to an oppressor's will. Better be dumb than be forced to please an enemy with forced song. What cruelty to make a people sigh and then require them to sing. Shall men be carried away from home and all that is dear to them, and yet chant merrily for the pleasure of their unfeeling captors? This is studied torture. The iron enters into the soul. It is indeed woe to the conquered when they are forced to sing to increase the triumph of their conquerors. Cruelty herein reached a refinement seldom thought of. We do not wonder that the captives sat them down to weep when thus insulted. And they that wasted us required of us mirth. The captives must not only sing, but smile and add merriment to their music. Blind Samson in former days must be brought forth to make sport for Philistines, and now the Babylonians prove themselves to be loaves of the same leaven. Plundered, wounded, fettered, carried into captivity and poverty, yet must the people laugh as if it were all a play, and they must sport as if they felt no sorrow. 
This was wormwood and gall to the true lovers of God and his chosen land. Saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Nothing would serve their turn but a holy hymn and a tune sacred to the worship of Jehovah. Nothing will content the Babylonian mockers but one of Israel's psalms, when in her happiest days she sang unto the Lord, whose mercy endureth for ever. This would make rare fun for their persecutors, who would deride their worship and ridicule their faith in Jehovah. In this demand there was an insult to their God, as well as a mockery of themselves, and this made it the more intensely cruel. Nothing could have been more malicious, nothing more productive of grief. These wanton persecutors had followed the captives into their retirement and had remarked upon their sorrowful appearance, and there and then they bade the mourners make mirth for them. Could they not let the sufferers alone? Were the exiles to have no rest? The daughter of Babylon seemed determined to fill up her cup of iniquity by torturing the Lord's people. Those who had been the most active agents of Israel's undoing must needs follow up their ferocities by mockeries. The tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. Worse than the Egyptians, they asked not labour, which their victims could have rendered, but they demanded mirth, which they could not give, and holy songs, which they dared not profane to such a purpose. 4. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? How shall they sing at all? Sing in a strange land? Sing Jehovah's song among the uncircumcised? No, that must not be. It shall not be. With one voice they refuse. But the refusal is humbly worded by being put in the form of a question. If the men of Babylon were wicked enough to suggest the defiling of holy things for the gratification of curiosity or for the creation of amusement, the men of Zion had not so hardened their hearts as to be willing to please them at such a fearful cost. There are many things which the ungodly could do and think nothing of the doing thereof, which gracious men cannot venture upon. The question, how can I, or how shall we, comes of a tender conscience and denotes an inability to sin, which is greatly to be cultivated. 5. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. To sing Zion's songs for the pleasure of Zion's foes would be to forget the holy city. Each Jew declares for himself that he will not do this, for the pronoun alters from we to I. Individually, the captives pledge themselves to fidelity to Jerusalem, and each one asserts that he had sooner forget the art which drew music from his harp-strings than use it for Babel's delectation. Better far that the right hand should forget its usual handicraft and lose all its dexterity than that it should fetch music for rebels out of the Lord's instruments or accompany with sweet skill a holy psalm desecrated into a common song for fools to laugh at. Not one of them will thus dishonour Jehovah to glorify Belus and gratify his votaries. Solemnly they imprecate vengeance upon themselves should they so false, so faithless prove. 6. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. Thus the singers imprecate eternal silence upon their mouths, if they forget Jerusalem to gratify Babylon. The players on instruments and the sweet songsters are of one mind. The enemies of the Lord will get no mirthful tune or song from them. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. The sacred city must ever be first in their thoughts, the queen of their souls. They had sooner be dumb than dishonour her sacred hymns and give occasion to the oppressor to ridicule her worship. If such the attachment of a banished Jew to his native land, how much more should we love the church of God of which we are children and citizens? How zealous should we be of her honour? How zealous for her prosperity? Never let us find jests in the words of Scripture 
or make amusement out of holy things, lest we be guilty of forgetting the Lord and his cause. It is to be feared that many tongues have lost all power to charm the congregations of the saints, because they have forgotten the gospel, and God has forgotten them. Verses 7-9 to nine. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. 7. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem. The case is left in Jehovah's hands. He is a God of recompenses and will deal out justice with impartiality. The Edomites ought to have been friendly with the Israelites from kinship, but there was a deep hatred and cruel spite displayed by them. The elder loved not to serve the younger, and so when Jacob's day of tribulation came, Esau was ready to take advantage of it. The captive Israelites, being moved by grief to lodge their plaints with God, also added a prayer for his visitation of the nation which meanly sided with their enemies, and even urged the invaders to more than their usual cruelty. Who said, Raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. They wished to see the last of Jerusalem and the Jewish state. They would have no stone left standing. They desired to see a clean sweep of temple, palace, wall and habitation. It is horrible for neighbours to be enemies. Worse for them to show their enmity in times of great affliction. Worst of all, for neighbours to egg others on to malicious deeds. Those are responsible for other men's sins who would use them as the tools of their own enmity. It is a shame for men to incite the wicked to deeds which they are not able to perform themselves. The Chaldeans were ferocious enough without being excited to greater fury, but Edom's hate was insatiable. Those deserve to be remembered by vengeance, who in evil times do not remember mercy. How much more those who take advantage of calamities to wreak revenge upon sufferers. When Jerusalem's day of restoration comes, Edom will be remembered and wiped out of existence. 8. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, or the destroyer. Let us accept the word either way, or both ways. The destroyer would be destroyed, and the psalmist in vision saw her as already destroyed. It is usual to speak of a city as a virgin daughter. Babylon was in her prime and beauty, but she was already doomed for her crimes. Happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. The avenger would be fulfilling an honourable calling in overthrowing a power so brutal, so inhuman. Assyrian and Chaldean armies had been boastfully brutal in their conquests. It was meet that their conduct should be measured back in their own bosoms. No awards of punishment can be more unanswerably just than those which closely follow the Lex Talionis, even to the letter. Babylon must fall, as she caused Jerusalem to fall, and her sack and slaughter must be such as she appointed for other cities. The patriot poet, sitting sorrowfully in his exile, finds a solace in the prospect of the overthrow of the empress city which holds him in bondage, and he accounts Cyrus right happy to be ordained to such a righteous work. The whole earth would bless the conqueror for ridding the nations of a tyrant. Future generations would call him blessed for enabling men to breathe again and for once more making liberty possible upon the earth. We may rest assured that every unrighteous power is doomed to destruction and that from the throne of God justice will be measured out to all whose law is force, whose rule is selfishness and whose policy is oppression. Happy is the man who shall help in the overthrow of the spiritual Babylon, which, despite its riches and power, 
is to be destroyed. Happier still shall he be who shall see it sink like a millstone in the flood, never to rise again. What that spiritual Babylon is, none need inquire. There is but one city upon earth which can answer to the name. 9. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. Fierce was the heart of the Jew who had seen his beloved city the scene of such terrific butchery. His heart pronounced like sentence upon Babylon. She should be scourged with her own whip of wire. The desire for righteous retribution is rather the spirit of the law than of the gospel. And yet in moments of righteous wrath the old fire will burn. And while justice survives in the human breast, it will not lack for fuel among the various tyrannies which still survive. We shall be wise to view this passage as a prophecy. History informs us that it was literally fulfilled. The Babylonian people, in their terror, agreed to destroy their own offspring, and men thought themselves happy when they had put their own wives and children to the sword. Horrible as was the whole transaction, it is a thing to be glad of if we take a broad view of the world's welfare. For Babylon, the gigantic robber, had for many a year slaughtered nations without mercy, and her fall was the rising of many people to a freer and safer state. The murder of innocent infants can never be sufficiently deplored, but it was an incident of ancient warfare which the Babylonians had not omitted in their massacres, and therefore they were not spared it themselves. The revenges of providence may be slow, but they are ever sure. Neither can they be received with regret by those who see God's righteous hand in them. It is a wretched thing that a nation should need an executioner. But yet, if men will commit murders, tears are more fitly shed over their victims than over the assassins themselves. A feeling of universal love is admirable, but it must not be divorced from a keen sense of justice. The captives in Babylon did not make music, but they poured forth their righteous maledictions, and these were far more in harmony with their surroundings than songs and laughter could have been. Those who mock the Lord's people will receive more than they desire, to their own confusion. They shall have little enough to make mirth for them, and more than enough to fill them with misery. The execrations of good men are terrible things, for they are not lightly uttered, and they are heard in heaven. The curse causeless shall not come. But is there not a cause? Shall despots crush virtue beneath their iron heel and never be punished? Time will show. End of Psalm 137《Psalm 138 of the Treasury of David, Volume 7, by C. H. Spurgeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Psalm 138. Title, A Psalm of David. This psalm is wisely placed. Whoever edited and arranged these sacred poems, he had an eye to apposition and contrast. For if, in Psalm 137, we see the need of silence before revilers. Here we see the excellence of a brave confession. There is a time to be silent, lest we cast pearls before swine. And there is a time to speak openly, lest we be found guilty of cowardly non-confession. The psalm is evidently of a Davidic character, exhibiting all the fidelity, courage and decision of that king of Israel and prince of psalmists. Of course, the critics have tried to rend the authorship from David on account of the mention of the temple, though it so happens that in one of the Psalms, which is allowed to be David's, the same word occurs. Many modern critics are to the word of God what blowflies are to the food of men. They cannot do any good, and unless relentlessly driven away, they do great harm. Division in full confidence, David is prepared to own his God before the gods of the heathen, or before angels or rulers. 1-3 to three. 
he declares that he will instruct and convert kings and nations, till on every highway men shall sing the praises of the Lord. 4 and 5. Having thus spoken, he utters his personal confidence in Jehovah, who will help his lowly servant and preserve him from all the malice of wrathful foes. Exposition Verses 1 to 3. I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. In the day when I cried, thou answeredest me and strengthenedst me with strength in my soul. 1. I will praise thee with my whole heart. His mind is so taken up with God that he does not mention his name. To him there is no other God, and Jehovah is so perfectly realised and so intimately known that the psalmist, in addressing him, no more thinks of mentioning his name than we should do if we were speaking to a father or a friend. He sees God with his mind's eye and simply addresses him with the pronoun thee. He is resolved to praise the Lord and to do it with the whole force of his life, even with his whole heart. He would not submit to act as one under restraint because of the opinions of others, but in the presence of the opponents of the living God, he would be as hearty in worship as if all were friends and would cheerfully unite with him. If others do not praise the Lord, there is all the more reason why we should do so, and should do so with enthusiastic eagerness. We need a broken heart to mourn our own sins, but a whole heart to praise the Lord's perfections. If ever our heart is whole and wholly occupied with one thing, it should be when we are praising the Lord. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. Why should these idols rob Jehovah of his praises? The psalmist will not for a moment suspend his songs because there are images before him, and their foolish worshippers might not approve of his music. I believe David referred to the false gods of the neighbouring nations and the deities of the surviving Canaanites. He was not pleased that such gods were set up, but he intended to express at once his contempt of them and his own absorption in the worship of the living Jehovah by continuing most earnestly to sing wherever he might be. It would be paying these dead idols too much respect to cease singing because they were perched aloft. In these days, when new religions are daily excogitated and new gods are set up, it is well to know how to act. Bitterness is forbidden, and controversy is apt to advertise the heresy. The very best method is to go on personally worshipping the Lord with unvarying zeal, singing with heart and voice his royal praises. Do they deny the divinity of our Lord? Let us the more fervently adore him. Do they despise the atonement? Let us the more constantly proclaim it. Had half the time spent in councils and controversies been given to praising the Lord, the church would have been far sounder and stronger than she is at this day. The Hallelujah Legion will win the day. Praising and singing are our armour against the idolatries of heresy, our comfort under the depression caused by insolent attacks upon the truth and our weapons for defending the gospel. Faith, when displayed in cheerful courage, has about it a sacred contagion. Others learn to believe in the Most High when they see his servant, calm mid the bewildering cry, confident of victory. 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple, or the place of God's dwelling, where the ark abode. He would worship God in God's own way. The Lord had ordained a centre of unity, a place of sacrifice, a house of his indwelling, and David accepted the way of worship enjoined by revelation. Even so, the true-hearted believer of these days must not fall into the will-worship of superstition or the wild worship of scepticism, but reverently worship as the Lord himself prescribes. The idol gods had their temples, but David averts his glance from them 
and looks earnestly to the spot chosen of the Lord for his own sanctuary. We are not only to adore the true God, but to do so in his own appointed way. The Jew looked to the temple. We are to look to Jesus, the living temple of the Godhead. And praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. Praise would be the main part of David's worship, the name or character of God, the great object of his song, and the special point of his praise, the grace and truth, which shone so conspicuously in that name. The person of Jesus is the temple of the Godhead, and therein we behold the glory of the Father, full of grace and truth. It is upon these two points that the name of Jehovah is at this time assailed, his grace and his truth. He is said to be too stern, too terrible, and therefore modern thought displaces the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and sets up an effeminate deity of its own making. As for us, we firmly believe that God is love, and that in the summing up of all things, it will be seen that hell itself is not inconsistent with the beneficence of Jehovah, but is indeed a necessary part of his moral government, now that sin has intruded into the universe. True believers hear the thunders of his justice, and yet they do not doubt his loving kindness. Especially do we delight in God's great love to his own elect, such as he showed to Israel as a race, and more especially to David and his seed, when he entered into covenant with him. Concerning this, there is abundant room for praise. But not only do men attack the loving kindness of God, but the truth of God is at this time assailed on all sides. Some doubt the truth of the inspired record as to its histories. Others challenge the doctrines. Many sneer at the prophecies. In fact, the infallible word of the Lord is at this time treated as if it were the writing of impostors and only worthy to be carped at. The swine are trampling on the pearls at this time and nothing restrains them. Nevertheless, the pearls are pearls still and shall yet shine about our monarch's brow. We sing the loving kindness and truth of the God of the Old Testament. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. David, before the false gods, first sang, then worshipped, and then proclaimed the grace and truth of Jehovah. Let us do the same before the idols of the new theology. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. The word of promise made to David was in his eyes more glorious than all else that he had seen of the Most High. Revelation excels creation in the clearness, definiteness, and fullness of its teaching. The name of the Lord in nature is not so easily read as in the scriptures, which are a revelation in human language, specially adapted to the human mind, treating of human need, and of a saviour who appeared in human nature to redeem humanity. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but the divine word will not pass away. And in this respect, especially, it has a preeminence over every other form of manifestation. Moreover, the Lord lays all the rest of his name under tribute to his word. His wisdom, power, love, and all his other attributes combine to carry out his word. It is his word which creates, sustains, quickens, enlightens, and comforts. As a word of command, it is supreme and in the person of the incarnate word it is set above all the works of God's hands. The sentence in the text is wonderfully full of meaning. We have collected a vast mass of literature upon it, but space will not allow us to put it all into our notes. Let us adore the Lord who has spoken to us by his word and by his Son, and in the presence of unbelievers let us both praise his holy name and extol his holy word. 3. In the day when I cried, thou answeredst me. No proof is so convincing as that of experience. No man doubts the power of prayer 
after he has received an answer of peace to his supplication. It is the distinguishing mark of the true and living God that he hears the pleadings of his people and answers them. The gods hear not and answer not, but Jehovah's memorial is the God that heareth prayer. There was some special day in which David cried more vehemently than usual. He was weak, wounded, worried, and his heart was wearied. Then, like a child, he cried, cried unto his father. It was a bitter, earnest, eager prayer, as natural and as plaintive as the cry of a babe. The Lord answered it. But what answer can there be to a cry? to a mere inarticulate wail of grief. Our Heavenly Father is able to interpret tears and cries, and he replies to their inner sense in such a way as fully meets the case. The answer came in the same day as the cry ascended. So speedily does prayer rise to heaven, so quickly does mercy return to earth. The statement of this sentence is one which all believers can make and as they can substantiate it with many facts, they ought boldly to publish it, for it is greatly to God's glory. Well might the psalmist say, I will worship, when he felt bound to say, Thou answeredst me. Well might he glory before the idols and their worshippers, when he had answers to prayer to look back upon. This also is our defence against modern heresies. We cannot forsake the Lord for he has heard our prayers. And strengthenest me with strength in my soul. This was a true answer to his prayer. If the burden was not removed, yet strength was given wherewith to bear it, and this is an equally effective method of help. It may not be best for us that the trial should come to an end. It may be far more to our advantage that by its pressure we should learn patience. Sweet are the uses of adversity, and our prudent Father in heaven will not deprive us of those benefits. Strength imparted to the soul is an inestimable boon. It means courage, fortitude, assurance, heroism. By his word and spirit, the Lord can make the trembler brave, the sick whole, the weary bright. This soul might will continue. The man, having been strengthened for one emergency, remains vigorous for life and is prepared for all future labours and sufferings, unless indeed he throw away his force by unbelief or pride or some other sin. When God strengthens, none can weaken. Then is our soul strong indeed when the Lord infuses might into us. Verses 4 and 5 All the kings of the earth shall praise thee, O Lord, when they hear the words of thy mouth. Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. 4 All the kings of the earth shall praise thee, O Lord, when they hear the words of thy mouth. Kings have usually small care to hear the word of the Lord. But King David feels assured that if they do hear it, they will feel its power. A little piety goes a long way in courts. But brighter days are coming, in which rulers will become hearers and worshippers. May the advent of such happy times be hastened. What an assembly! All the kings of the earth! What a purpose! Gathered to hear the words of Jehovah's mouth! What a preacher! David himself rehearses the words of Jehovah. What praise, when they all in happy union lift up their songs unto the Lord. Kings are as gods below, and they do well when they worship the God above. The way of conversion for kings is the same as for ourselves. Faith to them also cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Happy are those who can cause the word of the Lord to penetrate palaces, for the occupants of thrones are usually the last to know the joyful sounds of the gospel. David, the king, cared for kings' souls, and it will be wise for each man to look first after those who are of his own order. He went to his work of testimony 
with full assurance of success. He meant to speak only the words of Jehovah's mouth, and he felt sure that the kings would hear and praise Jehovah. 5. Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord. Here is a double wonder. Kings in God's ways, and kings singing there. Let a man once know the ways of Jehovah, and he will find therein abundant reason for song. But the difficulty is to bring the great ones of the earth into ways so little attractive to the carnal mind. Perhaps when the Lord sends us a King David to preach, we shall yet see monarchs converted and hear their voices raised in devout adoration. For great is the glory of the Lord. This glory shall overshadow all the greatness and glory of all kings. They shall be stirred by a sight of it to obey and adore. O that Jehovah's glory were revealed even now! O that the blind eyes of men could once behold it! Then their hearts would be subdued to joyful reverence. David, under a sense of Jehovah's glory, exclaimed, I will sing! Verse 1 and here he represents the kings as doing the same thing. Verses 6-8 to eight. Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me, Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth for ever. Forsake not the works of thine own hands. 6. Though the Lord be high. In greatness, dignity, and power, Jehovah is higher than the highest. His nature is high above the comprehension of his creatures, and his glory even exceeds the loftiest soarings of imagination. Yet hath he respect unto the lowly. He views them with pleasure, thinks of them with care, listens to their prayers, and protects them from evil. Because they think little of themselves, he thinks much of them. They reverence him, and he respects them. They are low in their own esteem, and he makes them high in his esteem. But the proud he knoweth afar off, he does not need to come near them in order to discover their utter vanity. A glance from afar reveals to him their emptiness and offensiveness. He has no fellowship with them, but views them from a distance. He is not deceived, but knows the truth about them, despite their blustering. He has no respect unto them, but utterly abhors them. To a Cain's sacrifice, a Pharaoh's promise, a Rabshakeh's threat, and a Pharisee's prayer. The Lord has no respect. Nebuchadnezzar, when far off from God, cried, Behold this great Babylon which I have builded. But the Lord knew him, and sent him grazing with cattle. Proud men boast loudly of their culture and the freedom of thought, and even dare to criticise their maker. But he knows them from afar and will keep them at arm's length in this life, and shut them up in hell in the next. 7. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. If I am walking there now, or shall be doing so in years to come, I have no cause to fear, for God is with me, and will give me new life. When we are somewhat in trouble, it is bad enough but it is worse to penetrate into the centre of that dark continent and traverse its midst. Yet in such a case the believer makes progress, for he walks. He keeps to a quiet pace, for he does no more than walk, and he is not without the best of company, for his God is near to pour fresh life into him. It is a happy circumstance that, if God be away at any other time, yet he is pledged to be with us in trying hours. When thou passest through the rivers, I will be with thee. He is in a blessed condition who can confidently use the language of David, thou wilt revive me. 
he shall not make his boast of God in vain. He shall be kept alive, and made more alive than ever. How often has the Lord quickened us by our sorrows? Are they not his readiest means of exciting to fullness of energy the holy life which dwells within us? If we receive reviving, we need not regret affliction. When God revives us, trouble will never harm us. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. This is the fact which would revive fainting David. Our foes fall when the Lord comes to deal with them. He makes short work of the enemies of his people. With one hand he routs them. His wrath soon quenches their wrath. His hand stays their hand. Adversaries may be many and malicious and mighty, but our glorious defender has only to stretch out his arm and their armies vanish. The sweet singer rehearses his assurance of salvation and sings of it in the ears of the Lord, addressing him with this confident language. He will be saved, saved dexterously, decidedly, divinely. He has no doubt about it. God's right hand cannot forget its cunning. Jerusalem is his chief joy, and he will defend his own elect. 8. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. All my interests are safe in Jehovah's hands. The work which his goodness began, the arm of his strength will complete. His promise is yea and amen and never was forfeited yet. God is concerned in all that concerns his servants. He will see to it that none of their precious things shall fail of completion. Their life, their strength, their hopes, their graces, their pilgrimage, shall each and all be perfected. Jehovah himself will see to this, and therefore it is most sure. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth for ever. The refrain of the former psalm is in his ears, and he repeats it as his own personal conviction and consolation. The first clause of the verse is the assurance of faith, and this second one reaches to the full assurance of understanding. God's work in us will abide unto perfection, because God's mercy towards us thus abideth. Forsake not the works of thine own hands. Our confidence does not cause us to live without prayer, but encourages us to pray all the more, since we have it written upon our hearts that God will perfect his work in us, and we see it also written in Scripture that his mercy changeth not. We with holy earnestness entreat that we may not be forsaken. If there be anything good in us, it is the work of God's own hands. Will he leave it? Why has he wrought so much in us if he means to give it up? It will be a sheer waste of effort. He who has gone so far will surely persevere with us to the end. Our hope for the final perseverance of the believer lies in the final perseverance of the believer's God. If the Lord begins to build and does not finish, it will not be to his honour. He will have a desire to the work of his hands, for he knows what it has cost him already, and he will not throw away a vessel upon which he has expended so much of labour and skill. Therefore do we praise him with our whole heart, even in the presence of those who depart from his holy word and set up another God and another gospel, which are not another, but there be some that trouble us. End of Psalm 138。Psalm 139, Part 1 of the Treasury of David, Volume 7 by C. H. Spurgeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Psalm 139, one of the most notable of the sacred hymns. It sings the omniscience and omnipresence of God, inferring from these the overthrow of the powers of wickedness, 
since he who sees and hears the abominable deeds and words of the rebellious will surely deal with them according to his justice. The brightness of this psalm is like unto a sapphire stone, or Ezekiel's terrible crystal. It flames out with such flashes of light as to turn night into day. Like a pharos, this holy song casts a clear light even to the uttermost parts of the sea, and warns us against that practical atheism which ignores the presence of God, and so makes shipwreck of the soul. Title To the Chief Musician The last time this title occurred was in Psalm 109. This sacred song is worthy of the most excellent of the singers, and is fitly dedicated to the leader of the temple, Samadhi, that he might set it to music, and see that it was devoutly sung in the solemn worship of the Most High. A Psalm of David It bears the image and superscription of King David, and could have come from no other mind than that of the son of Jesse. Of course the critics take this composition away from David, on account of certain Aramaic expressions in it. We believe that, upon the principles of criticism now in vogue, it would be extremely easy to prove that Milton did not write Paradise Lost. We have yet to learn that David could not have used expressions belonging to the language of the patriarchal ancestral house. Who knows how much of the antique speech may have been purposely retained among those nobler minds who rejoiced in remembering the descent of their race. Knowing to what wild inferences the critics have run in other matters, we have lost nearly all faith in them, and prefer to believe David to be the author of this psalm from internal evidences of style and matter, rather than to accept the determination of men whose modes of judgment are manifestly unreliable. Exposition Verses 1-6 to six. O Lord, Thou hast searched me, and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting, and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path, and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but, lo, O Lord, Thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid Thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. 1. O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. He invokes in adoration Jehovah, the all-knowing God, and he proceeds to adore him by proclaiming one of his peculiar attributes. If we would praise God aright, we must draw the matter of our praise from himself. O Jehovah, Thou hast. No pretended God knows aught of us, but the true God, Jehovah, understands us and is most intimately acquainted with our persons, nature and character. How well it is for us to know the God who knows us. The divine knowledge is extremely thorough and searching. It is as if he had searched us, as officers search a man for contraband goods, or as pillagers ransack a house for plunder. Yet we must not let the figure run upon all fours and lead us further than it is meant to do. The Lord knows all things naturally and as a matter of course, and not by any effort on his part. Searching ordinarily implies a measure of ignorance which is removed by observation. Of course, this is not the case with the Lord. But the meaning of the psalmist is that the Lord knows us as thoroughly as if he had examined us minutely and had pried into the most secret corners of our being. This infallible knowledge has always existed. Thou hast searched me. And it continues unto this day, since God cannot forget that which he has once known. There never was a time in which we were unknown to God, and there never will be a moment in which we shall be beyond his observation. Note how the psalmist makes his doctrine personal. He saith not, O God, thou knowest all things, but thou hast known me. It is ever our wisdom to lay truth home to ourselves. How wonderful the contrast between the observer and the observed, Jehovah and me. Yet this most intimate connection exists, and therein lies our hope. 
Let the reader sit still a while and try to realise the two poles of this statement, the Lord and poor puny man, and he will see much to admire and wonder at. 2. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Me thou knowest, and all that comes of me. I am observed when I quietly sit down, and marked when I resolutely rise up. My most common and casual acts, my most needful and necessary movements, are noted by thee, and thou knowest the inward thoughts which regulate them. Whether I sink in lowly self-renunciation, or ascend in pride, thou seest the motions of my mind, as well as those of my body. This is a fact to be remembered every moment. Sitting down to consider, or rising up to act, we are still seen, known, and read by Jehovah our Lord. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Before it is my own, it is foreknown and comprehended by thee. Though my thought be invisible to the sight, though as yet I be not myself cognizant of the shape it is assuming, yet thou hast it under thy consideration, and thou perceivest its nature, its source, its drift, its result. Never dost thou misjudge or wrongly interpret me. My inmost thought is perfectly understood by thine impartial mind. Though thou shouldst give but a glance at my heart, and see me as one sees a passing meteor moving afar, yet thou wouldst by that glimpse sum up all the meanings of my soul, so transparent is everything to thy piercing glance. 3. Thou compassed my path and my lying down. My path and my pallet, my running and my resting, are alike within the circle of thine observation. Thou dost surround me, even as the air continually surrounds all creatures that live. I am shut up within the wall of thy being. I am encircled within the bounds of thy knowledge. Waking or sleeping, I am still observed of thee. I may leave thy path, but thou never leavest mine. I may sleep and forget thee, but thou dost never slumber, nor fall into oblivion concerning thy creature. The original signifies not only surrounding, but winnowing and sifting. The Lord judges our active life and our quiet life. He discriminates our action and our repose, and marks that in them which is good, and also that which is evil. There is chaff in all our wheat, and the Lord divides them with unerring precision. And art acquainted with all my ways. Thou art familiar with all I do. Nothing is concealed from thee, nor surprising to thee, nor misunderstood by thee. Our paths may be habitual or accidental, open or secret, but with them all the Most Holy One is well acquainted. This should fill us with awe, so that we sin not, with courage, so that we fear not, with delight, so that we mourn not. 4. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. The unformed word, which lies within the tongue, like a seed in the soil, is certainly and completely known to the great searcher of hearts. A negative expression is used to make the positive statement all the stronger. Not a word is unknown, is a forcible way of saying that every word is well known. Divine knowledge is perfect, since not a single word is unknown, nay, not even an unspoken word, and each one is altogether or wholly known. What hope of concealment can remain when the speech with which too many conceal their thoughts is itself transparent before the Lord? O Jehovah, how great art thou! If thine eye hath such power, what must be the united force of thine whole nature? 5. Thou hast beset me behind and before. As though we were caught in an ambush, or besieged by an army which has wholly beleaguered the city walls, we are surrounded by the Lord. God has set us where we be, 
and beset us wherever we be. Behind us there is God recording our sins, or in grace blotting out the remembrance of them. And before us there is God foreknowing all our deeds, and providing for all our wants. We cannot turn back and so escape him, for he is behind. We cannot go forward and outmarch him, for he is before. He not only beholds us, but he besets us. Unless there should seem any chance of escape, or lest we should imagine that the surrounding presence is yet a distant one, it is added, And laid thine hand upon me. The prisoner marches along, surrounded by a guard, and gripped by an officer. God is very near. We are wholly in his power. From that power there is no escape. It is not said that God will thus beset us and arrest us, but it is done. Thou hast beset me. Shall we not alter the figure and say that our Heavenly Father has folded his arms around us and caressed us with his hand? It is even so with those who are, by faith, the children of the Most High. 6. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. I cannot grasp it. I can hardly endure to think of it. The theme overwhelms me. I am amazed and astounded at it. Such knowledge not only surpasses my comprehension, but even my imagination. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Mount as I may, this truth is too lofty for my mind. It seems to be always above me, even when I soar into the loftiest regions of spiritual thought. Is it not so with every attribute of God? Can we attain to any idea of his power, his wisdom, his holiness? Our mind has no line with which to measure the infinite. Do we therefore question? Say rather that we therefore believe and adore. We are not surprised that the most glorious God should in his knowledge be high above all the knowledge to which we can attain. It must of necessity be so, since we are such poor, limited beings. And when we stand a tiptoe, we cannot reach to the lowest step of the throne of the Eternal. Verses 7 to 12 Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Here omnipresence is the theme, a truth to which omniscience naturally leads up. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Not that the psalmist wished to go from God, or to avoid the power of the divine life, but he asks this question to set forth the fact that no one can escape from the all-pervading being and observation of the great invisible spirit. Observe how the writer makes the matter personal to himself. Whither shall I go? It were well if we all thus applied truth to our own cases. It were wise for each one to say, The Spirit of the Lord is ever around me. Jehovah is omnipresent to me. Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If, full of dread, I hastened to escape from that nearness of God which had become my terror, which way could I turn? Whither? Whither? He repeats his cry. No answer comes back to him. The reply to his first whither is its echo, a second whither. From the sight of God he cannot be hidden, but that is not all. From the immediate, actual, constant presence of God he cannot be withdrawn. We must be, whether we will it or not, as near to God as our soul is to our body. This makes it dreadful work to sin. For we offend the Almighty to his face and commit acts of treason at the very foot of his throne. 
go from him or flee from him we cannot neither by patient travel nor by hasty flight can we withdraw from the all-surrounding deity his mind is in our mind himself within ourselves his spirit is over our spirit our presence is ever in his presence eight if i ascend up into heaven thou art there filling the loftiest region with his yet loftier presence jehovah is in the heavenly place at home upon his throne the ascent if it were possible would be unavailing for purposes of escape it would in fact be a flying into the centre of the fire to avoid the heat there would he be immediately confronted by the terrible personality of god note the abrupt words thou there if i make my bed in hell behold thou art there descending into the lowest imaginable depths among the dead there should we find the lord thou says the psalmist as if he felt that god was the one great existence in all places whatever hades may be or whoever may be there one thing is certain thou o jehovah art there two regions the one of glory and the other of darkness are set in contrast and this one fact is asserted of both thou art there whether we rise up or lie down take our wing or make our bed we shall find god near us a behold is added to the second clause since it seems more a wonder to meet with god in hell than in heaven in hades than in paradise of course the presence of god produces very different effects in these places but it is unquestionably in each the bliss of one the terror of the other what an awful thought that some men seem resolved to take up their night's abode in hell a night which shall know no morning. 9. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, if I could fly with all swiftness and find a habitation where the mariner has not yet ploughed the deep, yet I could not reach the boundaries of the divine presence. Light flies with inconceivable rapidity and it flashes far afield beyond all human ken it illuminates the great and wide sea and sets its waves gleaming afar but its speed would utterly fail if employed in flying from the lord were we to speed on the wings of the morning breeze and break into oceans unknown to chart and map yet there we should find the lord already present he who saves to the uttermost would be with us in the uttermost parts of the sea Ten even there shall thy hand lead me we could only fly from god by his own power the lord would be leading covering preserving sustaining us even when we were fugitives from him and thy right hand shall hold me in the uttermost parts of the sea my arrest would be as certain as at home god's right hand would there seize and detain the runaway should we be commanded on the most distant errand, we may assuredly depend upon the upholding right hand of God as with us in all mercy, wisdom and power. The exploring missionary in his lonely wanderings is led. In his solitary feebleness, he is held. Both the hands of God are with his own servants to sustain them and against rebels to overthrow them. And in this respect, it matters not to what realms they resort. The active energy of God is around them still. 11. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me. Dense darkness may oppress me, but it cannot shut me out from thee, or thee from me. Thou seest as well without the light as with it, since thou art not dependent upon light, which is thine own creature for the full exercise of thy perceptions. Moreover, thou art present with me, whatever may be the hour, and being present, thou discoverest all that I think or feel or do. 
men are still so foolish as to prefer night and darkness for their evil deeds. But so impossible is it for anything to be hidden from the Lord, that they might just as well transgress in broad daylight. Darkness and light in this agree, great God, they are both alike to thee. Thine hand can pierce thy foes as soon through midnight shades as blazing noon. A good man will not wish to be hidden by the darkness. A wise man will not expect any such thing. If we were so foolish as to make sure of concealment because the place was shrouded in midnight, we might well be alarmed out of our security by the fact that, as far as God is concerned, we always dwell in the light. For even the night itself glows with a revealing force. Even the night shall be light about me. Let us think of this if ever we are tempted to take license from the dark. It is light about us. If the darkness be light, how great is that light in which we dwell? Note well how David keeps his song in the first person. Let us mind that we do the same as we cry with Hagar, Thou God seest me. 12. Yea, of a surety beyond all denial. The darkness hideth not from thee. It veils nothing. It is not the medium of concealment in any degree whatever. It hides from men, but not from God. But the night shineth as the day. It is but another form of day. It shines, revealing all. It shineth as the day, quite as clearly and distinctly manifesting all that is done. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. This sentence seems to sum up all that went before, and most emphatically puts the negative upon the faintest idea of hiding under the cover of night. Men cling to this notion because it is easier and less expensive to hide under darkness than to journey to remote places. And therefore the foolish thought is here beaten to pieces by statements which, in their varied forms, effectually batter it. Yet the ungodly are still duped by their grovelling notions of God and inquire, how doth God know? They must fancy that he is as limited in his powers of observation as they are. And yet, if they would but consider for a moment, they would conclude that he who could not see in the dark could not be God, and he who is not present everywhere could not be the Almighty Creator. Assuredly, God is in all places, at all times, and nothing can by any possibility be kept away from his all-observing, all-comprehending mind. The Great Spirit comprehends within himself all time and space, and yet he is infinitely greater than these, or aught else that he has made. End of Psalm 139, Part 1「Psalm 139, Part 2 of the Treasury of David, Volume 7, by C. H. Spurgeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Psalm 139, verses 13 to 18. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. 13. For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou art the owner of my inmost parts and passions, not the indweller and observer only, but the acknowledged Lord and possessor of my most secret self. 
The word reins signifies the kidneys, which by the Hebrews were supposed to be the seat of the desires and longings. But perhaps it indicates here the most hidden and vital portion of the man. This God doth not only inspect and visit, but it is his own. He is as much at home there as a landlord on his own estate or a proprietor in his own house. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. There I lay hidden, covered by thee. Before I could know thee, or aught else, thou hadst a care for me, and didst hide me away as a treasure, till thou shouldst see fit to bring me to the light. Thus the psalmist describes the intimacy which God had with him. In his most secret part, his reigns, and in his most secret condition, yet unborn. He was under the control and guardianship of God. 14. I will praise thee. A good resolve, and one which he was even now carrying out. Those who are praising God are the very men who will praise him. Those who wish to praise have subjects for adoration ready at hand. We too seldom remember our creation and all the skill and kindness bestowed upon our frame. But the sweet singer of Israel was better instructed, and therefore he prepares for the chief musician a song concerning our nativity, and all the fashioning which precedes it. We cannot begin too soon to bless our Maker, who began so soon to bless us. Even in the act of creation, he created reasons for our praising his name. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Who can gaze even upon a model of our anatomy without wonder and awe? Who could dissect a portion of the human frame without marvelling at its delicacy and trembling at its frailty? The psalmist had scarcely peered within the veil which hides the nerves, sinews and blood vessels from common inspection. The science of anatomy was quite unknown to him and yet he had seen enough to arouse his admiration of the work and his reverence for the worker. Marvellous are thy works. These parts of my frame are all thy works, and though they be home works, close under my own eye, yet are they wonderful to the last degree. They are works within my own self, yet are they beyond my understanding, and appear to me as so many miracles of skill and power. We need not go to the ends of the earth for marvels, nor even across our own threshold. They abound in our own bodies. And that my soul knoweth right well. He was no agnostic. He knew. He was no doubter. His soul knew. He was no dupe. His soul knew right well. Those know indeed, and of a truth, who first know the Lord, and then know all things in him. He was made to know the marvellous nature of God's work with assurance and accuracy, for he had found by experience that the Lord is a master worker, performing inimitable wonders when accomplishing his kind designs. If we are marvellously wrought upon even before we are born, what shall we say of the Lord's dealings with us after we quit his secret workshop? and he directs our pathway through the pilgrimage of life. What shall we not say of that new birth, which is even more mysterious than the first, and exhibits even more the love and wisdom of the Lord? 15. My substance was not hid from thee. The substantial part of my being was before thine all-seeing eye. The bones which make my frame were put together by thine hand. The essential materials of my being, before they were arranged, were all within the range of thine eye. I was hidden from all human knowledge, but not from thee. Thou hast ever been intimately acquainted with me. When I was made in secret. Most chastely and beautifully is here described the formation of our being, before the time of our birth. A great artist will often labour alone in his studio and not suffer his work to be seen until it is finished. Even so did the Lord fashion us where no eye beheld us, and the veil was not lifted till every member was complete. 
much of the formation of her inner man still proceeds in secret. Hence the more of solitude, the better for us. The true church also is being fashioned in secret, so that none may cry, Lo, here, or Lo, there, as if that which is visible could ever be identical with the invisibly growing body of Christ. And curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Embroidered with great skill is an accurate poetical description of the creation of veins, sinews, muscles, nerves, and so on. What tapestry can equal the human fabric? This work is wrought as much in private as if it had been accomplished in the grave or in the darkness of the abyss. The expressions are poetical, beautifully veiling, though not absolutely concealing, the real meaning. God's intimate knowledge of us from our beginning and even before it, is here most charmingly set forth. Cannot he who made us thus wondrously, when we were not, still carry on his work of power till he has perfected us, though we feel unable to aid in the process, and are lying in great sorrow and self-loathing, as though cast into the lowest parts of the earth? 16. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. While as yet the vessel was upon the wheel, the potter saw it all. The Lord knows not only our shape, but our substance. This is substantial knowledge indeed. The Lord's observation of us is intent and intentional. Thine eyes did see. Moreover, the divine mind discerns all things as clearly and certainly as men perceive by actual eyesight. His is not hearsay acquaintance, but the knowledge which comes of sight. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. An architect draws his plans and makes out his specifications. Even so did the great maker of our frame write down all our members in the book of his purposes. That we have eyes and ears and hands and feet is all due to the wise and gracious purpose of heaven. It was so ordered in the secret decree by which all things are as they are. God's purposes concern our limbs and faculties. Their form and shape and everything about them were appointed of God long before they had any existence. God saw us when we could not be seen, and he wrote about us when there was nothing of us to write about. When as yet there were none of our members in existence, all those members were before the eye of God in the sketchbook of his foreknowledge and predestination. This verse is an exceedingly difficult one to translate, but we do not think that any of the proposed amendments are better than the rendering afforded us by the authorised version. The large number of words in italics will warn the English reader that the sense is hard to come at and difficult to express, and that it would be unwise to found any doctrine upon the English words. Happily, there is no temptation to do so. The great truth expressed in these lines has by many been referred to the formation of the mystical body of our Lord Jesus. Of course, what is true of man as man is emphatically true of him who is the representative man. The great Lord knows who belong to Christ. His eye perceives the chosen members who shall yet be made one with the living person of the mystical Christ. Those of the elect who are as yet unborn or unrenewed are nevertheless written in the Lord's book. As the form of Eve grew up in silence and secrecy under the fashioning hand of the Maker, so at this hour is the bride being fashioned for the Lord Jesus. Or, to change the figure, a body is being prepared in which the life and glory of the indwelling Lord shall for ever be displayed. The Lord knoweth them that are his. He has especially familiar acquaintance with the members of the body of Christ. He sees their substance, unperfect though they be. 17. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! 
he is not alarmed at the fact that God knows all about him. On the contrary, he is comforted, and even feels himself to be enriched, as with a casket of precious jewels. That God should think upon him is the believer's treasure and pleasure. He cries, How costly, how valued are thy thoughts, how dear to me is thy perpetual attention. He thinks upon God's thoughts with delight. The more of them, the better is he pleased. It is a joy worth worlds that the Lord should think upon us who are so poor and needy. It is a joy which fills our whole nature to think upon God, returning love for love, thought for thought, after our poor fashion. How great is the sum of them! When we remember that God thought upon us from old eternity, continues to think upon us every moment, and will think of us when time shall be no more, we may well exclaim, How great is the sum! Thoughts such as are natural to the Creator, the Preserver, the Redeemer, the Father, the Friend, are evermore flowing from the heart of the Lord. Thoughts of our pardon, renewal, upholding, supplying, educating, perfecting, and a thousand more kinds, perpetually well up in the mind of the Most High. It should fill us with adoring wonder and reverent surprise that the infinite mind of God should turn so many thoughts towards us who are so insignificant and so unworthy. What a contrast is all this to the notion of those who deny the existence of a personal conscious God Imagine a world without a thinking personal God. Conceive of a grim providence of machinery, a fatherhood of law. Such philosophy is hard and cold. As well might a man pillow his head upon a razor edge as seek rest in such a fancy. But a God always thinking of us makes a happy world, a rich life, a heavenly hereafter. 18. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. This figure shows the thoughts of God to be altogether innumerable, for nothing can surpass in number the grains of sand which belt the main ocean and all the minor seas. The task of counting God's thoughts of love would be a never-ending one. If we should attempt the reckoning, we must necessarily fail, for the infinite falls not within the line of our feeble intellect. Even could we count the sands on the seashore, we should not then be able to number God's thoughts, for they are more in number than the sand. This is not the hyperbole of poetry, but the solid fact of inspired statement. God thinks upon us infinitely. There is a limit to the act of creation, but not to the might of divine love. When I awake, I am still with thee. Thy thoughts of love are so many that my mind never gets away from them. They surround me at all hours. I go to my bed and God is my last thought. And when I wake, I find my mind still hovering about his palace gates. God is ever with me and I am ever with him. This is life indeed. If during sleep my mind wanders away into dreams, yet it only wanders upon holy ground, and the moment I wake, my heart is back with its Lord. The psalmist does not say, when I awake, I return to thee, but I am still with thee, as if his meditations were continuous and his communion unbroken. Soon we shall lie down to sleep for the last time. God grant that when the trumpet of the archangel shall waken us, we may find ourselves still with him. Verses 19 to 24 Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men, for they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred, I count them mine enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, 
and lead me in the way everlasting. 19. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. There can be no doubt upon that head, for thou hast seen all their transgressions, which indeed have been done in thy presence, and thou hast long enough endured their provocations, which have been so openly manifest before thee. Crimes committed before the face of the judge are not likely to go unpunished. If the eye of God is grieved with the presence of evil, it is but natural to expect that he will remove the offending object. God who sees all evil will slay all evil. With earthly sovereigns, sin may go unpunished for lack of evidence, or the law may be left without execution from lack of vigour in the judge. But this cannot happen in the case of God, the living God. He beareth not the sword in vain. Such is his love of holiness and hatred of wrong, that he will carry on war to the death with those whose hearts and lives are wicked. God will not always suffer his lovely creation to be defaced and defiled by the presence of wickedness. If anything is sure, this is sure, that he will ease him of his adversaries. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. Men who delight in cruelty and war are not fit companions for those who walk with God. David chases the men of blood from his court, for he is weary of those of whom God is weary. He seems to say, If God will not let you live with him, I will not have you live with me. You would destroy others, and therefore I want you not in my society. You will be destroyed yourselves. I desire you not in my service. Depart from me, for you depart from God. As we delight to have the holy God always near us, so would we eagerly desire to have wicked men removed as far as possible from us. We tremble in the society of the ungodly, lest their doom should fall upon them suddenly, and we should see them lie dead at our feet. We do not wish to have our place of intercourse turned into a gallows of execution. Therefore let the condemned be removed out of our company. 20. For they speak against thee wickedly. Why should I bear their company when their talk sickens me? They vent their treasons and blasphemies as often as they please, doing so without the slightest excuse or provocation. Let them therefore be gone, where they may find a more congenial associate than I can be. When men speak against God, they will be sure to speak against us. If they find it, serve their turn. Hence, godless men are not the stuff out of which true friends can ever be made. God gave these men their tongues, and they turn them against their benefactor, wickedly, from sheer malice, and with great perverseness. And thine enemies take thy name in vain. This is their sport. To insult Jehovah's glorious name is their amusement. To blaspheme the name of the Lord is a gratuitous wickedness in which there can be no pleasure, and from which there can be no profit. This is a sure mark of the enemies of the Lord, that they have the impudence to assail his honour and treat his glory with irreverence. How can God do other than slay them? What can we do other than withdraw from every sort of association with them? What a wonder of sin it is that men should rail against so good a being as the Lord our God. The impudence of those who talk wickedly is a singular fact, and it is the more singular when we reflect that the Lord against whom they speak is all around them and lays to heart every dishonour which they render to his holy name. We ought not to wonder that men slander and deride us, for they do the same with the Most High God. 21. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? He was a good hater, for he hated only those who hated good. Of this hatred he is not ashamed, but he sets it forth as a virtue to which he would have the Lord bear testimony. To love all men with benevolence is our duty but to love any wicked man with complacency would be a crime. To hate a man for his own sake, or for any evil done to us, would be wrong, 
but to hate a man because he is the foe of all goodness and the enemy of all righteousness is nothing more nor less than an obligation. The more we love God, the more indignant shall we grow with those who refuse him their affection. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. Truly, jealousy is cruel as the grave. The loyal subject must not be friendly to the traitor. And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? He appeals to heaven that he took no pleasure in those who rebelled against the Lord, but on the contrary, he was made to mourn by a sight of their ill behaviour. Since God is everywhere, he knows our feelings towards the profane and ungodly, and he knows that so far from approving such characters, the very sight of them is grievous to our eyes. 22. I hate them with perfect hatred. He does not leave it a matter of question. He does not occupy a neutral position. His hatred to bad, vicious, blasphemous men is intense, complete, energetic. He is as wholehearted in his hate of wickedness as in his love of goodness. I count them mine enemies. He makes a personal matter of it. They may have done him no ill, but if they are doing despite to God, to his laws, and to the great principles of truth and righteousness, David proclaims war against them. Wickedness passes men into favour with unrighteous spirits, but it excludes them from the communion of the just. We pull up the drawbridge and man the walls when a man of Belial goes by our castle. His character is a casus belli. We cannot do otherwise than contend with those who contend with God. 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. David is no accomplice with traitors. He has disowned them in set form, and now he appeals to God that he does not harbour a trace of fellowship with them. He will have God himself search him, and search him thoroughly, till every point of his being is known, and read, and understood. For he is sure that, even by such an investigation, there will be found in him no complicity with wicked men. He challenges the fullest investigation, the innermost search. He had need to be a true man who can put himself deliberately into such a crucible. Yet we may each one desire such searching, for it would be a terrible calamity to us for sin to remain in our hearts, unknown and undiscovered. Try me and know my thoughts. Exercise any and every test upon me, by fire and by water, let me be examined. Read not alone the desires of my heart, but the fugitive thoughts of my head. Know with all penetrating knowledge all that is or has been in the chambers of my mind. What a mercy that there is one being who can know us to perfection. He is intimately at home with us. He is graciously inclined towards us and is willing to bend his omniscience to serve the end of our sanctification. Let us pray as David did and let us be as honest as he. We cannot hide our sin. Salvation lies the other way in a plain discovery of evil and an effectual severance from it. 24. And see if there be any wicked way in me. See whether there be in my heart or in my life any evil habit unknown to myself. If there be such an evil way, take me from it, take it from me. No matter how dear the wrong may have become, or how deeply prejudiced I may have been in its favour, be pleased to deliver me therefrom altogether, effectually and at once, that I may tolerate nothing which is contrary to thy mind. As I hate the wicked in their way, so would I hate every wicked way in myself. And lead me in the way everlasting. If thou hast introduced me already to the good old way, be pleased to keep me in it, and conduct me further and further along it. 
it is a way which thou hast set up of old it is based upon everlasting principles and it is the way in which immortal spirits will gladly run for ever and ever there will be no end to it world without end it lasts for ever and they who are in it last for ever conduct me into it o lord and conduct me throughout the whole length of it by thy providence by thy word by thy grace and by thy spirit lead me evermore end of psalm 139 part 2psalm 140 of the treasury of david volume 7 by c h spurgeon this librivox recording is in the public domain read by gillian hendry psalm 140 this psalm is in its proper place and so fitly follows 139 that you might almost read right on and make no break between the two serious injury would follow to the whole book of psalms if the order should be interfered with as certain wiseacres propose it is the cry of a hunted soul the supplication of a believer incessantly persecuted and beset by cunning enemies who hungered for his destruction david was hunted like a partridge upon the mountains and seldom obtained a moment's rest this is his pathetic appeal to jehovah for protection an appeal which gradually intensifies into a denunciation of his bitter foes with this sacrifice of prayer he offers the salt of faith for in a very marked and emphatic manner he expresses his personal confidence in the lord as a protector of the oppressed and as his own god and defender few short psalms are so rich in the jewelry of precious faith to the chief musician the writer wished this experimental hymn to be under the care of the chief master of song that it might neither be left unsung nor chanted in a slovenly manner such trials and such rescues deserved to be had in remembrance and to be set up among the choicest memorials of the lord's goodness we too have our songs which are of no ordinary kind and these must be sung with our best powers of heart and tongue we will offer them to the lord by no other hand than that of the chief musician a psalm of david the life of david wherein he comes in contact with saul and doeg is the best explanation of this psalm and surely there can be no reasonable doubt that david wrote it and wrote it in the time of his exile and peril the tremendous outburst at the end has in it the warmth which was so natural to david who was never lukewarm in anything yet it is to be noticed that concerning his enemies he was often hot in language through indignation and yet he was cool in action for he was not revengeful his was no petty malice but a righteous anger he foresaw foretold and even desired the just vengeance of god upon the proud and wicked and yet he would not avail himself of opportunities to revenge himself upon those who had done him wrong it may be that his appeals to the great king cooled his anger and enabled him to leave his wrongs unredressed by any personal act of violence vengeance is mine i will repay saith the lord and david when most wounded by undeserved persecution and wicked falsehood was glad to leave his matters at the foot of the throne where they would be safe with the king of kings exposition verses one to three Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man, which imagine mischiefs in their heart. Continually are they gathered together for war. They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips. Selah. 1. Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. It reads like a clause of the Lord's Prayer. Deliver us from evil. David does not so much plead against an individual as against the species represented by him, namely, the being whose best description is the evil man. There are many such abroad. Indeed, we shall not find an unregenerate man who is not, in some sense, an evil man. 
and yet all are not alike evil. It is well for us that our enemies are evil. It would be a horrible thing to have the good against us. When the evil man bestirs himself against the godly, he is as terrible a being as a wolf or a serpent or even a devil. Fierce, implacable, unpitying, unrelenting, unscrupulous. He cares for nothing but the indulgence of his malice. The persecuted man turns to God in prayer. He could not do a wiser thing. Who can meet the evil man and defeat him save Jehovah himself, whose infinite goodness is more than a match for all the evil in the universe? We cannot of ourselves baffle the craft of the enemy, but the Lord knoweth how to deliver his saints. He can keep us out of the enemy's reach. He can sustain us when under his power. He can rescue us when our doom seems fixed. He can give us the victory when defeat seems certain. And in any and every case, if he do not save us from the man, he can keep us from the evil. Should we be at this moment oppressed in any measure by ungodly men, it will be better to leave our defence with God than to attempt it ourselves. Preserve me from the violent man. Evil in the heart simmers in malice, and at last boils in passion. Evil is a raging thing when it getteth liberty to manifest itself, and so the evil man soon develops into the violent man. What watchfulness, strength, or valour can preserve the child of God from deceit and violence. There is but one sure preserver, and it is our wisdom to hide under the shadow of his wings. It is a common thing for good men to be assailed by enemies. David was attacked by Saul, Doeg, Ahithophel, Shimei, and others. Even Mordecai, sitting humbly in the gate, had his Haman, and our Lord, the Perfect One, was surrounded by those who thirsted for his blood. We may not, therefore, hope to pass through the world without enemies, but we may hope to be delivered out of their hands and preserved from their rage, so that no real harm shall come of their malignity. This blessing is to be sought by prayer and expected by faith. 2. Which imagine mischiefs in their heart. They cannot be happy unless they are plotting and planning, conspiring and contriving. They seem to have but one heart, for they are completely agreed in their malice, and with all their heart and soul they pursue their victim. One piece of mischief is not enough for them. They work in the plural and prepare many arrows for their bow. What they cannot actually do, they nevertheless like to think over and to rehearse on the stage of their cruel fancy. It is an awful thing to have such a heart disease as this. When the imagination gloats over doing harm to others, it is a sure sign that the entire nature is far gone in wickedness. Continually are they gathered together for war. They are a committee of opposition in permanent session. They never adjourn. They perpetually consider the all-absorbing question of how to do the most harm to the man of God. They are a standing army always ready for the fray. They not only go to the wars, but dwell in them. Though they are the worst of company, yet they put up with one another and are continually in each other's society, confederate for fight. David's enemies were as violent as they were evil, as crafty as they were violent, and as persistent as they were crafty. It is hard dealing with persons who are only in their element when they are at daggers drawn with you. Such a case calls for prayer and prayer calls on God. 3. They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. The rapid motion of a viper's tongue gives you the idea of its sharpening it. Even thus do the malicious move their tongues at such a rate that one might suppose them to be in the very act of wearing them to a point, or rubbing them to a keen edge. It was a common notion that serpents inserted their poison by their tongues, and the poets used this idea as a poetical expression, although it is certain that the serpent wounds by his fangs and not by his tongue. We are not to suppose that all authors who used such language were mistaken in their natural history, 
any more than a writer can be charged with ignorance of astronomy because he speaks of the sun's travelling from east to west. How else can poets speak, but according to the appearance of things, to an imaginative eye? The world's great poet puts it in King Lear, quote, She struck me with her tongue, most serpent-like, upon the very heart, end quote. In the case of slanderers, they so literally sting with their tongues, which are so nimble in malice, and withal so piercing and cutting, that it is by no means unjust to speak of them as sharpened. Adder's poison is under their lips. The deadliest of all venom is the slander of the unscrupulous. Some men care not what they say, so long as they can vex and injure. Our text, however, must not be confined in its reference to some few individuals, for in the inspired epistle to the Romans, it is quoted by the Apostle as being true of us all. So depraved are we by nature that the most venomous creatures are our fit types. The old serpent has not only inoculated us with his venom, but he has caused us to be ourselves producers of the like poison. It lies under our lips, ready for use. And alas, it is all too freely used when we grow angry and desire to take vengeance upon any who have caused us vexation. It is sadly wonderful what hard things even good men will say when provoked. Yea, even such as call themselves perfect in cool blood are not quite as gentle as doves when their claims to sinlessness are bluntly questioned. This poison of evil speaking would never fall from our lips, however much we might be provoked, if it were not there at other times. But by nature we have as great a store of venomous words as a cobra has of poison. O Lord, take the poison bags away, and cause our lips to drop nothing but honey. Sela, this is heavy work. Go up, go up, my heart. Sink not too low. Fall not into the lowest key. Lift up thyself to God. Verses 4 and 5 Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from the violent man, who have purposed to overthrow my goings. The proud have hid a snare for me, and cords. They have spread a net by the wayside. They have set gins for me. Selah. 4. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. To fall into their hands would be a calamity indeed. David, in his most pitiable flight, chose to fall into the hand of a chastising God, rather than to be left in the power of men. No creature among the wild beasts of the wood is so terrible an enemy to man as man himself, when guided by evil and impelled by violence. The Lord, by providence and grace, can keep us out of the power of the wicked. He alone can do this, for neither our own watchfulness nor the faithfulness of friends can secure us against the serpentine assaults of the foe. We have need to be preserved from the smooth as well as the rough hands of the ungodly, for their flatteries may harm us as much as their calumnies. The hands of their example may pollute us, and so do us more harm than the hands of their oppression. Jehovah must be our keeper, or evil hands will do what evil hearts have imagined and evil lips have threatened. Preserve me from the violent man. His intense passion makes him terribly dangerous. He will strike anyhow, use any weapon, smite from any quarter. He is so furious that he is reckless of his own life if he may accomplish his detestable design. Lord, preserve us by thine omnipotence when men attack us with their violence. This prayer is a wise and suitable one. Who have purposed to overthrow my goings. They resolve to turn the good man from his resolve. They would defeat his designs, injure his integrity, and blast his character. Their own goings are wicked, and therefore they hate those of the righteous, seeing they are a standing rebuke to them. This is a forcible argument to use in prayer with God. 
he is the patron of holiness, and when the pure lives of his people are in danger of overthrow, he may be expected to interpose. Never let the pious forget to pray, for this is a weapon against which the most determined enemy cannot stand. 5. The proud have hid a snare for me. Proud as they are, they stoop to this mean action. They use a snare, and they hide it away, that their victim may be taken like a poor hare who is killed without warning, killed in its usual run by a snare which it could not see. David's enemies wished to snare him in his path of service, the usual way of his life. Saul laid many snares for David, but the Lord preserved him. All around us there are snares of one sort or another, and he will be well kept, aye, divinely kept, who never falls into one of them. And cords. With these they pull the net together, and with these they bind their captive. Thus fowlers do, and trappers of certain large animals. The cords of love are pleasant, but the cords of hate are cruel as death itself. They have spread a net by the wayside, where it will be near their prey, where the slightest divergence from the path will bring the victim into it. Surely the common wayside ought to be safe. Men who go out of the way may well be taken in a net, but the path of duty is proverbially the path of safety. Yet it is safe nowhere when malicious persons are abroad. Birds are taken in nets and men are taken by deceit. Satan instructs his children in the art of fowling, and they right speedily learn how to spread nets. Perhaps they have been doing that for us already. Let us make our appeal to God concerning it. They have set gins for me. One instrument of destruction is not enough. They are so afraid of missing their prey that they multiply their traps, using differing devices, so that one way or another they may take their victim. Those who avoid the snare and the net may yet be caught in a gin, and accordingly gins are placed in all likely places. If a godly man can be cajoled or bribed or cowed or made angry, the wicked will make the attempt. Ready are they to twist his words, misread his intentions, and misdirect his efforts. Ready to fawn, and lie, and make themselves mean to the last degree, so that they may accomplish their abominable purpose. Selah. The harp needs tuning after such a strain, and the heart needs lifting up towards God. Verses 6 to 8. I said unto the Lord, Thou art my God. Hear the voice of my supplications, O Lord. O God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation, thou hast covered my head in the day of battle. Grant not, O Lord, the desires of the wicked, further not his wicked device, lest they exalt themselves. Selah. 6. I said unto the Lord, Thou art my God. Here was David's stay and hope. He was assured that Jehovah was his God. He expressed that assurance and he expressed it before Jehovah himself. That had need be a good and full assurance which a man dares to lay before the face of the heart-searching Lord. The psalmist, when hunted by man, addressed himself to God. Often the less we say to our foes, and the more we say to our best friend, the better it will fare with us. If we say anything, let it be said unto the Lord. David rejoiced in the fact that he had already said that Jehovah was his God. He was content to have committed himself. He had no wish to draw back. The Lord was David's own by deliberate choice, to which he again sets his seal with delight. The wicked reject God, but the righteous receive him as their own, their treasure, their pleasure, their light and delight. Hear the voice of my supplications, O Lord. Since thou art mine, I pray thee, hear my cries. We cannot ask this favour of another man's God, but we may seek it 
from our own God. The prayers of saints have a voice in them. They are expressive pleadings, even when they sound like inarticulate moanings. The Lord can discern a voice in our wailings, and he can and will hearken thereto. Because he is God, he can hear us. Because he is our God, he will hear us. So long as the Lord doth but hear us, we are content. The answer may be according to his own will, but we do entreat to be heard. A soul in distress is grateful to anyone who will be kind and patient enough to hearken to its tale, but specially is it thankful for an audience with Jehovah. The more we consider his greatness and our insignificance, his wisdom and our folly, the more shall we be filled with praise when the Lord attends unto our cry. 7. O God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation, thou hast covered my head in the day of battle. When he looked back upon past dangers and deliverances, the good man felt that he should have perished had not the Lord held a shield over his head. In the day of the clash of arms, or of the putting on of armour, as some read it, the glorious Lord has been his constant protector. Goliath had his armour-bearer, and so had Saul, and these each one guarded his master. Yet the giant and the king both perished, while David, without armour or shield, slew the giant and baffled the tyrant. The shield of the Eternal is a better protection than a helmet of brass. When arrows fly thick and the battle-axe crashes right and left, there is no covering for the head like the power of the Almighty. See how the child of providence glorifies his preserver. He calls him not only his salvation, but the strength of it, by whose unrivalled force he had been enabled to outlive the cunning and cruelty of his adversaries. He had obtained a deliverance in which the strength of the omnipotent was clearly to be seen. This is a grand utterance of praise, a gracious ground of comfort, a prevalent argument in prayer. He that has covered our head aforetime will not now desert us. Wherefore, let us fight a good fight, and fear no deadly wound. The Lord God is our shield, and our exceeding great reward. 8. Grant not, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Even they are dependent upon thee. They can do no more than thou dost permit. Thou dost restrain them. Not a dog of them can move his tongue without thy leave and license. Therefore I entreat thee not to let them have their way. Even though they dare to pray to thee, do not hear their prayers against innocent men. Assuredly, the Lord Jehovah will be no accomplice with the malevolent. Their desires shall never be his desires. If they thirst for blood, he will not gratify their cruelty. Further not his wicked device. They are so united as to be like one man in their wishes, but do not hear their prayers. Though hand join in hand, and they desire and design as one man, yet do not thou lend them the aid of thy providence. Do not permit their malicious schemes to succeed. The Lord may allow success to attend the policy of the wicked for a time, for wise reasons unknown to us. But we are permitted to pray that it be not so. The petition, Deliver us from evil, includes and allows such supplication. Lest they exalt themselves. If successful, the wicked are sure to grow proud and insult the righteous over whom they have triumphed. And this is so great an evil and so dishonouring to God that the psalmist uses it in his pleading as an argument against their being allowed to prosper. The glory of the wicked is opposed to the glory of God. If God seems to favour them, they grow too high for this world, and their heads strike against the heavens. Let us hope that the Lord will not suffer this to be. Selah Here let us exalt our thoughts and praises high over the heads of self-exalting sinners. The more they rise in conceit, 
the higher let us rise in confidence. Verses 9 to 11 As for the head of those that compass me about, let the mischief of their own lips cover them. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits, that they rise not up again. Let not an evil speaker be established in the earth. Evil shall hunt the violent man to overthrow him. 9. As for the head of those that compass me about, let the mischief of their own lips cover them. To the Lord, who had covered his head amid the din of arms, the psalmist appeals against his foes, that their heads may be covered in quite another sense, covered with the reward of their own malice. David's foes were so many that they hemmed him in, encircling him as hunters do their prey. It is little wonder that he turns to the Lord in his dire need. The poet represents his adversaries as so united as to have but one head, for there is often a unanimity among evil spirits, which makes them the more strong and terrible for their vile purposes. The lex talionis, or law of retaliation, often brings down upon violent men the evil which they planned and spoke of for others. Their arrows fall upon themselves. When a man's lips vent curses, they will probably, like chickens, come home to roost. A stone hurled upward into the air is apt to fall upon the thrower's head. David's words may be read in the future as a prophecy, but in this verse, at any rate, there is no need to do so in order to soften their tone. It is so just that the mischief which men plot and the slander which they speak should recoil upon themselves, that every righteous man must desire it. He who does not desire it may wish to be considered humane and Christ-like, but the chances are that he has a sneaking agreement with the wicked, or is deficient in a manly sense of right and wrong. When evil men fall into pits which they have digged for the innocent, we believe that the angels are glad. Certainly the most gentle and tender of philanthropists, however much they pity the sufferers, must also approve the justice which makes them suffer. We suspect that some of our excessively soft-spoken critics only need to be put into David's place and they would become a vast deal more bitter than he ever was. 10. Let burning coals fall upon them. Then will they know that the scattering of the firebrands is not the sport they thought it to be. When hailstones and coals of fire descend upon them, how will they escape? Even the skies above the wicked are able to deal out vengeance upon them. Let them be cast into the fire. They have kindled the flames of strife, and it is fair that they should be cast therein. They have heated the furnace of slander seven times hotter than it was wont to be heated, and they shall be devoured therein. Who would have pitied Nebuchadnezzar if he had been thrown into his own burning fiery furnace? Into deep pits, that they rise not up again. They made those ditches or fosses for the godly, and it is meet that they should themselves fall into them and never escape. When a righteous man falls, he rises again, but when the wicked man goes down, he falls like Lucifer, never to hope again. The psalmist in this passage graphically depicts the Sodom of the wicked persecutor. Fire falls upon him from heaven. The city blazes and he is cast into the conflagration. The Vale of Siddam is full of slime pits, and into these he is hurried. Extraordinary judgment overtakes the extraordinary offender. Above, around, beneath, all is destruction. He would have consumed the righteous, and now he is consumed himself. So shall it be, so let it be. 11. Let not an evil speaker be established in the earth. For that would be an established plague, a perpetual curse. Men of false and cruel tongues 
are of most use when they go to fatten the soil in which they rot as carcasses. While they are alive, they are the terror of the good and the torment of the poor. God will not allow the specious orators of falsehood to retain the power they temporarily obtain by their deceitful speaking. They may become prominent, but they cannot become permanent. They shall be disendowed and disestablished in spite of all that they can say to the contrary. All evil bears the element of decay within itself, for what is it but corruption? Hence the utmost powers of oratory are insufficient to settle upon a sure foundation the cause which bears a lie within it. Evil shall hunt the violent man to overthrow him. He hunted the good, and now his own evil shall hunt him. He tried to overthrow the goings of the righteous, and now his own unrighteousness shall prove his overthrow. As he was violent, so shall he be violently assaulted and hunted down. Sin is its own punishment. A violent man will need no direr doom than to reap what he has sown. It is horrible for a huntsman to be devoured by his own hounds, yet this is the sure fate of the persecutor. Verses 12 and 13 I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and the right of the poor. Surely the righteous shall give thanks unto thy name. The upright shall dwell in thy presence. 12. I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and the right of the poor. All through the psalm, the writer is bravely confident and speaks of things about which he had no doubt. In fact, no psalm can be more grandly positive than this protest against slander. The slandered saint knew Jehovah's care for the afflicted, for he had received actual proofs of it himself. I will maintain it is the motto of the great defender of the rights of the needy. What confidence this should create within the bosoms of the persecuted and poverty-stricken. The prosperous and wealthy can maintain their own cause, but those who are otherwise shall find that God helps those who cannot help themselves. Many talk as if the poor had no rights worth noticing, but they will sooner or later find out their mistake when the judge of all the earth begins to plead with them. 13. Surely the righteous shall give thanks unto thy name. The former psalm had its surely, but this is a more pleasing one. As surely as God will slay the wicked, he will save the oppressed and fill their hearts and mouths with praises. Whoever else may be silent, the righteous will give thanks, and whatever they may suffer, the matter will end in their living through the trial and magnifying the Lord for his delivering grace. On earth ere long and in heaven forever, the pure in heart shall sing unto the Lord. How loud and sweet will be the songs of the redeemed in the millennial age, when the meek shall inherit the earth and delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The upright shall dwell in thy presence. Thus shall they give thanks in the truest and fullest manner. This abiding before the Lord shall render to him songs without words, and therefore all the more spiritual and true. Their living and walking with their God shall be their practical form of gratitude sitting down in holy peace like children at their father's table. Their joyful looks and language shall speak their high esteem and fervent love to him who has become their dwelling place. How high have we climbed in this psalm, from being hunted by the evil man to dwelling in the divine presence. So doth faith upraise the saint from the lowest depths to heights of peaceful repose. Well might the song be studied with sellers or uplifters. End of Psalm 140